violence and calling for action on the serious humanitarian crisis affecting the peoples of Afghanistan, the Syrian Arab Republic, Ukraine, Yemen, and other countries, and on the particular vulnerability of women and children. We have 60 minutes, exactly an hour, of this debate this morning. There is no pre-established list of speakers, as I've indicated earlier. If you wish to take the floor, simply fill out one of the inscription forms that are available in this room, right at the back there, and pass it on to Laura. In order to enable the highest number of speakers to take the floor within the allocated time, speaking times are set at four minutes per speaker. Please make good use of your sense of time and bear with the chair when I tell you that your speaking time is over. All speakers will take the floor from their seats. I will invite Mr. Edwards of Chile at the end of the debate as the co-author of the draft resolution. Then you will have an opportunity Mr. Edwards, to summarize the interventions from the floor and react to them. At this point, I declare the debate open. The floor is given to Syria. Sabah al-khir. Fi al-waqi' al-bunud al-tari al-muqaddama, kulluha tahmul. رسائل إنسانية ومجتمعية قي الحثيث لإزكاء الوعي والتحفيز على العلم والمساواة بين الجنسين والانفتاح على الآخر ونبذ العنف والتطرف وهذا كله من شأنه أن أولا يساعد على تمكين الأفراد رجالا ونساء ثانيا يخفف من الأزمات الإنسانية التي قد تواجه كل دول العالم دون استثناء ثالثا يعزز قيم التعايش والتسامح والسلام والأمن الدولي وشكرا Thank you very much speaker from Syria I now invite Armenia Armenia, followed by Portugal. Four minutes. Thank you. Fellow par parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, we are discussing crisis and human tragedies involving large numbers of people, and in this context, the emergency item, raising awareness and calling for action on the serious humanitarian crisis affecting the peoples of Afghanistan, the Syrian Arab Republic, Ukraine, Yemen, and other countries, and on the particular vulnerability of women and children. We parliamentarians, members of the oldest and largest interparliamentary forum, should feel responsible for all the suffering and loss that regular people, especially women, elderly, and children encounter during wars, climate change, and other disasters. But we should address not only the great calamities, but also crises with lesser scale, such as humanitarian crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, resulting from Azerbaijan's closure of Lachin Corridor, the only way to the outer world. The situation has left approximately 120,000 ethnic Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, including around 30,000 children, without access to essential goods and services. They have been deprived of life-saving medication and health care, as humanitarian aid delivered by the Red Cross and peacekeepers has not met demand. Disruptions to the supply of electricity and gas have created extreme hardship. 
Despite the European Court of Human Rights applied measures requiring Azerbaijan to leave the blockade, the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights urgently called for it to be unblockade, and the UN International Court of Justice decision that Azerbaijan must ensure unimpeded movement through the Latin Corridor, Azerbaijan con continues to keep the corridor closed. The head of Azerbaijan delegation yesterday stated that Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh may integrate into Azerbaijani society and enjoy all the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Azerbaijan. Does it mean that providing very limited assistance through the Red Cross is a privilege and freedom guaranteed by the authorities of Azerbaijan? The Freedom House recent report describes Azerbaijan as not a free country with score 9 out of 100. Azerbaijan cannot guarantee rights and freedoms of own citizens. Does the Azerbaijani leadership really mean that Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh should enjoy these rights and freedoms? On the other hand, the head of Azerbaijani state calls for massive deportation of Armenians that cannot be interpreted you, anyhow Member. but state policy of ethnic cleansing I thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Members, may I just remind you The very all of fact us? of illegal Honorable blockade Member, of Latin. I'm you. finishing. The very fact of illegal blockade of Latin corridor, hostage of Armenian Poles, frequent aggression by the Azerbaijani armed pro forces proves the urgent need of international presence in Nagorno Karabakh to monitor the situation on the ground thank you, and guarantee Member. rights and security of people. Up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable members, may I just remind you that we are not opening a new debate. We are simply dealing with the item which is before us, which I read earlier on. You have not focused on what you were supposed to speak on. You spoke on a different matter, and, and I just want to remind all of us that it's not time for us to open a new debate on another matter. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The next speaker is Portugal. May I just remind members that those of us who would like to speak, there are slips at the back where you can fill in your name and, and, sub, and uh, submit to, to Laura next to me here. Thank you very much. Honorable Member from Portugal. Portugal. Senhora Presidente, caras e caros colegas, o tema sobre o qual isso do nosso item de urgência não podia ser mais pertinente e não podia ser mais atual. Atualmente os movimentos migratórios dão só o horror e da violência que assolam os povos porque são vítimas de desastres naturais. Os movimentos migratórios implicam grandes desafios para os países receptores, mas a agilidade e a cooperação são essenciais para mitigar o sofrimento destas pessoas. Por outro lado, as políticas de imigração podem e devem acrescentar valor aos países que recebem estas pessoas. Para Portugal, por exemplo, a presença de imigrantes é extremamente importante pela força de trabalho que transportam, pela sua contribuição para o sistema de segurança social e pelo impacto positivo na nossa democracia que atravessa uma preocupante tendência decrescente. Não obstante, independentemente da utilidade que consigo carregam Há um papel que nos é destinado a todos os países que são defensores dos direitos humanos e da dignidade da pessoa humana, especialmente quanto aos mais vulneráveis às crises humanitárias. Não podemos ignorar que as mulheres e as crianças estão inevitavelmente mais expostas à violência e à exploração sexual e laboral. Não podemos nem devemos voltar às costas destas pessoas, nem permitir que se percam vidas em vão. Mas, caros colegas, uma vez nos nossos territórios, também não podemos conformar-nos sabendo que estas pessoas vivem e trabalham sem qualquer dignidade em países que se dizem desenvolvidos. Angelina Jolie disse um dia num famoso discurso que me marcou para a vida toda. I have never understood why some people are lucky enough to be born with the chance that I had to have this path in life. And why across the world there is a woman just like me with the same abilities and the same desires, same work ethic and love for her family, who would most likely make better films and better speeches. Only she sits in a refugee camp and she has no voice. 
She worries about what her children will eat, how to keep them safe, and they will ever, or a, if they ever, a, ever be allowed to return home. I don't know why. This is my life, and that's hers. Hoje são eles. Amanhã podemos ser nós. Obrigada. I thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker will be from Peru. Peru, you have the floor. Gracias. Buen día para todos. Creo que el, el punto de emergencia aprobado del día de ayer se condice con todo lo que pretende hacerse en esta 146 Asamblea de la Unión Interparlamentaria. La búsqueda de, de la paz, sociedades inclusivas, significa tomar en cuenta esta crisis que estamos vivenciando en varias zonas, en varios lugares, tal vez no visibilizados, pero este elemento debe ser motivación para en la misma línea del, del tema de esta 146 asamblea, ser inclusivos. Si hablamos de una sociedad inclusiva, tenemos que caminar a no discriminar. Se referencian algunos países y creo que hay que caminar a no excluir. En ese sentido, desde nuestro país, Perú, Sudamérica, estamos eh, totalmente de acuerdo y aportaremos lo conveniente para que esto se pueda materializar y se pueda corregir lo que tenga que corregirse en una sociedad que no puede caminar día tras día a deshumanizarse, a vivir en un contexto de indiferencia. Y allí, desde mi condición de profesor, creo que es un baluarte para generar esta humanización el sector educación, lo cual, para concluir, considero que todos debemos buscar que a través de nuestras políticas públicas, nuestras políticas de Estado, se tenga que tener temas, contenidos, lineamientos de política que involucren un actuar más protagonista del sector de educación dentro de un escenario de prevención y sobre todo a cambiar esta humanidad para que no se deshumanice. Muchas gracias. I thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member, at this point, I would like to pause for, to our, pause our discussion to deal with questions relating to the drafting committee. Let me remind you that the Standing Committee Rule 16 stipulates that the composition of the drafting committee shall take into account equitable geographical distribution and political gender balance, and that the number of its members shall normally not exceed 11. We've received preliminary indications of interest in participating in the drafting committee from a number of delegates and have also been informed of the decisions taken by geographical groups. I will now invite those geographical political groups who have not as yet nominated members to the drafting committee to do so before one o'clock today. Just a reminder that the drafting committee are requested to note that they will meet today at 2.30 to 6 o'clock in C1717 on the ground floor of the exhibition World Bahrain. Drafting committee members are requested to know that they will meet today from 2 to 6.30 in C17 on the ground floor of the exhibition world 
here in Bahrain. My next speaker and, and, uh, will be Ukraine. Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you never really appreciate peace and you never really appreciate uh, being able to come to your home, to bring your children to your home and to wake up normally without sirens until you know what it is to face uh, an open war of aggression from another state and actually from your neighbor. Uh, I never thought, I can tell you very honestly, that a little bit more than a year ago I would wake up with shellings on top of my head and that as a parliamentarian, uh, a young woman, I would have to go to the parliament and vote under the shellings. We have a glass ceiling in the parliament, which means that if there is a rocket somewhere nearby, all members of parliament die instantly because it is a glass ceiling, a building which was never supposed to be voted during the times of war. And the worst is that it was our neighbor, it was Russian Federation, it still is Russian Federation, a member of the APU who is still here, who started a war on aggression on, on us in the 21st century, who doesn't stop. We've had a number of decisions of the UN, we've had a number of emergency resolutions, and we're incredibly grateful for the whole IPU for having those resolutions in Kigali and before that when the horrible aggression started a year ago. But unfortunately, it doesn't change anything for Russia. Yesterday at night, I have counted the number of rockets Russia has passed to Ukraine civilians and civilian houses since our last emergency resolution six months ago, even less than six months ago in October in Kigali, when we specifically voted all continents, all geopolitical groups, everybody to respect Ukrainian territorial sovereignty and to take away the Russian troops and to stop this war of aggression and to stop specifically killing civilians and children. Since October, since our last resolution, since our last unanimous decision of the whole world, 41 more kids were killed by Russian bombs. 1,327 rockets, Russian missiles were sent to kill civilians, not the military objects, not the military bases, but civilians. We have had more than 10,000 houses destroyed only since October. And we've had six ultrasonic rockets, which means very, very fast and very modern rockets hitting Kiev three days ago, the civilians. Those rockets are impossible to stop. And Russia knows that very well. No air defense system can stop them. And they send it not to the military bases, then send them to kill children and to kill women and to kill civilians. And this is still going on this second. I know it is not only going on in Ukraine, but right now we've made it so clear for the Russians that they should stop that it shocks me that we cannot implement any of our decisions and they are still here and they are still talking about some kind of tolerance in this, in this world and in this assembly. Uh, the worst thing is that they are forcefully displacing the children. The resolutions, the emergency draft resolutions right now talk a lot about forceful displacement, not just in Ukraine, but unfortunately in other continents and other countries. I know this is a huge problem. For me, it is almost impossible to believe that more than 16,000 Ukrainian children were stolen from their parents, were stolen from their houses, were stolen from their homes, and forcefully displaced into different parts of Russia, including Siberia, thousands and thousands of miles and kilometers away. And uh, they, they, they don't know whether they will ever see their parents, whether they will ever come back to Ukraine. Those kind of crimes we cannot tolerate. Those kinds of crimes should not be happening in the modern world. Those kinds of crimes should not, we should not be talking here in the APU about. I dream of a moment when there will no be need for Ukraine to be in the emergency item between the list of other countries. And I dream of a time when no other countries would be needed uh, to talk about in those kind of emergency resolutions. But unfortunately, today, this time is not here. And this is why we ask you to adopt the drafting resolution on the urgent humanitarian need and to stop the forceful displacement of children, to stop uh, the killing civilians, to stop targeting civilians, women or children from Russian Federation in Ukraine and from other uh, humanitarian crises all over the world. Nobody wants peace more than Ukraine. We should stop the aggressor, we should punish them member. and stop the dictators. Thank, thank you so much start. for supporting it. Thank you, thank you.
on my list. will be the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, you may take the floor, please. New Zealand. New Zealand, you may take the floor. Thank you. I want to thank the delegations who worked on formulating this important resolution and support, in particular, the comments from our Ukrainian colleagues. The scale of humanitarian crisis across the globe is significant. It's hard to exaggerate the toll that the illegal act of aggression by Russia against Ukraine has had on the Ukrainian people. Millions of people have poured into neighbouring countries to seek safety. Others have lived much of the last year underground seeking shelter from bombs, homes, schools, hospitals, and other critical civilian infrastructure have been destroyed. Entire cities have been heavily damaged. In Afghanistan, almost all Afghans are facing dangerous humanitarian hardships, but women and girls who face greater obstacles to obtaining food, healthcare, and financial resources are disproportionately affected. Taliban policies that have barred women from most paid jobs have had a swift and devastating impact on households in which women were the sole or main earners. In Myanmar, Myanmar's military have created a perpetual human rights crisis. While we acknowledge the scale of the crisis and look to how we can best respond, Let's not forget that we need to acknowledge what causes humanitarian crises. I would urge the drafting committee to look back at the resolutions that this IPU has taken in Nusa Dua and in Kigali last year to reflect the tone of the final draft. Thank you. Thank the honorable member. May I now invite the Russian Federation to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear Madam President, I was not preparing myself for a speech here. I expressed my opinion yesterday uh, while discussing the emergency item, and I expressed my concern that the debate and the following resolution may be uh, politicized while the topic as it is is really important for all of us and now after the contribution by our ukrainian colleague i uh, may see that my concerns are being confirmed um, you know uh, the situation as it was described by my ukrainian colleague in ukraine according to her started one year ago. This is simply not true. This humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and we consider it to be a civil war, started nine years ago after a forceful unconstitutional change of power in Ukraine in February 2014. A big part of Ukrainians did not accept that anti-constitutional change of power. Between February 2014 and February 2022, in eastern Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, more than 14,000 civilians were killed. More than 14,000 civilians, I stress it, out of which more than 200 children in eight years. And I believe that we all should share responsibility for not reacting on that humanitarian crisis during the eight years it all continued to develop. Russia, during these eight years, did its best in order to stop, to contribute 
to the ceasefire to stop this internal conflict in Ukraine. And we assisted... Order, honorable member, please. This is what I call absence of political okay, culture. okay, but not here. Uh, we, we contributed to the so-called Minsk agreements in order to help Ukraine to overcome this internal crisis and to restore peace and stability in the country. Now we know, after the statements but by, at that moment, uh, Mr. Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, by uh, Madame Merkel, by Mr. Holland, that initially no one of them uh, was planning to fulfill the commitments according to the Minsk agreements. They just wanted to uh, have more time in order to prepare a military operation against their own population in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, and by that to uh, deepen the uh, crisis, uh, the humanitarian crisis which uh, was developing during all these years. And now about uh, position and uh, situation with women and children during this crisis. Uh, I would like to re uh, recall that uh, the uh, Ombudsman for Human Rights in Ukraine, Madame Denisova, in so many months spread these lies about mass rapes, about children being sent to Siberia, but at a certain moment she had to resign. She had to resign and acknowledge that all that was lies, because she had no chance to confirm the figures, she had no chance to confirm the facts, and she has now resigned. While here in this audience we continue to hear these false uh, facts uh, which uh, are not uh, in, 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 in accordance with the real situation. I thank you, and Honorable my Member. last point, Your time yes, is up. we want to have peace in Ukraine. Thank yes, you. we want to finalize Thank this you, conflict Member. in a political way, but this is what the Ukrainian authorities, Member, by issuing special decrees by time. the president, have prohibited, have banned. And this is how it all looks like as for today. Honorable thank you. Member, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is the Honorable Member from Holland, Poland. Poland. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wasn't planning to take floor, but there are times that the truth needs to be said. And I think it's a disgrace. The fact that we are sitting here listening to those Russian lies is disgraceful for this group that we are creating here. If, if the delegate of Russia actually believes what he's saying, he should probably watch less of Russian state TV and see some truth about what's going on in Ukraine and the barbaric and horrific acts that his country is uh, doing in, in Ukraine. He was right in one thing. It didn't start last year. It started in 2014 when Russia illegally took over Crimea. It started in 2008, when Russia attacked Georgia. It started earlier, Honorable when Russia enslaved Honorable my Honorable country, Honorable. when they killed my people back Honorable in the Honorable 1940s. Just a, just a point of order, I'm sorry. Remember, we dealt with this matter both in Kigali and yesterday. But it we didn't are, help. We are now dealing with a humanitarian crisis. Sure, but we need to deal with it on a factual basis. And that's why it is necessary that someone tells the truth to counter the Russian lies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your time is up. France. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Vous me permettrez, à ce stade de notre débat, de faire un, un point d'ordre euh, je voudrais ici dénoncer officiellement les propos qui ont été tenus par notre collègue russe et euh, qui ont engagé directement euh, notre pays, la France. 
J'ai entendu dans la bouche du représentant de la Fédération de Russie que parmi les signataires de l'accord de Minsk, que notamment la France n'avait jamais eu comme ambition de respecter ses engagements. Je m'élève en faux contre cette assertion mensongère, voire plus que mensongère, que je qualifierais même de diffamatoire. Et je demande à ce que la Russie s'excuse officiellement auprès de la délégation française et des autres délégations, puisque s'il est un pays comme les autres pays de l'Europe qui ont tout fait, pour maintenir un dialogue ouvert, constructif avec la Fédération de Russie, je pense que la France fait partie de cela. Et je voudrais m'associer à mes autres collègues, et notamment à nos collègues ukrainiens. Je suis impressionné par ce déni de réalité qui est celui de nos collègues russes, qui effectivement ont une faculté, nous l'avions déjà vu à Kigali, mais nous le vivons une fois encore aujourd'hui, à réécrire l'histoire, à réécrire leur histoire. Ce n'est pas une guerre civile, c'est une agression caractérisée une tentative d'annexion et nous la dénonçons fermement. Merci. Thank you very much, honorable member. Honorable members, may I just remind all of us that the topic for today is the issue of humanitarian crisis. I know that when the one speaker has spoken, the others would like to react to that. However, the time now is to discuss the humanitarian crisis which has arisen as a result of the conflict. My next speaker, and it was just a reminder, honorable members, the next speaker now is South Africa. And South Africa, you will be followed by Chile, and that will be the last speaker for the day. The WHO, World Health Organization, and then Chile. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, speaker. Just to make some few reflections, one is that in the 144th Assembly of the IPU in Nisadu in Indonesia, the emergency item was about the conflict in Russia and Ukraine. In the 145th Assembly in Kigali and Rwanda, the emergency item was on Russia and Ukraine. And here now we're discussing an emergency item which when was presented was supposed to be about humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and Yemen and other countries as well. But now the debate is being shifted back to Ukraine and Russia, as if those are the only issues that concern the entire world. That is problematic for mostly Western European countries to want to force okay, feed now, the IPU member, of their own agenda. Deal with the humanitarian crisis, please. Yes, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with that. that. And then I want to give context that there has to be, of course, concern about the humanitarian crisis that is obtaining in all the countries that are identified in the draft resolution. But I think we should speak openly as well about the role of the military industrial complex that is benefiting out of war, and instead of trying to contain the war in many parts of the world, is aiding it through the North Antarctic Treaty Organization, which historically has played a very destructive role. And we must refuse to be bullied into a homogeneous perspective of Western Europe and the Americans that says that everything else that they do is correct at the expense of everyone. That every time there's global gatherings, all of us are forced into discussing their issues when there are many crises all over the world. As if all of us are just accompanying you here to just discuss your issues when you do not give any I consideration of what is obtaining member. in many other parts of the world. So, Speaker, I think we should express Sarah's discomfort that all the time we have to be bogged down to what are the interests of countries which historically are associated with colonialism you, and repression member. of the world. It's unacceptable. Thank you. That is the contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, honorable member. The, the next speaker, I now invite the World Health Organization. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the World Health Organization, WHO, warmly welcomes the selection of a focus on that disastrous humanitarian situation in multiple countries around the world. We are, with our staff, present in each and every of those crises on the ground to support the local authorities, to support the national authorities in 
um, working on helping the population which is affected directly and indirectly in their health, especially concerning women and children's health, where there is a very, very harsh situation. WHO is currently working on 52 graded emergencies all around the world. All the countries that you have listed in the resolution and many more are included in that. We will have this week a meeting with national public health institutes where the work and the response to such emergency and humanitarian situation is, is front and center to really support all your countries in working on it. We work on both sides of the front line. We are not with the one or with the other. We are with the people who need the support in their health. We have also an initiative on Health for Peace, where health can actually help bridging the unacceptable divides. And we would propose to the co-sponsors that we work with them to amend the resolution to include the health and to include the strong work WHO is doing with IPU into the resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank you, Honourable Member. Honourable Members, all those who have requested the floor before we close the list of speakers have spoken. And now we have our last speaker, who is the co-author of the resolution, and that is Chile. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Eh, quiero tratar de responder eh, todas las dudas que se han planteado. Quiero decirle a la representante de Siria que eh, el tono en la cual ella hace la intervención es exactamente el tono que se pretende en esta resolución. Eh, preocuparnos de la eh, fragilidad de las mujeres eh, cuando están en estas situaciones, de los niños, y por lo tanto me encantaría poder contar, y a todo el comité me imagino contar con su input para poder trabajar y fortalecer la resolución. A la representante de Armenia decirle que esta, a diferencia de lo que dijo un delegado, esto es una resolución que se preocupa de todas las personas y todas las eh, situaciones en que existen miles de personas que están sufriendo y por lo tanto nos encantaría incorporar también las personas que usted considera, los 120.000 personas que están en una crisis humanitaria en su país. A la delegada de Portugal decirle que efectivamente nosotros estamos muy preocupados de los derechos de las mujeres y los niños y la resolución así lo establece y en particular cómo se respetan esos derechos cuando las mujeres tienen que salir de sus países eh, y tienen que eh, eh, batirse por ellas mismas en situaciones que son muy complicadas y nosotros somos de la idea de que tienen que ser respetados todos los derechos, especialmente los derechos que son reconocidos en cada uno de los países que las, eh, buenamente las, las, eh, la, eh, le dan refugio. A la persona, al representante de Perú, decirle que efectivamente hemos tratado de incorporar prácticamente o muchas crisis, hicimos una lista que efectivamente faltan algunas eh, situaciones de crisis, pero podemos incorporarlas con, con mucho grado porque la verdad es que queremos que esta sea una resolución que no tenga política de por medio, más allá de las visiones políticas que puedan tener todas las personas que eh, la, la declararon. A la representante de Ucrania quiero darle toda mi simpatía con su sufrimiento y espero de corazón que prontamente encuentren justicia por toda la situación que están viviendo millones de ucranianos con una guerra que no buscaron, que fue no provocada y que un Estado que se le ha pedido permanentemente que considere resoluciones internacionales y deje de atacar a Ucrania simplemente no las ha considerado. A la Organización Mundial de la Salud quiero reconocer su trabajo en los 52 países que ha realizado y nos encantaría contar con su presencia en el comité, en el drafting committee, para poder fortalecer la, eh, la redacción y también reconocer el trabajo que se está haciendo. Quiero decirle a la representante de Nueva Zelanda que eh, miramos con, con mucha cercanía lo que ella ha planteado, en particular al lenguaje y todo lo aprobado por las otras asambleas que hemos tenido en lo relativo o lo que pueda compararse con lo que estamos haciendo, en particular las resoluciones de Nusadúa y también la de Kigali, que son materias que han sido aprobadas por el Pleno de esta Asamblea. Al representante de Rusia quiero decirle, con mucho respeto, pero eh, quiero decirle que ninguna, no se, ha, no se ha considerado ninguna posición política respecto a las eh, los ejemplos que hemos dado de grandes crisis humanitarias. Ayer se dijo que no habíamos considerado Irak, Irak está considerado. Y en mi opinión, por ejemplo, Irak es una de las crisis y de las 
dos millones cien mil personas que están internamente desplazados, que el mundo ha completamente olvidado y tenemos que considerarlo. Pero también quiero decirle con mucho respeto al delegado de Rusia, si le importan las crisis humanitarias, la crisis al menos en Ucrania se terminaría mañana si ustedes dejan de bombardear el país. Lo mismo le decimos a los talibanes. Se... Si no queremos, si realmente nos importa que haya en el caso de Ucrania 7 millones de mujeres y niños repartidos por países, por otros países, bueno, tenemos que terminar con esa guerra. Y si quieren paz, lo que tenemos que hacer es que dejen de tirar bombas y bombardear, bombardear ciudades de una vez. Con eso vamos a poder terminar con esa crisis humanitaria. Nosotros tenemos que preocuparnos también de las causas de las crisis humanitarias y aquí hay un caso bastante claro. Respecto al, para terminar a la referencia que hace el representante de Sudáfrica. Quiero decirle que Chile y Argentina, quienes fuimos los principales autores de esta resolución, también fuimos países colonizados. Y no tiene absolutamente nada que ver pertenecer a un país que fue colonizado con entender que hoy día existen crisis humanitarias y que el mundo debe hacerse cargo. Ese es el espíritu de esta resolución y yo espero que en el comité, el drafting committee, podamos fortalecerla, pero enviarle una señal clara de todo el mundo. Termino, eh, eh, I'll, I'll finish in one second, please. A los 340 millones de personas que viven en situaciones de crisis Thank humanitaria, you. que el mundo sí le importa lo que están viviendo y que no los hemos olvidado. Y eso es independiente de la causa, eso es independiente de la religión que profesen, de la raza, del sexo y de todas las condiciones. Cualquier persona en sufrimiento Thank tiene you. que Honorable considerarse... Member. Tenemos que preocuparnos de ella. Muchas gracias y espero que podamos aprobarla el día de mañana o cuando corresponda con unanimidad esta eh, resolución que hemos preparado para esta Asamblea. Okay. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, honorable member. We have, uh, what? We had five more minutes, but now we have three. Uh, please, honorable member, if, if, if I request you to stop, please do so. I now, there are two more. Members, we have requested to take the floor after we had closed the list. We will allow those two. The one is Netherlands, followed by Azerbaijan, and after Azerbaijan, we will end the session. Thank you very much. Honorable member from Netherlands, take the floor, please. Yes, Madam Chair, the, uh, thanks. Dear colleagues, uh, the Dutch delegation fully supported uh, the emergency item, that may be clear, but first of all, we uh, cannot accept the statements made by the Russian Federation this morning. Uh, as we all know, the, the IPU was very clear regarding the situation in Ukraine. It's a bore, and it is very, very, for us, there's no doubt uh, about the possession of the Russians. Um, and regarding the emergency item and the humanitarian crisis, I can be, uh, it is just to be uh, brief about that, we can fully underline the words said before by our colleagues from New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honorable member, I will now allow the last speaker. However, may I just remind honorable members that we've had time, yes, both yesterday and yes, to discuss the emergency item in detail, the facts and everything about it. We are now focusing our attention on the humanitarian crisis conflicts and force. Azerbaijan, you may take the floor and that is the last speaker for this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to attract your attention to the humanitarian crisis that Armenia created in the territory of Azerbaijan. First, I want to object uh, the statement made here, our colleague from Armenia. Uh, first, I want to say that Latin Corridor, that it was mentioned here, is open for deliveries. It is used for transportation of cargo and passengers for humanitarian purposes. Every day, tens of vehicles pass on this road under the control of Russian peacekeepers. Second, I want to attract, to, uh, I, I want to attract your attention to the humanitarian crisis that we are facing now. Uh, this is high level of mining. Uh, Armenia still aggravates the humanitarian situation in the region by mining the area. Azerbaijan is the most contaminated area with mines in Europe, ranking as the second. 
Uh, as a result, I want to say that 300 people uh, has lost their lives so, uh, so far or got injured. And uh, ultimately, over 1 million Azerbaijani IDPs who were expelled from this territory for t 30 years cannot return to their native lands because of high level of mining. Now we call on Armenia not to aggravate the situation, not to use the Lachin Corridor for illegal transportation of weapons and arming the illegal armed groups in this territory. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank you, Honorable Member from Azerbaijan. Honorable Members, we've now come to the end of the debate. And honorable members, as we continue to engage with one another, let us exercise tolerance and be reminded of the theme of uh, our session uh, of the assembly so that at least we may exercise some patience towards one another. I thank the honorable members. Now, I, may I invite the deputy speaker of the Senate of Rwanda to chair the continuation of the general debate. We now proceed to the general debate, and the Deputy Speaker will take the floor. Thank you very much. This debate, this one, on the emergency item, humanitarian crisis, is now closed. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, honorable members of parliament. I'm Nira Safar Esperance, the vice president of the Senate of Rwanda, and I'm happy to chair this uh, session on general debate. And uh, on the list, we are starting with uh, Australia. Uh, Good morning, delegates, and thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker from Rwanda. May I acknowledge the President of the IPU, the Secretary-General, fellow speakers and delegates. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the debate on this fundamental issue, which is an important issue on behalf of the Australian Parliament. Australia is a vibrant and multicultural nation with the proud First Nations heritage dating back 65,000 years, making Australia the home to the world's oldest continuing civilization. Today, almost one third of Australians were born overseas. Our rich cultural and linguistic diversity is central to our unique and national identity. 
To be tolerant is to accept others whose actions, beliefs, physical capabilities, religion, customs, ethnicity or nationality differ from one's own. The support for ethnic diversity and multiculturalism amongst Australians remains high and continues to grow. This support gives us significant advantage in responding to the pressures placed upon social cohesion, including intolerance and exclusion, flamed by misinformation and disinformation. In Australia, we believe that everyone deserves a fair go, at its core in the sense and belief that there is an ex expectation of equal opportunity. At an international level, Australia has had a long commitment to this ethos of equality of opportunity. Australia was a founding member of the United Nations and an original signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights upon its adoption within the UN in 1948. Inclusivity should be promoted across a number of levels, through legislation, policy and with society amongst its people. At the heart of equality is the belief that all people should be treated fairly and should not be discriminated against. Australia takes discrimination very seriously. We know that social and economic inequalities, experiences of discrimination and concerns about national and global issues are undeniably linked to social cohesion. These issues have been identified as a major threat to democratic and social institution. In Australia, trust in government and our democracy remains high. However, we know that trust in government is driven by accountability, responsiveness and reliability of government institutions which are in turn fundamental for democracy and social cohesion. We also know that trust is closely tied to a citizen's satisfaction with democracy. The rise of social media and online news means that there is unlimited information upon people's fingertips. It can be hard for people to know who or what to believe. It's, it can be hard to know where information has come from, who wrote it or, who, or when it was produced. Some people are taking advantage of this trend and will deliberately disseminate false information. There is some research that suggests that false information can shape hateful extremist beliefs and behaviours. This poses a direct challenge for a peaceful existence. Violent extremism has no place in Australia or the world. In the last few years, ideologically motivated violent extremism, mostly nationalist and racist violent extremism, made up 50 per cent of the Australian intelligence organisation's domestic counter-terrorism caseload. Australia's approach to countering violent extremism can comprises of four key activities, building strength in diversity and social participation, early intervention, disengagement and reintegration, targeted work with vulnerable communities and institutions, and addressing terrorist propaganda online. It's important that people who are online can identify extremist behaviours and misinformation to maintain social resilience. One of the most important practical and constructive ways in which the Australian Parliament promotes cooperation is through our parliamentary friendship groups. There are over 100 groups whose focuses range from specific matters such as health, transport, safety and housing to cultural diversity. The last topic I'd like to touch on is diversity in Australia and in the Australian Parliament. At the previous Interparliamentary Union Assembly in Kigali, I spoke about how the current Australian Parliament is the most ethnically and culturally diverse in our history. The significance of this diversity as a reflection of our nation cannot be overstated. As a diverse parliament which better reflects our society, it also adds legitimacy to our democratic processes. It enables parliament to provide greater scrutiny and make decisions which better represent the experience, the needs and views of the aspirations of the community we serve. It also encourages engagement and reduced likelihood of people turning to extremist alternatives. All of the elements I've spoken about today, legislation to promote equality, trust in government and misinformation, platforms to promote shared interest and diversity in Parliament are what drives peaceful coexistence and an inclusive democracy in Australia. When I was elected as the Speaker of the Australian House of Representatives in July last year, I made the point that Parliament should be more inclusive and open to Australians of all walks of life, as well as a workplace that is safe for all who enter. 
Today, I remain determined as ever to entrust that the Australian Parliament upholds the highest standards of behaviour based on respect, tolerance, equality and inclusion, consistent with what is expected by us, the Australian public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Egypt, to be followed by Zambia. معالي السيد دوارتي باتشيكو رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي معالي السيد مارتن شونغونغ الأمين العام للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أصحاب المعالي والسعادة رؤساء البرلمانات ورؤساء الوفود البرلمانية يسعدني في مستهل كلمتي أن, أعبر أن أعرب عن اعتزازي بتجدد لقائنا في اتحادنا الموقر والفعال للدبلوماسية البرلمانية العالمية متعددة الأطراف كما أتوجه بخالص التقدير والشكر إلى الأشقاء في مملكة البحرين على جهودهم الدؤوبة والمقدرة لتنظيم أعمال اجتماعاتنا وعلى حسن الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة الحضور الكريم منذ بدء الخليقة وتشغل قضية إدارة التنوع والاختلاف بين البشر حيزا كبيرا في اهتمام الإنسان بحيث شكلت تحدياً كبيراً أمام التطور الإنساني والحضاري للمجتمعات على مر العصور والأزمنة فعلى الرغم من حكمة الله في خلق التنوع والاختلاف واتفاق كافة النصوص المقدسة والمذاهب الفلسفية الكبرى عليه باعتباره مصدر إسراء وقوة الإنسانية إلا أن غياب الإدارة الرشيدة لهذا التنوع الإنساني قد خلق تحديات كثيرة متعلقة بهشاشة منظومة السلم والتماسك المجتمعي مما أسفر عن مآس إنسانية يندى لها الجبين البشري وهو جعل من تعزيز التعايش السلمي هدفا إنسانيا سعت وما زالت تسعى إليه المجتمعات البشرية الزميلات العزيزات والزملاء الأعزاء لم تدخر الدولة المصرية جهدا في تعزيز وترسيخ قيم المواطنة والتعايش المشترك ونبذ كافة دعوات التعصب والكراهية بما يعزز من تماسك الهوية الوطنية المصرية فاستندت رؤية الدولة المصرية وهي تدشن الجمهورية الجديدة على بناء مجتمع يرتكز على قاعدة صلبة من التعايش السلمي المشترك قوامها الحرص على دعم حقوق كافة المواطنين بدون أي تفرقة وفي سبيل ذلك وفي سبيل ذلك الهدف الأسمى اتخذت الدولة المصرية خطوات على شتى الأصعدة والمستويات لترسيخ مفهوم المواطنة كما حرصت الدولة المصرية على تعزيز الحريات الدينية في المجتمع المصري من خلال ظهير دستوري يكفلها ويعززها فقد نص الدستور المصري على تأكيد حق المواطنين المصريين من المسيحيين واليهود في تطبيق مبادئ شرائعهم في مسائل الأحوال الشخصية دون أي تمييز بينهم وبين المصريين المسلمين كما نص الدستور على تأكيد وكفالة مبادئ حرية العقيدة وحرية ممارسة الشعائر الدينية وإقامة دور العبادة وقد انعكس ذلك على جهود الدولة المصرية في تجديد وترميم وتقنين أوضاع دور العبادة المختلفة لكافة الأديان على قدم المساواة فضلا عن المشروع العظيم لإحياء مسار العائلة المقدسة ثم جاء توقيع الأزهر الشريف على وثيقة الأخوة الإنسانية مع الفاتيكان ليشكل برهانا دامغا على رؤية مصرية صادقة وطموحة 
تتخطى البعد الوطني إلى مفهوم أشمل وأوسع لعالم يتسم بالإنسانية والتآخي والعيش المشترك وعلى صعيد موازن انبرت الدولة المصرية لمكافحة التطرف باعتباره الخطر الماثل والمهدد للتعايش المشترك وذلك عبر تجديد الخطاب الديني المستنير كما يقوم مرصد الأزهر الشريف بنشر دراسات بلغات مختلفة لتفنيد الأفكار الهدامة ومكافحة التطرف فضلا عن تنظيم الكنيسة المصرية عدة فعاليات بالتعاون مع الأزهر الشريف في هذا الشأن ولم يقتصر الدور المصري في مكافحة خطاب التطرف على الصعيد الوطني فحزب بل امتد إلى الإطار العالمي السيدات والسادة الحضور لعلكم تتفقون معي أنه لا يوجد هدف أسمى من تعزيز التآخي الإنساني والتعايش المشترك تحقيقاً للأمن والسلم العالمي وهذا الهدف يحتاج إلى إرادة جادة منا جميعاً ومن هنا أتوجه إليكم بحديث سلام من مصر إلى العالم انبذوا دعوات التعصب والكراهية فنحن في هذا المنعطف الخطير من الأزمات العالمية الاستثنائية أحوج ما نكون إلى التعايش المشترك وتغليب لغة الحوار القائمة على احترام وقبول الآخر عندها فقط سينعم عالمنا بالسلام وتعيش شعوبنا في أمان ورخاء وازدهار وهذا ما ننشده جميعا ختاما أشكركم على المتابعة وحسن الاستماع Thank you, Egypt. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Zambia, to be followed by Malawi. Madam President, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to, to place on record my best wishes to all the women present in this auditorium as we celebrate women on the globe in the month of March, even as we march towards actualizing and embracing equity as a panacea in addressing the gender parity. As Shelley Chimson, the first female black woman to be elected to the United States Congress stated, and I quote, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. To my fellow women, let us bring our chairs and demonstrate our capacities in all the spheres of life. Madam President, I am honored for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the topic promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, fighting intolerance. Distinguished delegates, an inclusive society is key to peaceful coexistence among people in every society. Therefore, it is critical for leaders to embrace diversity of ethnic, cultural, or religion as a way of fighting intolerance in societies. Let me hasten to state that the issue of fighting intolerance is so close to my heart as a woman and also as a person coming from a country in the global south. This is because I've witnessed firsthand of its devastating impact on my continent, which sadly has led to death and displacement of many people, especially women and children. In addition, it has worsened their socioeconomic status Therefore, intolerance needs to be addressed urgently with the involvement of all stakeholders. Needless to state that some of the measures that can be undertaken to address the challenges, including putting policies aimed at reducing inequalities, <coughs> facilitating personal healing, and promoting ideologies that build on communal identities. 
It is therefore imperative for parliaments to position themselves and spearhead an ambitious fight against intolerance, owing to their centra centrality by virtue of being representative institutions through their legislative oversight and representative functions. <clears throat> Arising from the aforementioned, allow me now to share my, my parliament's experience in fighting intolerance and give context to the matter under consideration. Zambia is largely and predominantly heterogeneous in terms of tribe or ethnic groups. Despite its diversity, the country remains a model of peace and stability in the Southern Africa region because it has generally undergone peaceful transitions between political regimes. However, there are some factors that have led to some degree of intolerance or exclusion which can, exclusion, which can be clustered into political leadership constellations, which can be either be political or within ethnic, ethnic group, groupings, land and boundary issues, intolerance due to poverty and inequality, among others. <clears throat> To address these challenges, our parliament takes advantage of various opportunity, opportunities, uses different initiatives and parliamentary tools. One of those is overseeing the progress made in the application of national values and principles. This opportunity presents itself in the first quarter of every year, when in line with, with our Republican constitution, the Republican president reports to the National Assembly on the progress the country has made in the implementation of these values and principles the previous year. The parliamentarians debate the report, highlight issues, and prevent the, present their views regarding the areas requiring improvement. <clears throat> Through its legislative function, the Zambian parliament has also played a critical role in creating an enabling environment for peaceful coexistence and inclusivity. In, in, in this respect, Parliament has enacted relevant pieces of legislation to promote peaceful coexistence. We have passed laws that speak gender equity, equality and integration, protecting minority persons such as the disabled, against cybercrime, criminalization of actions that are undertaken with the intention of raising discontent among the inhabitants, criminalization of electoral violence, which acts as a stumbling block to some citizens, especially women and the youth, and promotion of equal opportunities in employment, among others. Our parliament also strives to lead by example by practicing inclusiveness and peaceful coexistence. This entails having parliamentarians of different sex, age, ethnicity, occupational and educational backgrounds in our communities, caucuses as well as on parliamentary delegations. We continue working at being more inclusive and in, in using different avenues to fight intolerance. These include caucuses such as the one on disability and peace for example, the International Association of Parliamentaries for Peace, Zambia chapter, works to promote a culture of peace through education, sports, arts, and media in various parts of the country. The Parliamentary Caucus on Disability Inclusion and Rights in Zambia is also another platform our parliament uses to engage the disabled in our communities. Let me conclude, Mr. Uh, Madam President, by indicating that the importance of fighting tolerance in society cannot be overemphasized. Therefore, parliaments are at the heart of the fight against intolerance in society. I therefore wish to call upon all parliamentarians to mobilize themselves with the intention of working closely with their citizens without any discrimination. By so doing, parliaments will inspire strong you leadership conclude, and Madam political, polit political will we will towards the fight against intolerance. I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, Malawi. And uh, Bangladesh, get ready to, to follow. Madam uh, President, 
uh, I feel greatly honored to stand before this honorable assembly, currently meeting in this beautiful city of Manama in Bahrain to contribute on behalf of the Malawi delegation to the topic promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive society fighting intolerance. Madam President, issues of coexistence and inclusiveness are essential in every society. This is because the immediate effects of conflict due to lack of coexistence and inclusivity are brutal. Displacement and disruption of social and economic systems may occur and have often led to unexplained deaths, avoidable injuries, political violence and displacement. Coexistence and integration of cultural, religious, political and socioeconomic diversity have therefore proven to be effective ways of reducing conflict between different groups of people in societies. Madam President, my speech will highlight the reasons why we as nations and parliamentarians need to promote peaceful coexistence and inclusivity in our societies. My speech will also point out some of the key drivers of intolerance or in exclusion in most of our societies. Madam President, peaceful coexistence entails peace among groups or societies or nations of widely differing political, religious, and cultural ideologies. An inclusive society is a society that ensures equal opportunities to all people, regardless of race, gender, class, generation, or geography. Peaceful and inclusive societies promote social policies which seek to reduce inequality and create and tolerant societies that embrace all people. Madam President, sometimes intolerance is attributed to ignorance and fear, fear for the unknown of the cultures, nations, and religions. In some extreme cases, intolerance emerges through arguments and discussions on specific topics which slowly lead to violence against one another. Subsequently, intolerance leads to a permanent separation between groups and traditions. In Malawi, Madam President, the most common form of intolerance is violence against the elderly, especially women. On a number of occasions, we have received reports from the rural areas of abuse of the elderly through ill treatment, insults, and in extreme cases, stoning to death elderly women who are suspected of practicing witchcraft. In addition, Sexism has also reared its ugly head, especially in politics, where women find it extremely tough to compete in a society that is yet to appreciate the role of women in development. Madam President, it is also common in Malawi, just like in most parts of the society, for people or politicians of different political affiliations not to work together harmoniously. This far, Malawi has worked harmoniously and we have seen change of power smoothly. A series of demonstrations by citizens which has mushroomed over the past 15 years or so is an indicative of a political environment that needs to work hard on inclusivity and tolerance. Parliaments are there for key institutions which can ensure that this is done. Madam President, some of the common drivers of intolerance in Malawi are unemployment, poverty, hunger, religious extremism, ethnicity, political ideologies, perceived threat, and distrust, as well as social media. Madam President, unemployment rate in Malawi is expected to reach 7.4% by the end of 2022, according to the Trading Economics Global Macro Models and Analysts expectations. Considering that the majority of the population is the youth, issues to do with linking unemployment to intolerance cannot be overemphasized. Madam President, poverty and hunger also influence people's behaviors by shifting their focus towards meeting immediate needs and threats. This can be manifested by a person being intolerant and harsh to others, to other people or views. Madam President, there is also an indisputable link between social media platforms and intolerance manifested through hate speeches and cyberbullying. 
the Constitution of the Republic of Malawi grants people freedom of speech, but also knowing how social media is being misused by other people, the Parliament of Malawi passed the Penal Code Act, which was amended in 2014 to strike the balance between the constitutional provision and the need to curb misuse of the same. Madam President, allow me to share with you the, and the delegates some factors which promote coexistence and how parliaments can nurture and encourage them. A well-functioning government. Madam President, having a well-functioning government makes it possible for peaceful coexistence in its citizenry. It is therefore important for all three arms of government to collaborate and work together in a quest for peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. This entails that while the legislature enacts laws that are in the best interests of the citizens, the judiciary should be able to interpret the laws effectively and timelessly, while the executive ensures the proper implementation and observance of the law. So far, in Malawi, all three arms of government are working harmoniously. Equitable distribution of resources. Madam President, equal distribution and utilization of resources will significantly affect the orientation of society, either towards a more integrated and inclusive society or a disintegrated one. Parliaments must therefore pass socioeconomic policies which gear towards managing equitable distribution and equal opportunities for the people they represent. Furthermore, as parliaments, we need to go further by ensuring that our monitoring mechanism do so in good time in order to provide feedback to the executive for the timely interventions where need be. Madam President, in conclusion, it is clear that parliaments have a key responsibility to foster unity and coexistence among, among the people they represent by ensuring that legal instruments and guiding principles that will guarantee equity and opportunities for all citizens are passed and enforced. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am informed that uh, Bangladesh is not yet here, so it's the turn of Yemen to be followed by Zimbabwe. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Sayyidat wa sada. Assalamu alaikum. Wa smahu li awalan ana taqaddama bi gazeel al-shukri للشعبة البرلمانية البحرينية البحرينية وللبحرين مليكا وحكومة وشعبا على حفاوة الاستقبال وحسن التنظيم والإعداد لهذا اللقاء ولكم هو مناسب أيها الزملاء أن نجتمع في هذا الظرف العصيب تحت شعار تعزيز التعايش السلمي ومكافحة التعصب وأن يشكل هذا الموضوع رغبة أكيدة وإرادة قوية لنا جميعا لتحقيقه قولا وفعلا لأن ذلك ما تحتاج إليه المجتمعات الإنسانية بدرجة أساسية وملحة فهو أول مقتضى من مقتضيات السلام والتنمية والرفاه, والرفاه والتطور وإذا كان التعايش السلمي داخل المجتمعات يرتكز على احترام كامل الحقوق في اللون والمعتقد والدين والرأي السياسي والفكري وحق المرأة في المشاركة فإنه لا ينبغي التغاضي عن ضرورات التعايش بين الأمم كأساس الاستقرار كأساس الاستقرار للمجتمعات واستنهاض كل هذه القيام ووجوب احترام كل أمة للأخرى على قاعدة الاعتراف بحقها وبما يقود العلاقات بين الأمم إلى حيث الندية والاحترام المتبادل السيدات والسادة من الجدير أن نجتمع تحت هذا الشعار والعالم يعيش حالة من الاضطراب والنزاعات والاقتتال في كثير من البلدان وبالذات في عالمنا العربي وفي مقدمتها بلد اليمن جراء التدخل الإيراني وعبثه بالتعايش السلمي بين الأمم في كثير من البلدان العربية 
ومحاولته تصدير ما ما يسميه بالمذاهب والثورة الإيرانية إلى شعوبنا بقوة الطائفة والمذهب والملشنة والسلاح والعنف وتهديد الأمن الداخلي لكل بلد وغايته في ذلك أن تصبح مجتمعاتنا مثلها هي وحتى تنصهر تنوعاتنا الثقافية والدينية المتسالمة والمتعايشة في هويتها المذهبية والثورية المعادية لنا والعالم فيسهل لها ابتلاعنا ويمحى حقنا في الوجودي في أن نكون نحن كما خلقنا الله ونحن أصحاب حضارة قبل أن تكون إيران ذات حضارة ونحن أصحاب تاريخ قبل أن تكون إيران ذات تاريخ ونحن أمة آمنت بالرسائل السماوية وبالحرية ومارست الديمقراطية قبل آلاف السنين وقد شهد لنا القرآن بذلك ولا نقبل أن يدمر ما شيدناه على مر العصور الزملاء الأعزاء أقول لكم بكل الصدق أن من كانت يده في النار ليست كمن يده في الماء فأنا قادم من بلد تصطلي بالحرب والملشنة والإلغاء والإقصاء وتسيد المذهب الواحد والرأي الواحد والصوت الواحد لقد رمتنا إيران بأسوأ ما لديها من السلاح المادي والإيديولوجي بما تسمى الميليشيات الحوثية التي انقضت على الحكومة الشرعية المنتخبة فقلبت المجتمع اليمني رأسا على عقب مزقت نسيجه ودمرت بنيان بني بنيته وبعثرت أهله وقطعت أرحامه تخطف وتسجن وتحكم بالإعدام على البرلمانيين والسياسيين والصحفيين والنساء وتجند الأطفال وتسلب الأموال بالباطل وتمعن في تعذيب السكان وتعدم الأبرياء بحجج ما أنزل الله بها من سلطان والحقيقة أيها السادة إنما يعبث بالسلام إنما إن إيران وهي تعبث إن النظام الإيراني وهو يعبث بالسلام وفقا لمنافعه ومحاولة لفرض وجوده في غرب آسيا في غرب آسيا وفي شرق أفريقيا وفي مختلف وفي مخت... آآ آآ والزحف نحو الشمال الأفريقي ومن شواطئ لبنان على البحر الأبيض المتوسط وحتى شواطئ اليمن على بحر العرب والبحر الأحمر وسواحل الخليج العربي والمحيط الهندي يتوثب للزحف الأفق الدام إلى قلب الأمة العربية لإفتراسها وتهديد العالم منها نعم أيها السادة السيدات والسادة لقد سيطرت إيران من خلال الانقلاب بميليشياتها الحوثية الإرهابية على بلدي ضمن مخطط الهادف للتحول إلى قوة إقليمية قادرة على الاستيلاء على مصادر الطاقة العالمية والسيطرة على مقدسات المسلمين وتحكم بأهم المضائق المائية في العالم بدءا من مضيق هرمز ثم مضيق باب المندب ومضيق قناة السويس والتأثير في السياسة, في السياسة الشرق الأوسط والعالم واستثمارات في, ش... واستثمرت في مشاعر المسلمين وتاجرت بالقضية الفلسطينية والقدس الشريف سبيلا للتغلغل والتسرب والتسلل إلى المنطقة كما تبنت تصدير مشروع ولاية الفقيه الأدلوجي لغرض التجيش السياسي والذي تستهدف بمضامينه بناء إمبراطورية دينية عابرة للحدود السياسية والمذهبية والتقليدية ولكي تكسب تلك الأدلوجية عصبية التكي عليها اتخذت من التشيع السياسي وقودا كما هو الحال في اليمن ولبنان والعراق وأعلنت في غير مناسبة أنها عازمة على حكم العالم الإسلامي إن العالم اليوم على شفى خطر وجودي ناتج عن أزمات خطيرة أولها جائحة كورونا Thank ثم you. الحرب الروسية الأوكرانية وما خلفته من مآسي وآلام على سكان الأرض والأزمة الاقتصادية التي ألقت بظلالها على مناحي الحياة وأزمة غذاء هزت كيان العالم وروعته بشبح المجاعة وكذلك الحروب في مناطق مختلفة والكوارث الطبيعية والحرب بين الأقطاب الكبار الذي يشعرنا بالقلق والخوف بالقلق والخوف إلى إلى آخر ما نعيشه في هذا الظرف العصيب وختاما 
إن مبدأ التعايش لم يعد مجرد ترف فكري بل هو ضرورة لحماية مستقبل البشرية من أخطار دعوات الكراهية والعنف والإقصاء وهذا يستدعي استناد قدرات المجتمع الإنسانية وتوحيد جهود الدول لتعزيز هذا المسار كقيمة إنسانية جامعة تكفى لحماية التنوع وقديرا أن تعمل البرلمانات الوطنية والحكومات والحكومات على رعاية وإدارة هذا الاختلاف وبما يحسنها من الوقوع في شرك العنف والإقصاء والإلغاء وفقنا الله جميعا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, thank you um, Next speaker is Zimbabwe to be followed by Bangladesh. Thank you. Madam President, dear colleagues, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, as well as fighting intolerance, is the kernel of our IPU Assembly's theme. In that context, need I remind this Assembly that the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 1995 the United Nations Year for tolerance in response to the ubiquitous intolerance, the world where peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies were blunted,ly under naked threat to humanity. That year, which coincided with the golden jubilee of the United Nations, was opportune to reflect and reacquaint ourselves with the historical antecedents that preceded its formation. These antecedents included the darkest hours of humankind, largely defined by the denial of the democratic principles of the dignity, equality, and mutual respect of men and women, and by the propagation in their place through ignorance and prejudice of the doctrine of the inequality of men and women and race. Furthermore, through the United Nations Resolution 61 of 2007, member states reinforced the universal relevance of the principle of non-violence, the desire to secure a culture of peace, tolerance, understanding, and non-violence. Accordingly, this assembly's theme is an affirmation of the criticality of the 1995 United Nations Year for Tolerance. To that an extent, our parliaments under the umbrella of the IPU should strive for bullish parliamentary diplomacy that rises on the pedestal of robust roundtable dialogue to achieve global peaceful coexistence. Madam President, Universal Declaration of Human Rights is unequivocal in its proclamation that the foundation of peaceful and inclusive society rests on the promotion and protection of the inalienable rights of humankind, regardless of race, creed, political affiliation, gender, and sexual orientation. Essentially, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, supported by the United Nations Charter and the international law, anchor the need for geopolitical peaceful coexistence, inclusive societies, and tolerance. Yet while the progress has been made towards this compelling and perpetual hankering for co coexistential justice, peace, and harmony, recent history recalls the archetypal banality of our efforts. Madam President, the recent COVID-19 pandemic, the catastrophic climatic shocks and the devastating earthquake, such as the recent one in Turkey, Syria, as well as flash floods 
and the more calamitous cyclones affecting Southern Africa and worldwide are some of the Holocaust threats societies continue to face in their endeavor to coexist peacefully. This situation of human insecurity has been exacerbated by the adverse ripple effects of the Russia-Ukraine war, which has negatively destabilized global economies in terms of imported high inflation, increased energy and food prices. All these exigencies call for peaceful coexistence, inclusive and tolerant societies in mitigating the existential global human challenges. Accordingly, Madam President, our parliaments are enjoined to play a palpable role instructively in formulating laws and policies that systematically deconstruct the multiplicity of barriers that threaten peaceful coexistence, inclusivity, and caustic intolerance. Furthermore, parliaments should ensure that all multilateral agreements that promote peaceful existence are ratified and domesticated into municipal laws wherever possible. National budget passed by our parliaments must be so stout as to inclusively be pro-poor, pro-gender equality, sensitive youth development, and empowering persons with disabilities. These perspectives resonate well with our Zimbabwe present development mantra of leaving no one and no place behind in the national development agenda is anchored by the 17 sustainable development goals. Additionally, in their respective role, parliaments should be the voice of the voiceless, espousing an inclusive democracy matrix in choosing who should govern them and how they should be governed. Finally, parliaments should have an assiduous oversight role over the executive by ensuring that governments and all their agencies operate in a non-partisan manner that promote peaceful coexistence, inclusivity, and tolerance within the society while pursuing their national economic development agenda. Madam President, in this way, our parliaments would be eloquently fulfilling sustainable goal number 16, whose current call is for peaceful coexistence equitable justice, accountability, and inclusive institutions at all levels of governance. Indeed, no man is an island on this planet. Our African philosophy of Ubuntu, which affirms that I am because you are, is an incontrovertible testament to the IPU Assembly's theme we are interrogating here in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Long live king, the king and the kingdom of Bahrain. Long live the IPU family for democracy and peaceful coexistence. Thank you, Shukran. Thank you so much. Uh, dear members of parliament, I, it was nice for me to chair this part of the session uh, of the general debate. Now I'm handing over to Gotani, to Madame Gotani Hara, the Speaker of Malawi, to continue with the general debate. Thank you. While Bangladesh is taking the floor, thank you. Good morning, uh, honorable members. Uh, Bangladesh, you have the floor. President of the Assembly, Honorable Chair, IPU President, distinguished speakers, heads of delegation, Assalamu alaikum, a very good morning to you all. 
as the curtain rises on the Interparliamentary Union's 146th Assembly with the slogan for democracy for everyone. It is a very special privilege and honor for me to address and welcome you all at today's general debate session on the theme, Promoting Peaceful Coexistence and Inclusive Societies, Fighting Intolerance, in the beautiful city of Manama in Bahrain. The general debate will provide a platform for delegates to deliberate, express, and exchange their views and galvanize parliamentary action. I thank the host country, Bahrain, and the parliament for hosting this event here and for their kind invitation extended to us. Dear parliamentarians, we aspire to live in a world where there is peace, justice, freedom, and harmony. Yet, we find the world engulfed in endless war against terror driven by conflict and violence. Factors like nationalism, authoritarianism, racism, populism, protectionism, militarianism lead to continued breach of peace. All international charters, declarations, covenants, and conventions envisage inclusiveness as an essential prerequisite of attaining peace and harmony. In this global scenario, peace, respect for human rights, and human dignity can be instilled through ensuring equality and non-discrimination of all individuals. No one should be discriminated on the ground of sex, race, religion, caste, creed, language, color, gender, and ethnicity. This leads to grave violation of the core theme that runs as a common thread across all charters and conventions. Dear parliamentarians, Bengali as a nation has time and again stood firm and uncompromising against all forms of discrimination. The clarion call of our father of the nation, Mangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, on 7th March 1971, inspired and united the nation to resolutely stand against exploitation, discrimination, and injustice, and wage a war of liberation to realize our rights irrespective of our racial origin. The Constitution of Bangladesh safeguards equality of all citizens, irrespective of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. As a state party to the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, Bangladesh supports the comprehensive implementation of and follow-up to the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. Historically, communal harmony is a significant trait of the Bengali society. The people of different ethnicities and religions have been living together with peace and harmony in Bangladesh. The country promotes peace, pluralism, democracy, freedom, liberalism, gender equality, and development. Dear parliamentarians, an inclusive society is one that overrides or goes beyond the differences of race, gender, class, or generation and geography, and ensures inclusion, equality of opportunity, as well as space to all members, irrespective of their differences, to flourish together. It also provides the capability of all members to agree to a set of social institutions that govern social interaction. This definition was given in expert group meeting on promoting social integration in Helsinki in July 2008. Inclusive societies aim to bring together people, bring different actors belonging to diverse groups together by building and enhancing trust between them. It creates an integrated approach to engage a diverse range of individuals to peacefully coexist and solve issues without conflict and violence. Reducing inequality, promoting gender equality contributes in building inclusive societies. Inclusion entails providing diverse groups with equal opportunity and access. It is about accommodating people with diverse interests and background in a platform, allowing them to work together in attaining a common purpose and building a common future, while still diverse groups can pursue their own interest. It is important to create a vision among people based on collective agreement of upholding core values of inclusion, diversity, tolerance, empowerment, etc. Parliamentarians are centerpiece of parliamentary democracy 
nurtures the voice of the parliamentarians and parliament in a parliamentary democracy, parliaments are the centerpiece of democracy. Parliaments are also premier representative institution, voicing the aspirations and will of the people. Hence, parliamentarians have powerful tools to bring about positive and transformative changes in the lives of the people they serve. What measures must be taken to ensure peaceful coexistence and building inclusive societies? Systems and institutions breed inequality. Removing institutionalized and systematic inequalities through promotion of democracy, rule of law, tolerance. Eliminating and amending laws that breed discrimination. Legislative and policy support for vulnerable, marginalized segment of population. Bringing about changes in the mindset of stereotype thinking. Bridging the gap between inequalities and eradication of poverty. Instill the core values through education. It is through our concerted efforts that we can move forward in embracing the fundamental tenets of building a tolerant, equitable, peaceful, and inclusive world for all. Thank you. May Bangladesh live forever. Thank you very much, Bangladesh. And I call, call upon Liechtenstein followed by Namibia. Yeah. Madam President, dear colleagues, I thank the Interparliamentary Union and Bahrain, the host, for their leadership and hospitality in convening the 146th Interparliamentary Union Assembly. Intolerance and discrimination are on the rise around the world. It is high time to change this trend. To do so, the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and particularly its Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, play a significant role. A key principle of the SDGs is the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies. Liechtenstein has been constantly advocating for this principle on the international level and at home. This holds also true for the Liechtenstein Parliament. Each proposal to Parliament includes an SDG impact section. Thereby, we put the SDGs front and center in our parliamentary debates. Liechtenstein's total expenditure on official development assistance, the ODA, rose by 13 percent. This reflects our parliament's dedication to strengthen Liechtenstein's international solidarity. Our parliament not only increased the international humanitarian cooperation and development budget, but also approved supplementary budgets in light of the staggering increase in demand for humanitarian assistance and development cooperation, be it due to the COVID-19 pandemic or due to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. The promotion of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law are core values on the Council of Europe. During its upcoming Council of Europe presidency from November 23 to May 24, Liechtenstein will do its utmost to uphold and strengthen these principles. Liechtenstein is not only a strong supporter of the Council of Europe, but also of the International Criminal Court, ICC. In this regard, we call on parliamentarians around the world to speak up much more often in favor of the ICC and advocate for ensuring accountability for the most serious crimes under international law. Just like most members of the international community, 
Liechtenstein is strongly dependent on the validity and observance of the international rules-based order. Respecting it must remain our highest priority. Liechtenstein therefore calls for the end of Russian's aggression against Ukraine, the withdrawal of all Russian armed forces from the sovereign territory of Ukraine, and full accountability for the most serious crimes under international law. We will continue our political and financial support for the people of Ukraine. This support is deeply rooted in our tra traditional advocacy for democracy, justice and the rule of law as the only ways to prevent the use of force and atrocity crimes. Modern slavery is a defining human rights crisis of our time, and it is often fueled by discrimination and intolerance. Sadly, this crime also, consti also constitutes one of the most profitable illegal business models, generating 150 billion US dollars each year into the pockets of criminals. According to the latest statistics, the number of people, people living in modern slavery has increased by over 10 million over the last decade. These concerning developments clearly run counter to our commitment to end modern slavery and human trafficking. Let me assure you that this goal will remain a core priority for Liechtenstein. Madam President, working towards overcoming intolerance and promoting inclusive societies requires a comprehensive response from all of us. In doing so, we should always put people first. We should counter intolerance and discrimination, and we should strengthen the rule-based order. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Alicia Stein. I now call upon Namibia. Thank you, Madam President of our Assembly, Honorable Speakers of Parliament, Honorable Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to stand before you today, this morning, as the head of Namibia Parliamentary Dedication, representing our nation's commitment to promoting peaceful coexistence and an exclusive societies by fighting intolerance. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights establishes that the recognition of equal and inalienable rights of all individuals without discrimination. Societies that uphold these principles are more likely to be peaceful, cohesive, and democratic. Furthermore, promoting peaceful and, and inclusive societies is a, a critical aspect of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the IPU's core mandate to promote peace and cooperation among peoples of the world. As Parliamentary representatives will play a vital role in promoting peaceful coexistence and ex exclusive societies. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to share with you our efforts towards promoting peaceful coexistence and exclusive societies while fighting intolerance in Namibia. 
We are a diverse country with many different ethnic groups, different languages and cultures. However, we believe that our diversity should be celebrated and used as a tool to build a more inclusive and tolerant society. To achieve this goal, our parliament has taken several notable legislative interventions since we gained our independence in 1990. These include, among others, affirmative action to promote employment equity, legislative against gender discrimination, combating of Domestic Violence Act, combating of Rape Act, amendments to the Criminal Procedure Act, and an amendment to High Court Act to ensure promotion of and access to justice for all. These are just few of the laws enacted to promote the rights of all individuals. Finally, our parliament is committed to being more inclusive in its engagement with citizens of our country. We recognize that the voices of all citizens and aspirations are taken into account when developing policies and legislation. The Namibian parliament stands ready to work with fellow IPU member parliaments to share best practices, identif identify key drivers of, to combat intolerance and exclusion, and develop comprehensive approaches to address these challenges. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, promoting peaceful coexistence and in inclusive society by fighting intolerance is essential for creating a more cohesive, democratic, and resilient world. Therefore, it is imperative that as representatives of our people, we take necessary steps to address these challenges and IPU's commitment to promote cohesion and inclusive is an important step towards building a more peaceful and prosperous future for all. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Namibia. I now call upon Oman, and next will be Senegal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma'ali Rais al-Ittihad al-Barlaman al-Dawali. Ma'ali al-Akh Rais Majlis al-Nawab bi Mamlakat al-Bahrain al-Shaqiqa. Wa Ma'ali al-Akh Rais Majlis al-Shura bi Mamlakat al-Bahrain al-Shaqiqa. Ashab al-Ma'ali wa al-Sa'ada ru'asa al-Wufud al-Musharika. Sa'adat al-Amin al-Aam l-Ittihad al-Barlaman al-Dawali. الزميلات والزملاء عضوات وأعضاء المجالس والبرلمانات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بوافر التقدير وامتنان الشاكرين يطيب لي أن أتقدم بخالص الشكر لمملكة البحرين الشقيقة على حفاوة الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة نتقدم بالشكر كذلك إلى الشعب البرلمانية لمملكة البحرين والاتحاد البرلماني الدولي على دعوتهم الكريمة لنا لحضور اجتماع الجمعية في الدورة المية وستة واربعين للاتحاد البرلمان الدولي وأجزل بالشكر للقائمين أعلماء لهذه الجمعية على حسن التنظيم والذي سيكون مكملا للتطلعات الهادفة وللجهود التي بذلت في الدورات السابقة أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الأخوة والأخوات إن توفير متطلبات التنمية والتقدم والارتقاء بالأمم أساسه الحوار المعتدل كونه الرابط الأساس 
في مد الجسور التواصل بين مختلف الشعوب والثقافات لما يتضمنه من عوامل إيجابية في تقريب وجهات النظر بين مختلف الأديان والحضارات ويأتي احترام الأديان والثقافات والحريات العامة في أولوية سلم, سلم الاهتمامات لدى حكومة السلطنة سلطنة عمان من خلال سن القوانين وبناء منظومة تشريعية محكمة متكاملة للحد من الكراهية والتعصب والتطرف وبكل تأكيد فإن خلو سلطنة عمان من الإرهاب والتطرف العنيف لم يكن وليد الصدفة ولا وليد اللحظة ولكن نتيجة عمل جاد على جميع المستويات الحكومية والمؤسسات المدنية الخاصة ومن خلال نشر الإصدارات العلمية المحكمة لبلورة مفاهيم التسامح والتفاهم لدى النشأ وتضمين قيم الاحترام لجميع الأديان والثقافات كما اهتمت سلطنة عمان بتعليم اللغات الغير عربية وفتح مراكز لتعليم اللغة العربية للناطقين بغيرها باعتبارها الأداة الفاعلة في التواصل ونقل الثقافات بين الشعوب كما تقوم سلطنة عمان بتوظيف كافة وسائل الإعلام المختلفة في تنمية الوعي بضرورة التعايش والاحترام المتبادل وتعزيز قيم الانسجام بين أتباع الديانات المختلفة إلى جانب تنظيم العديد من المؤتمرات والمناشط الدولية للتباحث بين العلماء من مختلف الأديان حول تعزيز التسامح الديني والتعايش بين الثقافات ولذا استمر تصنيف سلطنة عمان دائما في المراتب الأولى عالميا من حيث انعدام تأثرها بالإرهاب في مؤشر الإرهاب العالمي أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الأخوة والأخوات إننا اليوم في أمس الحاجة إلى تعزيز مبادئ ومعاني التعايش السلمي بين المجتمعات ونبذ التعصب بأكثر من أي وقت مضى وبخاصة في ظل التطور السريع لوسائل التواصل المجتمعية والتي أصبحت ملاذا للشعوب العالمية للمعرفة والانفتاح على كافة الثقافات والمجتمعات ولذا علينا جميعا العمل على تقريب وجهات النظر ومد جسور التعاون والتلاحم بين الشعوب أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الكرام لا يسعني في الختام إلا أن أعرب لكم عن خالص الشكر والامتنان والتقدير وأن تكلل جهودنا بالتوفيق والنجاح في تعزيز مفاهيم في تعزيز مفاهيم التعايش السلمي وصولا إلى عالم يسوده الأمن والسلام والاستقرار والتنمية المستدامة لينعم الإنسان في مختلف بقاع الأرض بالحياة الكريمة الآمنة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, Oman. I now call upon Senegal, followed by Afghanistan. Madame la Présidente, Monsieur le Président d'Assemblée, chers collègues, chefs de délégation, chers invités, permettez-moi tout d'abord d'exprimer ma profonde gratitude à l'endroit des autorités bahreïnies pour l'accueil empreint de chaleur et d'hospitalité réservé à ma délégation et à moi-même dans ce beau royaume. Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, notre 146e Assemblée se tient dans un contexte international marqué d'une part par la dégradation de la situation économique et ses conséquences sociales dans nos différents pays, surtout au niveau des moyens nantis, et d'autre part par la persistance de beaucoup de conflits 
accroissant avec les, ainsi les incertitudes et inquiétudes, les différentes crises vécues ces dernières années sont pour beaucoup générées ou exacerbées par une certaine intolérance ou une absence de dialogue positif entre les parties concernées. Que ce soit entre des pays ou des communautés, communautés d'une même nation, c'est en effet la rupture dans les règles minimales de vie commune, de coexistence pacifique ou simplement de compréhension mutuelle qu'il faut rechercher la plupart des causes des conflits. C'est pourquoi le thème de notre débat général est fort pertinent. Promouvoir la coexistence pacifique et les sociétés inclusives combattre l'intolérance constitue des défis majeurs de notre époque, tant les menaces sur la stabilité, la sécurité et le bien-être au plan mondial sont pressantes en raison de l'intransigeance, du sectarisme, du manque d'empathie de certaines personnes ou groupes de personnes. Le recours à la violence, à la discrimination ou au repli sur soi de plus en plus constaté et le reflet de relations bâties sur l'incompréhension, sur l'exclusion, sur l'absence de respect mutuel ou sur une coexistence conflictuelle. La reconnaissance et la promotion des valeurs de diversité sont des corollaires d'une société inclusive et des gages d'une harmonie dans les communautés et dans les institutions. Il est alors impérieux de développer et de propager des valeurs d'ouverture, d'écoute, de compréhension mutuelle pour favoriser l'amitié et la concorde entre les peuples et au sein des communautés. Il est tout aussi salutaire de se dresser contre l'intolérance qui conduit à des pratiques aussi condamnables que le refus de l'autre, la non-acceptation de la différence des options et des, des opinions et des croyances, la violence morale ou physique. Chers collègues, le Sénégal, mon pays, a une longue tradition en matière de défense et de promotion de la coexistence pacifique, de lutte contre toutes les formes d'exclusion et d'intolérance, tant au plan interne qu'au niveau régional et international. C'est sans doute ce qui nous vaut la stabilité que nous connaissons depuis l'accession à la souveraineté internationale. Le premier président de la République du Sénégal, M. Léopold Sédar Senghor, de confession religieuse pourtant différente de celle de la majorité de la population, a dirigé le pays pendant une vingtaine d'années en bénéficiant d'un soutien massif. Ceci est une traduction concrète des valeurs de liberté, de solidarité, de diversité et de non-discrimination, mais aussi de tolérance et d'inclusion qui fondent notre nation et qui sont clairement affirmées dans la Constitution. Les concepts de civilisation de l'universel, rendez-vous du donner et du recevoir, enracinement et d'ouverture, ont inspiré la pratique politique et la diplomatie sénégalaise. Cette approche consistant à promouvoir l'enrichissement mutuel et la prospérité partagée dans les relations internationales a été poursuivie et approfondie par ses successeurs. Le mandat du président Macky Sall à la tête de l'Union africaine qui vient de s'achever en est une parfaite illustration. En matière d'inclusion sociale et politique, le Sénégal a élaboré une stratégie nationale pour l'égalité et l'équité du genre et une loi sur la parité qui prévoit une représentation équitable entre les hommes et les femmes sur les listes électorales pour les élections législatives et territoriales ainsi que pour la répartition des postes aux différentes instances de direction des assemblées d'élus. Aujourd'hui, l'Assemblée nationale que j'ai l'honneur de présider compte 165 députés répartis entre 89 hommes et 76 femmes. Chers collègues, l'impact des politiques et pratiques d'affrontement, d'exclusion et d'intolérance au sein des nations ou entre les pays peut être désastreux pour la paix, la sécurité et la stabilité au plan mondial. Notre responsabilité en tant que parlementaire exige non seulement une prise de conscience des dangers, mais aussi des initiatives en direction des populations que nous représentons, des gouvernements et des institutions en vue de la mise en œuvre d'actions et de mesures fortes. Les actions à envisager devraient porter sur l'éducation, qui est un facteur déterminant pour l'inclusion et contre l'intolérance. 
la communication qui encouragerait le dialogue et la discussion ouverte, la promotion de la diversité culturelle dans les médias, l'expression des opinions différentes dans l'espace public qui permettrait de sensibiliser les populations et de lutter contre des préjugés. Le, un cadre législatif, réglementaire et institutionnel, le renforcement du dialogue et de l'amitié entre les peuples et là, les organisations et institutions internationales comme l'UEP devraient prendre une part active dans le combat contre l'intolérance en mettant en place plus de programmes d'échange et de coopération, des résolutions et recommandations sur le sujet, une délocalis délocalisation étendue de leurs activités et des campagnes de sensibilisation plus accrues dans les différents pays. La lutte contre l'intolérance nécessite des efforts concertés de la part de tous les acteurs, du plus petit citoyen aux institutions internationales. Chers collègues, en vous souhaitant plein succès à nos travaux, je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you, Afghanistan. Uh, sorry, Senegal. I call upon Afghanistan, followed by Sierra Leone. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم سلام وقت همه در نشست حاضر بخیر آقای رئیس دوستان و همکاران عزیز اجازه بدهید اولتر از همه مراتب تسلیت عمیق خود و مردم افغانستان را به خاطر جان باختگان زلزله اخیر غمناک کشورهای دوست ترکیه و سوریه به مردم ترکیه و سوریه تقدیم بدارم متاسفانه من امروز یک بار دیگر در نشست اتحادیه بین پارلمانی امسال در شرایط شاک میکنم که افغانستان برای سال دوم زیر فشار گروه طالبان به سر میبرد و مردم افغانستان و جهانیان شاید آن هستند که نه تنها وضعیت اقتصادی عدالت اجتماعی نبود تحصیل زنان تبعیض فقر نامنی رو به پیشرفت نیست بلکه سایه ناامیدی بیشتر از سال قبل گردیده و مردم افغانستان را به حالت بحران کشاندن افغانستان در طی دو دهه اخیر دارای دستاوردهای چشمگیری بود که از ورزش اقتصاد تحصیلات آزادی بیان حقوق بشر پارلمان مردمی نیروهای امنیتی و موارد دیگر میتوان نام گرفت بعد از سقوط جمهوریت متاسفان از فعالیت باز ماند پارلمان افغانستان که در سوارد بزرگ بی سال گذشته به شمار می رفت از فعالیت باز ماند و اکن نیاز جدی است تا روابط بین پارلمانی میان کشورهای اوزای کنفرانس بیشتر از پیش برقرار و صدای بر حق مردم افغانستان از آدرس پارلمان به گوش جهانیان رسانیده شود حقیقت این است که افغانستان دارای اقوام مختلف بوده که هر یک دارای فرهنگ تاریخ و افتخارات بزرگ می باشد و در طول تاریخ در حکومت در حکومت داری کشور سهیم و در ساختن افغانستان کنونی نقش ارزشمندی را ایفا نمودند ریشکن ساختن فقر تعصب و مشارکت تمام اقوام در ساختن و تدویق نظام مردم سالار یک اصل مهم کشوری به شمار می رود که متاسفانه نظام کنونی طالبان پاسگوی نیازهای مردم یک کشور نبوده و در تامین امنیت و کلای پارلمان ناکام بوده که نمونه روشن آن به شهاده رسیدن مرسل نبیزاده یک نمندگان فعال جوان زن در پارلمان افغانستان بود که زیر نظام طالبانی به گونه مرموز به شهادت رسید و تا امروز هیچ کسی در مورد علت ترور او برای مردم پاسخ نداده است که ما و شما هم به جز تسلیت گفتن چیز دیگر کرده نتوانستیم این در حال است که در حدود 125 تن از وکلا و اکثریت کارمندان دارالانشای پارلمان تا هنوز در افغانستان و کشورهای همسایه در خطر زندگی می کنند خواهش من از شما به خصوصیت رهبری اتحادیه بین پارلمانی و کشورهای دوست اروپا و کانادا این است که چطور بتوانید جانهای این تعداد همکاران خیش را 
نجات داده و در کشورهای خود میزبانشان شوید حاضرین گرامی من من حیث رئیس پارلمان افغانستان و نماینده صدای میلیونی مردم کشورم را برای اتحاد بین پارلمانی جامعه جهانی و نهادهای حقوق بشری بیان می دارم که سخنان من در خواستهای مشروع و بر حق مردم افغانستان بوده و از این آدرس یک بار دیگر بالای رژیم طالبان صدا می زنم و حقوق مسلم مردم افغانستان را به گوششان می رسانم که تا تشکیل یک نظام همه شمول و مشارکت سیاسی تمام اقوام افغانستان باید برای شروندان کشور تامین عدالت، همنیت، نابودی فقر، توزیع عادلانه کمک های بشر دوستانه، نابودی تعویض و برای بانوان زمینه های تحصیل و کار را ایجاد نموده و در دوزه های مکاتب و پانتون ها را برای خواهران و دختران کشور باز نمایند. دوستان محترم، پیشنهاد من برای علی بحران کنونی افغانستان این است که کجمای جهانی تشکیل گردیده و رای گفتگوی سیاسی افغانستان را دارای یک نظام مردم سالار و مترقی نمایند. نظامی که تمام اقوام در آن سهم داشته باشد. در حقی خواست جدی من از شما همکاران عزیز این است که در تامین خواسته های برحق مردم افغانستان ما را یاری و همکاری نمایید. تشکر و شکرم. Thank you very much, Afghanistan. Sierra Leone, followed by Arab Parliament. Mr. President, Chairperson, Mr. Secretary General, fellow delegates, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I bring you all greetings from Sierra Leone, the land of the Lion Mountains, and especially from our parliament and people. Unmitigated acclaim goes to the parliament and people of Bahrain, the land of a million date palms, for hosting this 146th General Assembly of the IPU and for the outstanding facilities that have been placed at our disposal. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, despite the rights and obligations enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, now elevated to the status of rights under customary international law. Today, we all still live in a world challenged by growing uncertainty and insecurity with grave underpinnings of rising injustice, discrimination, inequality, and intolerance, a world increasingly being pulled apart by abhorrent forces of hate and divisiveness, tension and conflict, and want and poverty. Peaceful coexistence and inclusion, some might even say radical inclusion, must therefore remain at the top of the agenda of the times in which we live, because the consequences of the alternatives are just too dire to contemplate. Indeed, the evidence is irrefutable that the world today is at its lowest point of peacefulness and has in fact been so for the past 15 or more years. Nowhere is this more conspicuous than in addressing gender inequality and religious intolerance, to name just two examples. All of these threaten social cohesion and global peace. Parliaments and parliamentarians must therefore continue to play a crucial role as the representatives of the people and as the primary channel by which grievances and concerns, but also needs and desires, are expressed. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Sierra Leone, despite its smallness by geography and population, 
stands out uniquely and extraordinarily tall in the world today as the brightest emblem of religious tolerance on the firmament. With a population of a little over 7 million, divided between Muslims and Christians in the ratio of 3 to 1 respectively, Sri Leone has successfully and effectively memorialized intermarriages between people of different religious faiths and beliefs. Such intermarriages today are countless and are as common in occurrence in churches and mosques as people shopping together in the same market malls and marketplaces. Families and friends donning different religions move about freely and joyously in all places of worship without disturbance and in full support and solidarity of one another, especially during weddings, child naming and christening ceremonies and funerals. All this has been going on for decades without generating as much as an iota of tension, much less of violence in the country. Today, so legendary is the intermingling between Muslims and Christians that it is no exaggeration to claim that over the years, Sri Lanka has become a beacon, has become the brightest beacon of hope, the unsung epitome, and the gold standard by which to emulate and judge the profundity of religious tolerance for the rest of the universe. And there is no better exemplar to demonstrate this height of religious tolerance in Sierra Leone than our current head of state, His Excellency, Brigadier Retired Julius Mada Bio, who is a practicing Catholic, married to the First Lady, Madam Fatima Bio from the Gambia, who is a Muslim. Another example, famously of the reverse order, is President Hamad Tijan Kaba of blessed memory, who was a staunch Muslim and occupied the presidency from 1996 to 2007, was married to the First Lady, Mrs. Patricia Kaba, again a Catholic by religion. These two notable examples not only magnify the apogee of religious tolerance in Sierra Leone, they've helped to cascade the culture of religious tolerance reverentially to the middle and lower echelons of Sierra Leonean society, to such an extent that it is now generally accepted as a matter of cause, and not as much as a brow is raised or a glance of disapproval is turned when such mixed marriages occur anywhere in the country. The same also can be said of the current government's flagship of human capital development in the areas of providing free quality education at the basic and secondary Nabos, school uh, educational up, and national healthcare institutional levels. For so long has it been tried to observe school children of different religions going in their thousands to educational institutions run by either Christian or Muslim denomination, as is equally true of sick patients needing and receiving medical care in hospitals managed by public and private sectors alike throughout the country. There is absolutely no discrimination to speak of based Can I go on consider religion. winding up, please? Your Excellencies, above over and above all this, what has climaxed most, our level of resilience, tolerance, cohesion, and integration is symbolized by the enactment by Parliament last year of two extant laws under the rubric of Public Elections Act and Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Act. Both laws set, our, set out legal minim, minimums for the representation and participation of women in the legislature, as well as in the public and private sectors. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the current government in Sierra Leone is currently on the right trajectory. 
and considering that women account for 51% of the population, the current executive with the collaboration of the legislature is putting them at the center of an avowed determination Hon Honorable Speaker from Senegal time. to promote and Senate build Leon, sorry, a comprehensive and resilient national culture of respect for gender equality and women empowerment. Exponentially, 2022 will go down in history as the watershed year in which the government of Sierra Leone moved from the rhetoric to positive legislative action. What remains in the journey ahead is no less timorous, odious, and daunting. But if the momentum established in 2022 is sustained, there is no doubt in the determination of the BO government to forge ahead to reach the desired goal. To this end, I will conclude with a, with a quotation taken from a statement by President Mada Bio at the general debate of the fifth UN Conference on Least Developed Countries held in Doha, Qatar on 5th March this year, in which he said, and I quote, will continue to prioritize interventions that address vulnerabilities S and exclusion time. among women, girls, youth, the aged, and the disabled. We'll scale up radical inclusion, financial inclusion, skills development, and job creation, and continue to pursue our national social protection policies. On this note, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you most kindly for your kind attention. Thank you, Sierra Leone. Upon Arab Parliament. Ashaban Maali, Rasa al Barlamanat, Rasa al Ufud al Barlamania, As Sayyidat was Sad al Hadur al Karim, As Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakata. Yatib Ali Bidayatan, and Rabber and Saadati al Balagha, then Musharaka Fishtamaat, the Jamai al Ame, and Musa Torbirin, the Tahad al Barlamani Duali, Walati Taktasib Ladei Ahami Sithnaia, and Mustawa and Mustawain, and Mahani was Shahsi. ليس فقط لأنها تنعقد على أرض عربية لكنها بالإضافة إلى ذلك تنعقد في موطني الغالي مملكة البحرين التي تمثل واحة للتعايش السلمي وذلك تجسيدا للرؤية الملكية مستنيرة لحضرة صاحب الجلال الملك حمد بن عيسى آل خليفة ملك مملكة البحرين معظم حفظ الله ورعاه الذي حرص على جعل مملكة البحرين نموذجا رائدا ومضيئا للتعايش السلمي والحوار بين جميع الثقافات والأديان وكذلك الدور الكبير الذي يقوم به صاحب السمو الملكي الأمير سلمان بن حمد آل خليفة ولي العهد رئيس مجلس وزراء حفظ الله ورعاه من أجل ترجمة مرئيات هذه الرؤية الملكية المستنيرة إلى سياسات وبرامج وتقدم بخالص الشكر وعظيم التقدير إلى المجلس الوطني البحريني بغرفتيه الشورى والنواب برئاسة معالي الأخ أحمد بن سلمان المسلم رئيس مجلس النواب معالي الأخ علي بن صالح الصالح رئيس مجلس الشورى على حسن التنظيم لأعمال هذه الاجتماعات وما تم بذله من جهود مقدرة في هذا الشأن الحضور الكريم أن تعزيز لغة الحوار والتعايش السلمي بين مختلف الثقافات والأديان يمثل حجر الأساس الذي يقوم عليه السلام العالمي وهو, وهو مسؤولية تشاركية تحتاج إلى تكامل ما بين خطاب ديني يحارب العنف والفكر المتطرف ونظام تعليمي يرسخ ثقافة التسامح وقبول الآخر ورسالة إعلامية متحضرة تبعث على التضامن والتلاحم ويحمي ذلك كله منظومة تشريعية متماسكة تجرم التعصب والعنصرية ولكننا للأسف الشديد فأن عالمنا المعاصر يفتقد بشكل كبير إلى هذه المنظومة المتكاملة حيث يواجه التعايش السلمي في الكثير من مناطق العالم تحديات معقدة ففي الوقت الذي ينادي فيه المجتمع الدولي 
بتعزيز قيم التسامح والتعايش السلمي واحترام حقوق الشعوب في تقرير مصيرها ما يزال التعامل الدولي مع القضية الفلسطينية القائم على ازدواجية المعايير والكيل بمكيالين يمثل تحديا حقيقيا في هذا الشأن حيث يتم حرمان شعب بأكمله من أبسط حقوقه وهي نيل حريته وانهاء احتلال أراضيه لقد قال الأوال المجتمع الدولي بكل دوله ومنظماته أن تكون له وقفة جادة من أجل التوصل إلى حل عادل وشامل للقضية الفلسطينية حيث سيكون ذلك من أعظم الانتصارات التي يحققها العالم في مجال التعايش السلمي كذلك تعاني منطقتنا العربية من استمرار العديد من الأزمات المزمنة دون حل بسبب استمرار التدخلات الإقليمية والدولية التي تهدد حالة التعايش السلمي في المنطقة وتعمل على إذكاء نار الفتنة بين أبناء المجتمع الواحد وإطالة أمد هذه الأزمات طبعا في السيطرة على مغدرات شعوب دول المنطقة دون مراعاة لمعاناتهم اليومية في أبشع صور الانتهازية السياسية التي يشهدها عالمنا المعاصر الحضور الكريم تحرص جميع الأديان السماوية على تحقيق التعايش السلمي بين مجتمعات كافة وتدعو إلى تعزيز لغة الحوار والتفاهم ومحاربة التمييز والتعصب والعنصرية ومع ذلك فقد تابعنا جميعا ما قام به ما خرم بعض المتطرفين في عدد من الدول الأوروبية من جرائم حرق وتمزيق نسخ من القرآن الكريم وللأسف الشديد ارتكبت هذه الجرائم بعلم وتحت حماية السلطات الرسمية في بعض تلك الدول في انتهاك, في انتهاك صارح لاحترام الرموز والمقدسات الدينية إن هذه التصرفات المشينة التي تمثل استفزازا لمشاعر أكثر من مليارين مسلم حول العالم والتي تؤجج خطاب العنف الكراهية تفرض علينا التعاون من أجل وضع إقدار قانوني دولي ملزم لمنع ازدياد ازدراء الأديان ومحاسبة كل من يتورط في مثل هذه الممارسات البذيئة في الختام أؤكد باسم البرلمان العربي أننا جميعا شركاء في إنسانية واحدة ساهمت كل ثقافات شعوب العالم في بنائها وعلينا أن نحافظ على هذا البناء ونعمل معا على تغوية نسيجة من أجل العالم يسوده الأمن والسلام والاستقرار لخير الإنسانية جمعاء ويدعو البرلمان العربي إلى أن يصدر عن اجتماعنا هذا التي تضم ممثلين عن مختلف شعوب العالم صوت الحق يطالب بإنهاء معاناة الشعب الفلسطيني وأبحث الدخلات الخارجية للشؤون الداخلية للدول والتأكيد على حرية الرأي والتعبير لا تعني بأي حال من أحوال تقابل الإساءة إلى الأديان ورموز ورموزها المقدسة أشكركم على حسن الاستماع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much, Arab Parliament. Honorable members, this concludes the list of speakers from a list uh, who are speakers of Parliament. We now will start with uh, list B, which are the first speakers from delegation. And we will start with uh, Maldives, followed by Botswana. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين President, Secretary General, esteemed colleagues السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and a very good morning It is an honor for me to speak to you today about the significance of combating intolerance not just in our own communities but on an international level Intolerance is a venom that threatens to sever human bonds and undermines our efforts to create a more peaceful and just world. It is a collective responsibility to stand up against it and as the guardians of the rule of law, human rights and justice of our respective countries. We have a duty to encourage our societies to embrace inclusivity. We all have gathered here from all over the world, bringing with us diverse viewpoints 
experiences, and cultural backgrounds. It is important to acknowledge our diversity since it is what makes each of us unique. It also suggests that we run the risk of misinterpreting one another, passing judgment on the other based on our differences, and failing to recognize the rich tapestry of the human experience. In short, diversity is what sets us apart. So honoring that is important. Distinguished parliamentarians, intolerance can manifest itself in a variety of ways, such as prejudice against particular racial or ethnic groups or bigotry motivated by one's political, religious, or gender views. It can be subtle, such as through the use of derogatory language or stereotypes, or as apparent as violence or hate crimes. We are seeing both these forms, especially on online platforms. Online hate speech continues to sow division. According to a 2021 report by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, online hate speech is increasing against minorities. As, repre as representatives of the people, we have a responsibility to safeguard them by passing the required legislation and holding our governments accountable and the slightest suspicion of its failure. Esteemed colleagues, as, rep as representatives of the people, we face two enormous challenges in order to accomplish what is expected of us by our societies. We ought to acknowledge that the public's trust and confidence in the legislature and political officers is vanished. I will admit it. I acknowledge, based on personal knowledge, that many Maldivians are losing faith in the political system, including the legislature, due to many factors. I discussed the gravity of the situation with my colleagues and my political party. We believe that the distrust of the public stems from our inability to address their concerns. Conversely, at times, we tend to exceed their perception of civil liberties when we confront those matters. Distinguished members, the Maldives is among the luckiest nations as there are very few factors that could cause societal division. Because we are a nation of one language, race, and religion, yet religious intolerance has crept in. And there are a few individuals determined to split our society and destroy social cohesion. I do not wish to identify these fanatics with our faith, as their goal to create violence has nothing to do with the religion. The Maldives has been coping with the violent extremism since 2007, and the threat persists. As a creator of law, the Maldives parliament has adopted a series of laws to bolster the legal armory against violent extremism and terrorism. Aside from that, laws are regularly amended in an effort to promote social cohesiveness and religious unity. The, nation, the, the national efforts to counter the threat are constantly being challenged by what is happening globally. The Maldivian youth, like youth of many other countries, are drawn into internal conflicts occurring elsewhere. They migrate to those places with the assumption that these conflicts are religious in nature. It is too late by the time they realize their error of judgment. Thus, education is the most crucial weapon for preventing young people from joining these conflicts and for helping them recognize their mistake and facilitate integrators, integration to, into society. Dear colleagues, Madib, for these reasons, we must all work together to fight up, Madib, all please. versions of extremism and intolerance, and we must do so with urgency. The repercussions of intolerance are too severe to disregard. It pulls apart families, communities, and even entire nations. It endangers a culture of dread and mistrust, as well as violence and conflict. To fight intolerance, we must first recognize it, denounce it, and stand up against it. This requires us to speak up when we observe acts of intolerance, whether they are directed at us or others, whether by arms of the state or individuals. It also involves educating ourselves and others about various cultures, faiths, and traditions, and most importantly, public expectations. Yes, we are following the right direction by acknowledging intolerance and embracing the team, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies.
fighting intolerance. For this, I offer my profound gratitude to you all and the Interparliamentary Union by adopting this theme in the general debate. We are demonstrating our commitment to fight intolerance through dialogue and engagement between diverse groups. Esteemed members, as important element in this fight, we, have, we must accept it, ensuring that rules and procedures are inclusive and do not discriminate against any group in particular. This encompasses education, employment, housing, and health care policy. In conclusion, I would say that fighting intolerance must be a continual endeavor, and we must all be devoted to. We must work together to establish a world where intolerance does not exist and where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. By standing up against intolerance, we can build a brighter future for ourselves and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Maldives. We, no we now call upon Botswana, and next will be Niger. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Madam Chair, distinguished speakers, presiding officers, leaders of delegations, and honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, may the peace, mercy, and blessings be upon all of you. Botswana is once again honored to join world parliaments for the 146th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union. The Honorable Speaker Skelemani conveys his best wishes for a successful meeting. He would have wanted to be with you here today, but could not. The theme for the 146th Assembly talks to promoting peaceful coexistence, building inclusive societies, and fighting intolerance. Given the state of the world today, this is a very appropriate time and setting for parliaments of the world to take stock of the state of democracy and our contribution towards building better inclusive societies. We have an, op we have an opportunity at this meeting to not only share experiences as a global community, but to also identify those factors underlying intolerance and division, locally and globally. Through our discussions, my hope is that we would galvanize and catalyze action for sustainable and comprehension approaches to promoting inclusion and supporting peaceful coexistence in order to build resilient and cohesive societies. Parliament of Botswana continues to strengthen its laws to protect mainstream and empower historically marginalized groups. A new Ministry of Entrepreneurship was established last year, specifically to take out over responsibilities towards entrepreneurship development, gender and youth empowerment through the gender business and finance mechanisms and youth development fund, amongst others. To further reduce economic inequalities and promote fair economic participation, Parliament also passed a new law on citizen economic inclusion, which seeks to mainstream, among, amongst others, historically marginalized groups such as youth, women, and rural settlements into economic activity. This law is further supported by the newly passed laws on public procurement and the amended public finance management law to protect various disadvantaged demographic sectors. To ensure that no one is left behind, and in line with our National Vision 2036, Parliament continues to prioritize funding for ICT development and rollout in order to provide connectivity and access, access to services to all villages through the village connectivity and smart Botswana ICT programs. This has been public institutions being connected to the in internet and government services available online, while all learning institutions have been provided with ICT gadgets to support e-learning. As a person of peace and ardent guardians of the rule of law, Botswana embraces and promotes all faiths 
and religions for a peaceful coexistence. Other laws are also under review, which include strengthening laws to cap gender-based violence, promoting land ownership, and bestowing equal land rights for married persons. To further promote inclusion as well as social and economic rights, the teaching of mother tongue in primary schools will also commence in the financial year 2023-2024 with budget appropriation from Parliament. Parliament of Botswana continues to invest significantly on education and health with a view to providing universal health access to all, but especially safeguarding and promoting sexual and reproductive health rights and access to education for all. Programs such as Treat All, Prevention of Mother-to-Child Transmission, Youth-Friendly Services, and Comprehensive Sexuality Education continue to receive funding from Parliament. Parliament of Botswana holds meaningful public engagement at the center of activities and work. Public consultations remain the cornerstone and hallmark of economic and political development in Botswana. In that regard, Parliament has strengthened its public engagement through the rollout of Botswana Speaks program, an initiative to connect constituents with the elected representative of policy dialogue and decision making. The program is funded by Parliament and uses ICT to connect constituents with the work of Parliament and the members of Parliament. Distinguished delegates, the main goals of tolerance is unity and harmony in diversity. Coexistence requires all diverse communities to enhance togetherness, respecting each other, to work together in maintaining harmony of living, preventing Botswana, communal conflict and resolving up conflict together. It is through the budget that we pass and appropriate that the marginalized can be empowered, the rising economic inequalities reduced, and make young people and women reach their full potential. It is also through our oversight role that we can ensure the rule of law, the protection and enjoyment of human rights and, in, and justice for all. If we are to indeed contribute towards the sustainable development agenda, our impact as parliaments must be on, must be on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, all this parliament, all these developments are but small steps towards contributing to the global efforts in ensuring that no one is left behind and harnessing the power of diversity to foster peace and drive development. However, attaining world peace and strengthening of democracy requires our collective efforts as representative institutions. These efforts must ensure the protection I'm of human rights, empowerment of minorities, and upholding of democratic principles that promote the rule of law, good governance, tolerance, including political tolerance, and peaceful coincidence. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Botswana. And I call upon Niger, followed by Denmark. Madame la Présidente, chers collègues parlementaires, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais rendre grâce à Dieu qui nous a permis de nous retrouver ici ce jour à Manama, au Royaume de Bahreïn, dans cette imposante salle pour communier ce 13 mars 2023. Permettez-moi de joindre ma voix à celle de mes illustres prédécesseurs pour remercier très aimablement le gouvernement et le peuple bahreïn pour l'accueil amical qu'ils nous ont réservé et leur exprimé les fraternelles salutations du peuple frère de la République du Niger et de ses autorités. Madame la Présidente, chers collègues parlementaires, nos présentes rencontres sont consacrées véritablement à la recherche de réponses pertinentes et adaptées à certains constats d'une cruciale gravité. En effet, le thème du débat général de nos présentes assises porte sur promouvoir la coexistence pacifique et les sociétés inclusives, combattre l'intolérance. Il est pertinent et actuel. Il nous interpelle à plus d'un titre. Madame la Présidente, c'est alarmant et inquiétant 
De nombreux indicateurs montrent que la coexistence pacifique et l'inclusion reculent partout dans le monde, alors que l'intolérance et la discrimination augmentent. Nous sommes donc invités, là, à répondre à des préoccupations et à des inquiétudes vitales, parce que le dysfonctionnement de notre monde dit « moderne » à travers des institutions particulièrement politiques, par exemple les parlements et autres institutions socioculturelles, est une équation très alarmante pour la quasi-totalité de nos démocraties. Il y a raison de s'interroger sur ce malaise dans la civilisation humaine. Ce malaise s'exprime au quotidien ici et là, à travers des crises multiformes de nos modes de gouvernance politique et de nos modèles économiques d'exploitation, de transformation et de distribution de richesses. Est-ce là la voie de la promotion de la coexistence pacifique et de société inclusive Vivre ensemble et en paix. Voilà la préoccupation première de toute communauté humaine dans un esprit de tolérance et de solidarité. La société inclusive ne peut et ne doit se laisser ou laisser aucun de ses membres à l'écart. Tout le monde a le droit et le devoir de participer pleinement à sa gestion. Aujourd'hui, nos sociétés ne s'expliquent pas les meurtres et les assassinats terroristes. Nous avons des guerres absurdes qui enflamment les régions entières, voire des continents. Madame la Présidente, au Sahel par exemple, dans la zone des trois frontières, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, nous avons une situation des plus préoccupantes, imposée par une horde terroriste qui tue les populations innocentes, les violentes, pille leurs biens, vole le bétail, incendie les greniers, détruit leurs marchés, saccage leurs écoles et leurs dispensaires et les pousse à un exode massif. Devant le mutisme coupable, voire la complicité avérée de certains partenaires, les populations victimes des exactions terroristes prônent la rupture avec un monde politique qui s'acharnerait à les déshumaniser et dénoncent des rapports de vassalisation encore entretenus par un monde politique suranné. Ni les hommes politiques, ni les institutions politiques et certaines organisations internationales n'échappent à la critique. Le citoyen partout tend à tout remettre en cause, la perte de confiance atteint tous les secteurs de la vie. L'intolérance et l'exclusion s'amplifient et entraînent des populations à organiser de violentes manifestations. Il y a une forme de pollution des esprits née des choix politiques dans nos pays. Nous avons un multipartisme débridé qui favorise l'hostilité et isole la solidarité. A telle enseigne qu'il y a un grand fossé qui sépare une minorité qui s'arroge tous les avantages et l'écrasante majorité des pauvres et des laissés pour compte. Au Parlement, où nous devons jouer un rôle politique de premier plan, un rôle essentiel en tant qu'élus et représentants du peuple, nous sommes et demeurons timorés. Hélas, il faut que nous revenions au bon vieux, au bon vieux, euh, en restant plus près des populations que des autres. Il est temps que les parlementaires soient plus à l'écoute de chaque citoyen, de chaque groupe, de, de chaque couche de la société et qu'il s'arroge l'initiative entière des programmes et des projets de développement qu'il aurait identifiés de concert avec les populations, avec les communautés à la base. Toutes les grandes décisions relatives à la vie du peuple euh, avant se prenaient au cours des grandes rencontres auxquelles participaient tous les groupes d'âge. Au regard de ce qui précède, pour combattre l'intolérance à travers la promotion de la coexistence pacifique et les sociétés inclusives, nous proposons sans être exhaustifs les recommandations ci-après. Une meilleure prise en compte des besoins spécifiques et des aspirations légitimes des jeunes et des femmes dans des politiques publiques et des stratégies de développement, la réduction significative des contre-valeurs comme la corruption et le favoritisme qui sapent la confiance de la l'amélioration de l'accès équitable à la justice, et, et c'est sur cet appel, l'appel à tout le monde de venir participer activement et concrètement et à la, à, à la résolu, résolution des drames qui frappent le Sahel. Et c'est sur cet appel que je termine mon propos en vous remerciant de votre aimable attention. Voilà. Thank you, uh, Niger. I now call upon Denmark, followed by Hungary. But uh, just a reminder to the honorable speakers that please let's stick to time.
Mrs. Uh, President, uh, dear colleague, the theme of uh, this general debate is promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies fighting intolerance. This is a task and this is a challenge facing not only some of us, it concerns us all. I'm from a country within which might not have the same amount of challenges as many other countries. Coming from a prosperous, well-functioning, and quite peaceful country, but that's not a guarantee against intolerance. On the, con on the contrary, maybe. An essential part of Danish democracy is freedom of speech. We will not and we cannot compromise on that. But exactly because of that, it is crucial that we raise our voices in the public debate when we are faced with racism and lack of respect for people of other beliefs. We have an enduring obligation to fight intolerance. The present debate is a firm reminder that the need to deal with this challenge. We have, for sure, our homework to do in Denmark. But we are not the only ones. And at this point, I would address our host here in Bahrain on behalf of the Danish delegation. First, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for hosting this assembly and for your great hospitality. We appreciate that. But we also have a strong desire. Since 2011, for 12 years, a Danish citizen of a Bahraini origin named Abdul Hadib Al Kawaya has been imprisoned here in Bahrain, some few kilometers away from the conference center. He's not a violent criminal. No, he's a human right defender and a prisoner of consciousness. For his whole life, he has fought with peaceful means for democracy and human rights. That was also the reason that he went uh, back in uh, 1991, more than 30 years ago, got political asylum in Denmark, and after some years, became a Danish citizen. Our description of al Kawai as a human rights defender is not only our own, not only supported by human rights organization, it is also backed by the United Nations, which has described his arrest and imprisonment as arbitrary. This position has been supported by the European Union and most recently in the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Therefore, we call on the Bahraini authorities free al Kawaya. As a consequence of ill treatment and torture when he was arrested and during the long imprisonment for more than 12 years, his condition is now very, very bad. And therefore, we have asked, the Danish delegation have asked the Bahrainian authorities for permission to visit our fellow Danish citizen here for humanitarian reasons during our stay in Bahrain. Unfortunately, we have got no reply despite several requests. That is regrettable, but it's never too late. 12 years must be enough. Releasing al Kawaya would be a firm symbol of good faith, which we would, and I hope everybody else would appreciate. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Denmark. I now call upon Hungary, followed by Estonia.
Dear Madam President, my dear peer MPs, the concept note summarizing the topic of the general debate contains the following statements. The world is becoming a more divided and less tolerant and peaceful place. There are numerous indicators that peaceful coexistence and inclusion worldwide are in decline and that intolerance and discrimination are on the rise. These statements, in my view, prove that we are doing something very wrong. There are international policies in place and in many cases, resolutions and decisions arising from such, from such policies that seek to eliminate or reduce intolerance manifesting itself for any reason. It is also true that international efforts are largely also reflected in national legislation. Yet, we are not succeeding. In fact, numbers and surveys show that we are actually failing. We must ask ourselves the question, why is the quality of human coexistence deteriorating? Why do we tolerate each other less and less? Looking at the foundation, we cannot but conclude that there is increasing competition between groups and members of mankind for natural resources for the basics of life and for energy, in other words, for our life-giving planet Earth. In February, together with many of my peer MPs present today, I participated in the UN hearing in New York focused on water. Chaba Kuroshi, president of the UN General Assembly, stressed that we are not doing very well at all with the achievement of sustainable development goals. The midterm progress review on SDGs will take place in September this year. However, the signs are worrying. In the meantime, the human population is growing, the impacts of climate change and overconsumption are increasing in severity, and there is no more intense com and there is more intense competition among us. The frustration arising from competition leads to anxiety, tension, intolerance, scapegoating, and selfishness. In my view, it follows that we can only halt and address the intolerance crisis if we can make progress towards the achievement of SDGs. The frustration arising from increasing competition is being felt at individual, community, national, and international levels. Unfortunately, we live in an uncertain world. Mankind has been shocked by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we must also remember that there are currently 28 wars raging across the globe, which are practically live-streamed to our homes. Death has become part of our daily lives. Mankind is permitted by fear and anxiety. And fear is, good, is, good, not, is not a good advisor, not even for nations or countries. We often experience the confusion of fundamental concepts, while complementary ideas are por portrayed to be in opposition with each other. Freedom is often confused with immorality, dis disguised as freedom. Rights are often placed above obligation if self-interest dictates so. And double standards also often prevail, as it is always easier to criticize someone else than to exercise self-criticism. Is there a solution? I believe there is. As in so many other areas, it requires a change of attitude. When it comes to the foundations, we must make every effort to effectively achieve the sustainable development goals. As we stressed, at the time of their adoption, each of us must do our utmost in our own individual fields and rely on the retention power of the international community with the same dedication. As for the way forward, and the imbalance that has arisen, we must establish a dialogue 
based on mutual respect. We must not just listen to, but also hear each other and aim for joint success. Dialogue is one of the most cherished core values of the interparliamentary Consider union. winding up um, we must Estonia. on this fundamental value and return to it when required. Dear Madam President, my dear peer MPs, thank you for your kind attention and I wish you many blessings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hungary. And I will now call upon Estonia, followed by Mali. Madam Chair, dear colleagues, honorable hosts, there are more than 8 billion people living on the earth. And even with such a large number, there are no two people who would be exactly alike in their thoughts, feelings, appearance, skills, or otherwise. We are all different. But these uh, differences have been written into the very code of humanity and human person. Moreover, this has immense value because let us think for a moment what it would be like if we were all alike. Such a world would be very boring. Differences are enriching. Precisely because of this, the acceptance of differences should indeed be a natural part of everyday life and not the constraint or inevitability. Be it skin color, sex, language, appearance, or religious beliefs. Empathy and tolerance are important keywords. From Estonia's and European perspective, the greatest challenge for the world is to protect peace and democratic values and the sovereignty of the countries to resolve differences peacefully, not by using military power, cannons, or tanks. The arms race is taking place at the expense of all of us. This means less money for education, less money for culture, less money for social affairs. Unfortunately, there are countries who like to speak the language of bombs and cannons, or even more brutally, for them, human life is just a tool, a thing they use to achieve their superpower ambitions. I am speaking of Russia and its war of aggression in Ukraine. This war started already in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea. The new phase of this war that started on the 24th of February 2022 has been going on for over a year now. And sadly, then there is nowhere to be seen. The countries of the world will have to show more resolve here because an aggressor's victory in a war inspires other authoritarian regimes to use the same method as well. Tolerating the war may mean that it will reach the home yards of all of us. I acknowledge the member states of the Interparliamentary Union who at the last General Assembly in Rwanda adopted with a great majority a resolution condemning Russia's aggression. However, without underestimating in the least the resolute condemnation of Russia's aggression in Ukraine by every country, be they big or small, I would like to appeal to China's uh, concerns who holds great sway and therefore has a chance to take a big step towards ending this war. Once Russia understands that it can no longer count on China's tacit support together with its implications, this may indeed become the factor that will bring Russia back to earth. Dear colleagues, we are living in very turbulent times. The values underpinning the rules-based world order are at stake. Freedom, democracy, human rights, and equality. This is war for the Russian regime against democracy. I am convinced that when we act together, we are stronger and we will be able to protect a democratic and inclusive future. 
There's a no alternative to democracy if we want peace. Dear colleagues, to conclude with a very positive message, it looks like the COVID-19 will be history very soon. We are lucky ones to meet in person here in Bahrain. It makes a great sense to meet the people in person. Shukran to the National Assembly of Bahrain and many thanks to the IPU for organizing this excellent uh, assembly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Hungary, uh, Estonia. We now call upon Mali. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Monsieur le Président de l'Union interparlementaire, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général de l'Union interparlementaire, Monsieur le Président du représentant du Bahreïn, Mesdames et Messieurs les Présidents des Parlements, permettez-moi, au nom des plus hautes autorités de la République du Mali, Son Excellence le Colonel Assimi Goïta, Président de la transition au chef de l'État, au nom de l'honorable colonel Malik Djaou, président du Conseil national de transition que je représente à cette plateforme parlementaire mondiale de plus de 170 pays et 1 700 participants et représentés par cette plateforme. Grâce à Allah, le Tout-Puissant, miséricordieux, qui a permis la tenue de la présente session de la 146e Assemblée de l'Union interparlementaire ici à Manama, au Bahreïn. À tous les participants, je transmets les cordiales et chaleureuses salutations du peuple malien et de son gouvernement à l'ensemble des délégations de Parlement et experts qui ont effectué le déplacement à Manama. Honorables participants et parlementaires du monde, la présente session se tient à point nommé car notre planète traverse aujourd'hui une période particulièrement agitée qui met à mal la coexistence pacifique et la réalisation des sociétés inclusives et les valeurs d'y vivre ensemble. Monsieur le Président, chers invités, le thème du débat général de cette Assemblée promouvoir la coexistence pacifique et les sociétés inclusives, combattre l'intolérance, reflète aujourd'hui la préoccupation de la grande majorité des citoyens du monde et des sociétés démocratiques. Ce débat général qui nous est proposé en tant que Parlement est assez évocateur et interpelle. Mon pays, le Mali, est malheureusement depuis une décennie le théâtre de cette intolérance dont les populations civiles payent le plus lourd tribut avec des déplacements massifs de population, la fermeture des classes, l'absence de structures sanitaires de base et des risques d'insécurité alimentaire avec les femmes et les enfants comme principales victimes. C'est pourquoi nous avons pris notre responsabilité dans le choix de nos partenaires, le respect de notre pays et de notre peuple. Notre chef de l'État a donc donné des moyens à l'armée qui monte en puissance en combattant les terroristes jusque dans leur dernier retranchement. Mesdames et Messieurs, honorables participants, cette Assemblée se doit d'être une opportunité pour les pays sous-développés d'obtenir des investissements conséquents pour soutenir les programmes de développement prioritaires de pouvoir financer leur économie de manière à permettre à ces États de pouvoir faire face aux défis que sont la lutte contre la pauvreté, l'accès à la santé et à l'éducation, l'autosuffisance alimentaire et l'insécurité. En effet, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues parlementaires, les citoyens du monde entendent les, attendent des résultats Beaucoup de discours depuis plus de 100 ans, mais très peu de progrès. 
l'air est à l'action la, et au pragmatisme. Il faut agir et chaque minute compte pour de nombreuses populations défavorisées dans le monde. Pour cette raison, nous espérons que 746e Assemblée sortiront des résolutions courageuses pour combattre l'injustice. Les États riches doivent se faire face à leur devoir de responsabilité afin d'aider les pays en voie de développement à promouvoir la coexistence pacifique et les sociétés inclusives combattent l'intolérance pour l'amélioration des conditions de vie et des populations. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Mali. I now call upon the Republic of Korea, followed by Brazil. Jungyongan 우리는 성별, 연령, 지역, 성적 지향성 등 개인의 다양한 특성을 모두 등급화하고 평가하는 사회를 살아가고 있습니다. 특히 감염병과 전쟁, 기후 위기와 자연재해 등 인류를 위협하는 다양한 위기들을 사회의 양극화와 소통의 단절을 촉진하고 있습니다. 혐오와 차별의 언어는 온라인이라고 하는 익명의 공간 속에서 더욱 무섭게 확산하고 있습니다. 그러나 포용과 관용은 소외된 약자에 대한 배려의 차원을 넘어서서 우리 모두의 공동 번영을 위한 전제로 인식되어야 합니다. 존경하는 각국 대표단 여러분, 안타깝게도 차별과 배제, 비방과 혐오는 법과 제대로 일거에 해결할 수 있는 문제가 아닙니다. 하지만 그럼에도 차별 없는 사회, 포용적 사회를 만들기 위해 의회가 할수 있는 일이 분명히 있습니다. 저는 포용적 사회를 만들기 위한 의회의 역할을 두 가지 관점에서 말씀드립니다. 첫째, 차별을 방지하는 법과 제도를 강화하는 것. 둘째, 국회를 포용적 의견 결집의 장으로 만드는 것입니다. 먼저 의회는 입법기관으로서 차별을 방지하고 독식구조를 해소하는 법률을 제정할 의무가 있습니다. 평등 원칙을 확인하고 차별을 금지하는 법률의 존재는 많은 차별과 배제를 막아낼 수 있을 것입니다. 대한민국은 헌법에서 평등의 원칙을 천명하고 있습니다. 국민은 모든 법 앞에 평등하고 누구든지 성별, 종교 또는 사회적 신분에 의해서 생활의 모든 영역에서의 차별을 받지 않는다는 것이 그 내용입니다. 그리고 천부적 기본권으로서의 평등권을 보다 구체화하고 내실화하기 위해서 성별 및 장애를 이유로 한 차별을 금지하는 양성평등 기본법, 장애인 차별 금지법 등을 시행하고 있습니다. 나가서 차별 영역에 관한 사각지대를 최소화하고 복합적인 차별에 대응하기 위해 포괄적 차별 금지 법안을 마련하고자 합니다. 법안을 통해서 고용, 교육, 공공 서비스 제공 등 모든 영역에서 성별, 인종, 신체 조건, 사상 등을 이유로 한 정당한 이유 없는 모든 차별을 금지하려고 합니다. 사실 이 법안의 필요성은 아주 오래전부터 대두되어 왔음에도 아직도 우리는 사회적 정치적 합의를 이루어내지 못했습니다. 사회 일부에서 종교적, 정치적, 경제적 이유를 들어 법안의 제정을 반대하고 있기 때문입니다. 부끄럽습니다. 입법 논의가 도리어 다른 차별과 혐오로 번져나가는 일마저 있습니다. 이런 구조적 차별을 극복하고 포용 사회를 만들어가기 위해서 대한민국은 동법에 관한 각국의 경험과 사례를 경청하고 참고해서 다른 이웃들에 비해 늦어진 만큼 빠른 시일 내 차별 철폐를 위한 책임 있는 결론을 얻어낼 것을 여러분들 앞에 다짐합니다. 입법을 통한 차별의 규제와 더불어 의회는 의사의, 의사의 다양성 확보를 위해 정책 결정의 사각지대를 최소화하고 
포용적 정책 마련의 기반을 조성해야 합니다. 국민에게 열린 국회를 조성하고 의견 결집의 기회를 확대함과 동시에 의석의 구성에 있어서도 다양성을 확보해야 합니다. 대한민국 국회는 국민의 의정 참여의 기회를 보장하고자 다양한 제도와 정책 기반을 마련하고 있습니다. 현재 국회는 방송과 온라인 미디어를 통해서 상임위원회 회의를 실시간으로 공개하고 있는데 나가서 정책 세미나 등 기타 의정 활동을 실시간으로 송출하기 위한 플랫폼도 마련하고 있습니다. 또한 청각 장애인에 대한 의정 정보 접근성을 제고하기 위해서 최신 AI 기술을 활용한 실시간 자막 시스템도 구축하고 있습니다. 국민의 다양한 입법 요구를 파악하고 논의하기 위해서 국회 동의 청원 제도를 도입하여 운영 중이기도 합니다. 또한 국회가 다양한 집단을 대표할 수 있도록 비례대표 제도를 취지에 맞게 활용하고 다양한 집단의 정치 참여 기회를 확보하고자 합니다. 존경하는 각국 대표단 여러분, 포용적 사회로 가기 위한 의회 간 연대도 필요할 것입니다. 국제의원연맹에 아, 국제의원연맹 등 국제협의체를 통한 회의와 워크숍, 세미나는 관용적 사회를 향한 각국 의회의 주의를 환기하는 데 중요한 계기가 될 것입니다. 각국의 의견을 합하여 공동선언문과 결의안을 채택하고 국제적 원칙을 구축할 필요도 있습니다. 차별과 배제 없는 포용적 번역만이 우리 사회의 질적 성장을 이루어낼 수 있다고 하는 점을 우리 모두 기억합시다. 그리고 포용적 사회를 이루어 나가는 것이 국민의 대변자로서 우리 앞에 놓여 있는 무거운 책임이라는 것도 다시 한번 생각합시다. 경청해 주셔서 감사합니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Republic of Korea. I now call upon Brazil, followed by Spain. Senhora, senhora presidente, senhores e senhoras congressistas de todos os parlamentos representados nesta Assembleia da União Interparlamentar, as nossas saudações. Cumprimento e parabenizo os dirigentes do Parlamento do Bahrein pela organização do evento. Senhoras e senhores, o tema que me traz à tribuna nesta ocasião é a promoção da coexistência pacífica entre os povos na busca por uma sociedade mais inclusiva. Mas esse ideal social a que todos aspiramos não poderá ser alcançado sem que os parlamentos do mundo discutam uma das questões mais urgentes do nosso tempo, o combate à intolerância. Não poderá jamais haver inclusão ou paz onde houver intolerância. É por essa razão que os debates que realizaremos ao longo desses dias de Assembleia se mostram tão necessários e urgentes. Com este pronunciamento, espero fazer uma pequena contribuição às discussões envolvendo este tema premente, de modo a que possamos construir uma sociedade cada vez mais pacífica e inclusiva para todos. Diante do duplo desafio, de promover a inclusão e de combater a intolerância, os parlamentos do mundo têm um papel ao mesmo tempo de destaque e de liderança. As sociedades democráticas investem a sua confiança em seus representantes eleitos, com a esperança de que esses parlamentares possam tomar as melhores decisões e conduzir toda a população rumo ao progresso e à prosperidade, mas sempre buscando a inclusão e a paz. No século XXI, não pode haver prosperidade verdadeira sem paz ou sem inclusão social. Nesse sentido, é dever do Poder Legislativo conduzir as discussões sobre a adoção de políticas inclusivas e de combate à intolerância. Apesar de já haver iniciativas nessa esfera em diversos países, inclusive no meu país, o Brasil, ainda estamos muito longe de alcançar o pleno potencial das contribuições que os legislativos nacionais podem dar à sociedade nesse campo. Em nosso país, por exemplo, 
a adoção de diretrizes para a contratação de pessoas ou de promoção do acesso igualitário aos serviços públicos, independentemente de raça, gênero, religião ou outras formas de discriminação, rendeu frutos muito positivos. Outra via de ação possível ao Poder Legislativo nessa questão é, sem dúvida, a capacidade que esse poder tem de fomentar, de apoiar iniciativas educacionais que promovam a tolerância e, a, e o respeito às diferenças. Essa estratégia inclui, certamente, a criação de programas escolares, de campanhas em mídias sociais e a realização de eventos que ajudem na conscientização sobre questões relacionadas à intolerância. A promoção da inclusão social passa necessariamente pela informação e pela educação. Não por acaso, professores e educadores devem ser aliados do Parlamento para a construção de programas que nos auxiliem nos combates desses objetivos. Senhoras e senhores, em um mundo cada vez mais conectado e virtualmente integrado, uma coexistência pacífica, inclusiva e plural entre os povos e as nações não é uma utopia, é uma necessidade. Os seres humanos estão mais próximos interagindo entre si, como jamais aconteceu na história da humanidade. Nesse contexto, não temos tempo a perder na construção de políticas que promovam uma convivência cada vez mais pacífica e tolerante em face das diferenças inerentes à multiplicidade de habitantes deste planeta. Ciente dessa urgência e dessa responsabilidade perante os cidadãos do Brasil e do mundo, tenho o orgulho de poder participar desta Assembleia Interparlamentar. As respostas que encontraremos nesses debates pautarão os parlamentos de todo o mundo e pavimentarão os caminhos que nos conduzirão ao futuro e à sociedade que sonhamos. Agradeço mais uma vez o convite para fazer parte dessas discussões. Nessa oportunidade, quero reiterar o meu compromisso de levar de volta ao meu país todo o conhecimento e os avanços alcançados desses cinco dias de Assembleia. Estou certo de que uma coexistência pacífica em uma sociedade inclusiva é possível, mas somente se continuarmos nos esforçando cada vez mais para combater a intolerância. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, uh, Brazil. I now call upon Spain, followed by Gambia. Querida Presidenta, queridos amigos de la UIP, gracias Bahrein por su hospitalidad y su magnífica organización. Lamentablemente, nuestro planeta cada día avanza preocupantemente hacia un mundo más dividido, más, menos tolerante y menos pacífico. La coexistencia pacífica y la inclusión está sufriendo, desgraciadamente, un declive mientras aumenta la intolerancia y la discriminación. Observamos cada día que, de forma permanente, nuevos ejemplos de manifestaciones violentas aumentan la polarización y la ruptura de la cohesión social. Los discursos de odio, especialmente a través de las redes, también aumentan cada día, lo que a su vez provoca una disminución en todo el mundo de la confianza en los gobiernos y en los medios de comunicación, el deterioro de la libertad religiosa y el aumento de la discriminación religiosa, el racismo y la xenofobia. Estas muestras de exclusión e intolerancia están muy conectadas con las tendencias globales de aumento de las desigualdades económicas y sociales, lo que sin duda deteriora la confianza en la democracia, en los derechos humanos, recorta derechos, aumenta las amenazas para la paz y la seguridad a través del extremismo violento, la diseminación o la desinformación. Y, por lo tanto, socava también los principios de la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. Queridos amigos, los parlamentos, como representantes de la soberanía nacional, como representantes de la gente, de sus preocupaciones, de sus problemas, de sus deseos, pero también de sus necesidades, juega un papel muy importante. 
en la eh, promoción de la cohesión y de la inclusión. En el ámbito internacional existen cinco principios de coexistencia pacífica como forma de convivencia entre naciones y también como garantía de paz y de desarrollo soberano de cada nación. El primero es el respeto a la soberanía e integridad territorial de cada país. El segundo es la no agresión. El tercero es la no injerencia en los asuntos internos de otros países. El cuarto es la igualdad en las relaciones y el quinto es el beneficio mutuo. Pues bien, a pesar de que estos principios nacieron con la voluntad de que ninguna nación pudiera imponer su hegemonía ni ingerir en los asuntos de gobierno de otra nación y de que siguen teniendo plena vigencia como doctrina para asegurar la paz entre las naciones, vemos cómo en la actualidad fragantes incumplimientos de estos principios se están produciendo en muchos lugares del mundo y singular y reciente y desgraciadamente en la invasión de Ucrania. Ojalá, ojalá que pronto volvamos a un escenario de paz basado en el derecho internacional, en el de respeto a la ley y a los derechos humanos. Queridos amigos, la diversidad es sin duda una fuente de talento para la sociedad. En una sociedad inclusiva, la diversidad debe ser percibida como una oportunidad y nunca como una amenaza. La igualdad, la equidad deben prevalecer sobre las diferencias y las personas más vulnerables, las que tienen un mayor riesgo de exclusión social, deben recibir protección y amparo. Por otro lado, la intolerancia en el marco es el marco, el marco mental, la raíz donde eh, brotan las actitudes sociales, políticas, económicas o culturales y también las conductas o comportamientos que perjudican a grupos, que perjudican a personas dificultando las relaciones humanas que vulneran los derechos del prójimo y que invitan a ser violados o anegados y a menudo está ligada a manifestaciones de odio racial, nacional, sexual, étnico, religioso o cualquier otra forma de comportamiento. La intolerancia se fundamenta en el prejuicio basado en una generalización defectuosa e inflexible, es decir, en un estereotipo, y consagra como valor superior no a la persona con sus propias y diversas identidades, sino a la propia identidad, a la identidad propia enfrentada a la de los demás. De ella emanan el racismo, la xenofobia, el antisemitismo, la homofobia, el integrismo fundamentalista, etc. La intolerancia es un gran desafío, queridos amigos, para la humanidad, que fue profundamente abordada en la Declaración de Principios sobre la Tolerancia de Naciones Unidas en París en noviembre del 95, que declaró cada 16 de noviembre el Día Mundial de la Intolerancia, o la Conferencia Mundial de 2001 en Durban, o la resolución de la Asamblea General de la ONU sobre, precisamente, la aplicación general de los resultados de esta conferencia en mayo de 2002. Todo ello nos recuerda que este principio ético es una necesidad política y jurídica para la eh, convivencia pacífica y para reflexionar que en su ausencia, sin tolerancia, eh, con el terrorismo, la xenofobia, el racismo y la violencia pueden tener como germen y caldo de cultivo para conflictos que aquejan a nuestra humanidad. Termino, señorías, diciendo que desde España hacemos un llamamiento a todos los miembros de la UIP, a todos los parlamentarios del mundo, precisamente para que trabajemos para garantizar la integración y a través de servicios y bienes públicos para todos, contrarrestar Spain cualquier manifestación de carácter Spain. académico, político, cotidiano, que invite la intolerancia o la discriminación, salvaguardando la personalidad y la dignidad de cada persona. Y, desde luego, impedir que gane el egoísmo o la insolidaridad y a trabajar, en definitiva, hasta lograr aparcar la xenofobia, el racismo y la intolerancia de la faz de la tierra. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Thank you very much, Spain. I now call upon Gambia and they'll be followed by Ukraine. Your Excellency, Mr. President, this important conclave under the team promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies fighting intolerance is indeed timely and shows a clear manifestation of the prominence that IPU as one of the largest international parliamentary platforms continues to ascribe 
to in promoting democracy and world peace in the face of declining peace, intolerance, and discriminations around the world. Mr. President, whilst acknowledging the promulgation of universal accords, treaties, and conventions that promote and safeguard fundamental human rights, freedoms, and justice, it is essential for all of us as stakeholders in the broader ecosystems of democracy to foster inclusive societies where rights and liberties are upheld for a more cohesive democracy and peaceful coexistence among citizens of the world. I would like to remind ourselves as peoples of faith of one of the most common sayings of God enshrined in his holy books sent to mankind, and I quote, that he has created us into tribes and nations only for us to know each other, end of quote. This verse teaches tolerant and what is very fundamental is that our diversities in culture, race, color, language, ethnicity, religion, gender, or political affiliation should only serve as divergent in opinions and beliefs and should strengthen us to coexist in peace and harmony as humans. Meanwhile, for some of us as Muslims, we must always live to remember that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was accused to have propelled the first ever model of democracy in human history by promoting peaceful coexistence. Therefore, promoting inclusive societies to fighting intolerance, social and economic inequalities, and discrimination is an incumbent duty not only on us as politicians and parliamentarians, but on all citizens for a just and peaceful world, for it is the surest way of continuous and sustained development of our constituents globally. This is the only way forward if we really want to weather through successfully in today's world of hostilities, polarizations, and divergent interests. Mr. President, in today's globalized world characterized by conflicts and geopolitical interests, it has been a year since Russia invaded Ukraine and sparked a conflict that has generally affected all nations and countries directly or indirectly and affect, affected living conditions of people we represent. It has contributed to the rise and hike of prices of commodities and inflations of all economies worldwide while ordinary people suffer daily. Sadly, innocent civilians have been cruelly caught up in the conflict, with thousands of lives lost and millions displaced since February 24, 2022, and the actual numbers are likely to be much higher. Therefore, Mr. President, the only option worth promoting is to end the year-long war between Russia and Ukraine. Since the second half of 2021, there has been a sharp hike in energy prices in Europe and worldwide. The price of wealth has further risen because of the war, which has also led to concerns related to energy supply globally. Furthermore, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is likely to result in the isolation of the world's 11th largest economy and one of the biggest producers of grains, wheat, barley, corn, and cooking oil. The immediate global implications will be higher inflation lower growth and some disruption to financial markets as deeper sanctions take hold, while the longer-term fallout will be a further debilitation of the systems of globalized supply chains and integrated financial markets that has dominated the world economy since the Soviet Union collapse in 1991. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, while the war continues to cause devastations around the world, we must not forget to commend significant players like that of Turkey and the United Nations for brokering a deal last summer to allow Ukrainian grain to pass through the Black Sea. The leadership of Turkey must be specifically applauded for also mediating the negotiation of prisoner swap involving nearly 300 prisoners, a crucial step to saving lives and preventing further violation of human rights resulting from the war. Up till date, President Erdogan continues to maintain his role as an active channel of communication and a reliable mediator in the eyes of both parties without compromising the principle of international law on territorial integrity. My delegation and I owe this body, the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council, to take its responsibility and begin serious negotiation 
to bring the two countries together and engage in direct dialogue to ending this conflict immediately in the interest of international peace, justice, and tolerance. At the national, at the national front, the Gambia's constitution provides an entrenched bill of rights safeguarding people's liberties, fundamental human rights, freedom of association and beliefs that are necessary in a democratic society while recognizing our, dif our religious differences and traditional norms for an inclusive society where tolerance is guaranteed. Gambia time. Mr. President, mm. following the change of government in 2017, the Gambia continues to gain its standing in the international stage thanks to its tolerant and democratic leader who ensured and assured the protection of people's liberties and political pluralism and tension our democratization process. In conclusion, I urge the IPU as the sole global parliamentary network to continue to provide the necessary support to institutions of parliament in promoting tolerance and upholding inclusiveness through their organizations and working procedures. We should not rest on our laurels as we continue to advocate and, and preach peace of peace and deliberations in parliament and at our various platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gambia. I'll now call upon Ukraine. They'll be followed by Slovenia. Honorable IPU delegates, dear colleagues and friends, I'm sure we all agree that intolerance is discouraged that plagues our societies. However, in the last year, this issue has lost much of its actions for Ukraine. As Russia escalated its vow of aggression into a full-scale genocidal invasion, the Ukrainian nation has seen an unprecedented unification. Representatives of all nationalities, faiths, and background are fighting for freedom, democracy, and peace by joining Ukrainian defenses, delivering aid, helping displaced persons, etc. Our society has united against the utmost form of intolerance, genocide. Today we expect the same unification from the world. Just on 9 March, as most of us were hidden for Bahrain, Russia fired 81 missiles at Ukrainian civilian targets, killing six persons, striking energy facilities, including the Parisian nuclear station. Since our previous meeting in Kigali, Russia has launched more than 500 missiles on our land, and it's happening right now. To establish peace on our long-suffering land, we proposed President Zelensky peace formula. It consists of every simple steps from nuclear food security to sustainable peace. But first of all, Russian troops must be withdrawn from our land, and we must restore our internationally recognized border of 1991, including Crimea. Now let me ask the rhetorical question. Do we do enough to eliminate intolerance in our distinguished assembly? My answer and answer to our delegation is no. Just think of it. We invite to discuss peaceful coexisting representatives of the Russia parliament a parliament that almost unanimously voted to legitimize the aggression and annexion of Ukrainian territories with complete neglect for international law and UN Charter. Therefore, we must take action. I urge you to, to hold the Russian parliament accountable. We must suspend their membership until they stop the gross violation of international law and human rights. At the very least, we should be able to limit the right to vote and right to participate in debates until Russia stops its aggression. Among crucial topics of the peace formula of Zelensky in Russia's responsibility for their crimes already exceeding the numbers of 70,000. This must be achieved through the establishment of the Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression. It's the only way to prevent impunity and thus prevent future aggression all over the world. The criminals should also pay for their crimes, pay to rebuild thousands of hospitals, schools, universities, factories, even churches destroyed by their artillery shells and missiles attack. Therefore, I urge you to support the comprehensive compensation mechanism already endorsed by the UN General Assembly. To finish, I would like to underline that the Russian aggression is a challenge and a fought to every human on the planet. This is our common strategy, as we shall together put an end to it. In this respect, let me quote the English poet John Donne, lines with which Ernest Hemingway later titled his famous novel. 
and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ukraine. I now call upon Slovenia. They'll be followed by Cambodia. Thank you, Madam Chair, esteemed chairs and colleagues. Inclusive society and the elimination of all forms of inequalities are among of the goals which the IPU has been pursuing for years. I am therefore particularly pleased to see this topic take, taking center stage today's debate. The mere fact that it is included among the sustainable development goals, the achievement of which has gained momentum with the 2030 agenda adopted by the United Nations in 2015, proves that it is indeed a key development issue that, to my great pleasure, has also been put at the core of the IPO strategy, our key development documents. A major concern is that peaceful coexistence and including worldwide are in decline while intolerance and discrimination are rising in all spheres of society. We see growing polarization and criticism of administrative structures along with the decreased tolerance towards opposing views. Particularly worrying is the rise of online hate speech which sows hatred and division under the guise of anonymity. We are witnessing a trend of growing social and economical inequalities and deteriorating trust in democracy and human rights standards. Likewise, we are affecting violent extremism and the spread of misinformation. All of this poses a risk of social cohesion and global peace. Slovenia acknowledges the importance of foresting inclusive societies and in creating equal opportunities for all and considers the issues to be highly relevant. In this respect, I would like to highlight the Protection Against Discrimination Act, the umbrella law in this area, and the Equal Opportunities of Women and Men Act. In addition, of the already adopted legis legislation, Slovenia is also drawing up a new resolution of the National Programme of Equal Opportunities for Women and Men, specifically a made, a made of overcoming stereotypes and sexism and ensuring that the gender equality perspective is included in all policies and measures. To effectively tackle discrimination in society, Slovenia has set up two autonomous state bodies, the Human Rights Ombudsman and the Advocate of the Principle of Equality. While we have certainly made progress over the past years, we cannot afford to be complacent with the current situation. What worries us, besides the facts that the changes were not as effective as we would have liked them to be. Is that all doubt? The risk of discrimination in Slovenia was among the lowest in the Europe Union, according to international figures from 2090. It still increased over 2017 to 2020. I would like to point out that greater transparency and accountability in decision-making and increased involvement of the interest public and civil society in decision-making make, progress at local as well as national and global levels are vital. Ladies and gentlemen, efforts targets at combating intolerance and promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive society require engagement from all of us. And as representatives of people, we parliamentarians uh, play a particularly important part therein. We are mirror of the, our society, while we also send, set an example uh, for it to follow. So if we succeed in making parliaments 
the any Romans with zero to tolerance for discrimination and if we consistently draw attention to condemn and deface such reprehensible practice, then the society will follow our lead. This will slowly bring a change in mindset and behavior, restore trust and politics and raise political and general culture. It is therefore incumbent upon us parliamentarians to foster and develop these values and fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Slovenia. I now call upon Cambodia and uh, La followed by Kenya. And uh, Kenya will be our last speaker this session. Good morning. Well, rather good afternoon. <laughs> Honorable Ahmed bin Salman Amu Salam, Speaker of the Council of Representatives of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Honorable the President of the IPU, His Excellency the Secretary General of the IPU. Honorable Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it is a great honor and a great pleasure for me to attend the 146th Inter-Parliamentary Union Assembly in this beautiful city of Manama, Kingdom of Bahrain. On behalf of the parliamentary delegation of the Kingdom of Cambodia, I would like to congratulate Honorable Ahmed bin Salman Abu Salam, Speaker of the Council of Representatives of the Kingdom of Bahrain, for being elected as President of the 146th Assembly. As chairperson of the Senate Commission on Human Rights Complaint Reception and Investigation, I strongly support this assembly for choosing theme, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive society, fighting intolerance for, fighting for the general debate. This theme is really relevant to the world's recent development. We are changing rapidly, complicatedly, dangerously, and unpredictably. More importantly, the debate on the theme would reflect our attention toward the deterioration of peace, freedom, and justice in the face of increasing intolerant polarization and discrimination. Honorable Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, peaceful coexistence is not just a matter of avoiding conflict, but creating an environment where everyone can live together in peace and harmony. That is to create a society where everyone is welcome and accepted, regardless of their differences, and also be given the same opportunity. Cambodia has been through foreign and civil war, genocidal regime, and serious national division. Cambodians understand very well the indispensable necessity of national reconciliation peace, coexistence, and inclusive society. After the fall of the genocidal Khmer Rouge, the killing field regime in 1979, the rights of the freedom of all individuals have been restored as enshrined in our constitution with an attempt to guarantee and further promote human rights, the royal government and the parliament of Cambodia have established national institutional mechanisms such as the Cambodian human rights of the parliament. Cambodia is also a home to many national and international organizations working in the field of human rights. And separate and according with the Paris Agreement principle, the country are in the process of creating the National Human Rights Committee. Cambodia has ratified a session to eight out of nine international human rights treaty, making this country an outstanding one in the region in the name of a party of international human rights treaty, and has participated in a universal periodical review and involved in the periodical review and other international human rights treaty institution. Since 1993, Cambodia has been the only country in ASEAN to welcome the presence of special rapporteur of the Office of High Commissioner 
of human rights of the United Nations in order to monitor the human rights situation in Cambodia and mandate the Special Rapporteur and the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in Cambodia and has extended until present day. In the meantime, Cambodia actively joined the United Nations in deploying its peacekeeping mission, mine and unexploded ordinance, clearing force to many countries, Sudan, South Sudan, Chad, Lebanon, Syria, Mali, Central Af Re African Republic, Cyprus, and Yemen. Recently, in collaboration with Japan, Cambodia provides Ukrainian, the minor, and humanitarian mine clearance training. The Mine Free Cambodia project by 2025 has been introduced late last year to provide safe ground and creating smile for citizens. Cambodia has opened widely free religious belief, although Cambodian constitution, constitution stipulates that the Buddhism is the state religion. Cambodian people can freely choose any religion to be worshipped. Religion harmony in Cambodia could be clearly seen through the absence of religious conflict. In Cambodia, implemented the national social policy in 2016 to 2025 to support the poor and the vulnerable family in order to restore dignity and maintain the living balance. Cambodia promote the right to life, the right to, uh, the right to education and social economy, the cultural rights, and the right to access to health care. These could be seen clearly through the government policy measuring intervention and endeavor to combat COVID-19, the effective Cambodia management of risk of COVID-19 allow Cambodia to be able to reopen the country, speedily restore living, and ensure that the fundamental all citizens. With effort controlling COVID, Cambodia considered us the number one in fighting the COVID-19. In closing, on behalf of the delegation of the Kingdom of Cambodia, I hope that all ideas and opinion expressed in the 146 IPU Assembly General Debate would maintain, contribute to create a harmony, peaceful, coexistent, tolerant, just equitable and inclusive society where our children, our grandchildren can proudly live in peace and development. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Cambodia. I now call upon our last speaker this session from Kenya. Uh, honorable Chair, Honorable Speakers, and Dance of Delegations, Honorable Delegates, Invited Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the King, the Speakers, and the people of Bahrain for the gracious hospitality that has been extended to the Delegates and the excellent preparations that have been made to make this event a success. Honorable delegates, I wish to say that promoting peace and inclusive societies is essential to fight intolerance because intolerance can lead to discrimination, exclusion, and even violence. When people are intolerant, they often view others who are different from them as inferior, which can lead to conflict and a lack of social cohesion. By promoting peace, we encourage people to respect each other's differences and work to, together to find common ground. Inclusive societies are also important because they ensure that everyone has a voice and is included in the decision-making process. This helps to promote a sense of belonging and reduces feelings of exclusion and marginalization, which can contribute to intolerance. Honorable delegates, Kenya is a diverse multi-ethnic country with various cultures, languages, and religions. Thus, Kenya still experiences social, economic, and political differences, which in turn have in the past led to conflicts and marginalization of certain communities and groups of people, despite their constitutional and statutory provisions 
which seek to promote equality, peace, and inclusive development in the country. Honorable delegates, one significant way through which Kenya has sought to promote peaceful existence and inclusion is by overhauling its governance system through an evolved system of government. This has ensured decentralization of power and resources, equitable distribution of national revenue, and increased public participation in decision making, thus reducing the causes of conflict, which have historically given rise to inequalities and the discrimination of some communities. Uh, honorable delegates, the Constitution of Kenya has clear provisions on inclusivity, which provide for equ equality, non discrimination, promotion of human rights, and respect for the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental freedoms. Uh, honorable Chair, additionally, various peace building efforts have been implemented to address the root causes of conflict and promote reconciliation and peaceful coexistence. These interventions include the establishment of the National Agenda and Equality Commission, whose functions include promoting equality and freedom from discrimination and mainstreaming issues of gender, persons with disabilities, and other marginalized groups in the national development, including development of affirmative action policies. Number two, establishment of the National Cohesion and Integration Commission, whose purpose is to facilitate and promote equality of opportunities, good relations, harmony, and peaceful coexistence between persons of the different ethnic and racial communities of Kenya, and to advise the government on all aspects. Number three, formulation of national policy on peace building and conflict management, and the last one, establishment of the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission, TJRC, to address historical injustices. Honorable Chair and Delegates, the current representation in the Parliament of Kenya manifests that there is no discrimination. All spheres in the country are represented through the two ninth constituencies for the seven counties, for the seven special seats for women and nominated seats for youth, women, persons with disabilities, and other marginalized groups. In the, in the current parliament, we have 21 women senators, which represents that 1.3 percent, and 82 women members in the National Assembly, which represents 23.5 percent. In addition, we have 11 youth in the Senate and 45 youth in the National Assembly. Honorable Chair and Delegates, Parliaments can address the drivers of intolerance or promote inclusion and peaceful coexistence in the following ways. One is addressing socioeconomic factors that lead to equality, inequality and discrimination. Number two, promoting and protection of all forms of diversity. And number three, promoting better community relationships. Honorable Chair and Honorable Delegates, in conclusion, promoting peace and inclusive societies is essential in curbing intolerance. We must appreciate diversity among us as a good thing that turns variety of the flavor of life Consider winding and up existence, Kenya. and we must promote the positive elements of our diversity, even as we seek to foster unity by looking forward and humanity at our neighbors and fellow citizens. By working together to promote understanding, respect, and inclusion, we can create a more peaceful and just society where everyone is valued and respected. And lastly, I want to thank the President of the IPU and the Secretary General for their proper coordination of this assembly. And when I grow up, I would like to be a President of IPU. I thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Kenya. Honorable uh, colleagues, before we conclude the session for this morning's general debate, I would like to state that we have received two requests for right to reply. One is coming from Iran, and the other one is coming from Bahrain. I will give the floor to Iran. Uh, you speak from your chair, and it is two minutes. Iran.
Iran is is Iran in the in the house? Yes, you have the floor. Okay. Two minutes. Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I was taken aback by the false accusations of Iran by a person who introduced himself as a representative of the great nation of Yemen, but misconstrued of the reality on the ground. We are left with no choice but to advise the so-called delegation of Yemen to respect the dignity of their people, and instead of spewing false accusations in the face of internal issues, seek the roots of the disorder in the performance of their own officials. We very much regret that this individual called a majority of this honorable nation terrorists. The fact that peaceful coexistence can only truly be attained through internal means is clear to most, regardless of their expertise or the lack, of, or the lack thereof on the matter. Wasting time making up conspiracy theories instead of focusing on the real issues on the ground will only further contribute to the alienation of the majority of Yemeni people, making it impossible to live among them in peace, in peace and security. Unlike these so-called representatives, the Islamic Republic of Iran has always stressed the fact that the Yemeni crisis has no military solution and can only be solved internally through peaceful means such as political dialogue. Today, the UN representative in Yemeni affairs met with Iranian officials and they reiterated the importance of improving the overall conditions inside the country. Interestingly, the aforementioned individual indirectly admitted to Iran's undeniable power and influence in the region, and we would like to thank him for that. However, the Islamic Republic of Iran has only used and will always use its power and influence to support the oppressed and not to subjugate others. Furthermore, I must reiterate the fact that the only historically recognized name for the waters between Iran and Arabian Peninsula has always been the Persian Gulf. Therefore, any use of fabricated or incomplete names lacks credibility and legal and historical basis. Thank you. Thank you, Iran. I will now call upon Bahrain. Two minutes. شكرا سيد الرئيس سيرة الرئيسة أريد أن أتداخل بخصوص مداخلة الزملاء من الدنمارك أولا نرحب بالبرلمانيين الدنماركيين وكنا في الحقيقة كزملاء نتمنى لو أنهم طلبوا الاجتماع مع وفد البحرين للوقوف على حقائق الشخص الذي تحدثوا عنه في الجلسة وبدل من, 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 من توزيع بروشرات وأوراق في الاجتماعات والوقوف في الجلسة العامة كان لابد من عقد اجتماع ودي معنا لرد على أي استفسارات لديهم حول هذا الموضوع الشخص المعني هو شخص بحرين الجنسية ارتكب مخالفات عدة صدر بحقه أحكام و... لدى محاكم البحرين وهو استنفذ كل كل المحاكم وكل درجة التقاضي في البحرين وصدر عليه حكم بالسجن وكان من حق أيضا اللجنة أو من حق الأخوان أو الأخوان الأمريكيين أن يستفسروا عما أدعوه من إجراءات تعذيب بحق المسجون لأن كل كل الحقائق التي لدينا والتي معروفة في البحرين بأنه لم يتعرض لأي شكل من أشكال التعذيب هناك لجنتين خاصتين في البحرين اللجنة الأولى اللجنة العامة للتظلمات كان بإمكانه هو أو أهل أن يتظلموا في موضوع التعذيب واللجنة ولجنة التحقيق الخاصة في النيابة العامة كان ممكن أن تتحقق من الأمر لو كان فعلا هناك تعذيب لأصدرت تلك الجهات تقارير محايدة في هذا الشأن وكرر دعوتي للزملاء في الدنمارك إلى عقد اجتماع معنا للوقوف على, إج... على أي استفسارات لديهم شكرا Thank you Bahrain Honorable colleagues Thank you very much um, The debate will resume at 2.30 p.m. Thank you once again.
Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Mr. President of the IPU, Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly of Bahrain, Honorable Members of Assemblies, Director General of the IPU, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to start my speech by expressing my gratitude for the generosity of the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly of Bahrain for his warm hospitality. I'd, I, would like, I would also like to thank all those involved in making this even possible, from the high-ranking national and international officials behind the planning to the workers on the ground. Shukran jazila to you and them all. As an Islamic concept inspired by numerous verses of the Holy Quran, peaceful coexistence and tolerance is of great importance to us. The Islamic civilization is the result of tolerance and peaceful coexistence. It's widely accepted that it's better to build bridges than walls. While racial discrimination and xenophobia make it easy to create walls between nations, we can build bridges through dialogue. The Islamic Republic of Iran has, since its inception, incorporated the peaceful teachings of Islam in its policy using creative initiatives to strengthen multilateralism and develop peace and cooperation in international forums. We believe that the remedy for racism, xenophobia, violence, and hatred can be found in dialogue, tolerance, and democracy. Now, in order to understand the position of my country on tolerance and peaceful coexistence, one only needs to know two of the most famous quotes in Iran. One is by Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Some 1,400 years ago, he famously said, people, people are of two groups. They are either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. The other famous saying is a line of poetry by one of Iran's most popular poets of all times, Hafez, who famously had the, only, the Holy Quran memorized. We wrote peace in this life, he wrote peace in this life and the next can be summed up in a mere two concepts, compassion for friends and tolerance for the others. But unfortunately, the, this Iranian tolerance has seldom been returned in kind. During the First and Second World Wars, for instance, my country has chosen the most peaceful, peaceful position possible. It had declared neutrality. The result, however, was not so peaceful for Iranians because their country ended up being occupied by British and Soviet forces. I'm sure you agree that the problem with the lack of tolerance and peaceful coexistence in our world does not stem from a shortage of assemblies on the topic. Sharing an appreciation for peaceful coexistence and tolerance is only one step in this long and hard battle. A much bigger step is sacrifice. Like many sacrifices Iranians have made to overthrow a Western-backed monarch, def defend, their, uh, defend their country with empty hands, put up with sanctions on everything from technology to medicine, and facing the mar martyrdom of their scientists. It's only through sacrifice that any nation can become a force to reckon with, and as a result, be granted a share of peaceful coexistence. It's due to these sacrifices that today I stand before you as a representative of the great, great Iran, Iranian nation, despite a most recent American hybrid attempt to export it caused regime change. It's also thanks to these great sacrifices that Iran was able to have a decisive role in the defeat of Daesh or ISIS terrorists. Today, throughout the world, countless people owe their, owe their security to the sacrifices of the, of the lives of Iranian commanders, General Qasem Soleimani, who was martyred, martyred, martyred by the supporters of these terrorists. Which brings me to my final point. The Islamic Republic, from its very inception, 
has stood with oppressed nations such as the Palestinians affected by the, by the, in the illegal Israeli occupation. It's also due to this understanding that when the war ridden nation of Syria was recently hit with an, a major earthquake, it was the Islamic Republic of Iran and Muslim and Arab countries that rushed to the rescue when many others did not dare to extend helping, uh, a helping hand for the fear of American sanctions on the country. So I would like to wrap up my talk with an emphasis, emphasis on the on our position and our pledge. The Islamic Republic of Iran firmly stands with every nation's right to peaceful coexistence. We believe that this right must be and would have been readily granted to all nations had we lived in a perfect world. We stand by the pledge we made decades ago since the inception of the Islamic Republic and that is to be Mr. friends Speaker, of the oppressed and a voice for the voiceless. Therefore, we welcome mutual cooperation to help strengthen other nations so that they all can be demanded, can demand an equal share of power which can help prevent the monopoly of power by homogenic entities and facilitates peaceful coexistence. Thank you all. Next speaker from Pakistan, you may take the floor, please. Honorable President of Assembly, honorable fellow parliamentarians, assalamu alaikum, may peace be upon you all. Even Islamic greeting is all about wishing peace upon others. I just want to cement this notion before I begin, as Islam or Islamic world is very conveniently associated with intolerance or extremism through careful propaganda. In doing so, we are in fact shying away from real reason behind intolerance and extremism, which is global inequality and lack of education. I congratulate IPU leadership of Kingdom of Bahrain and all other stakeholders for successfully arranging 146 IPU assembly. Bahrain feels very homely, and I thank our gracious host for the hospitality extended to our delegation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware that humanity has at all times remained in conflict. This conflict has changed many shapes and forms over the course of human history. However, one thing has always remained common, Violence in conflict has always resulted in destruction and nothing more. History shows that conflicts almost always stem from political, social, cultural, or religious differences. Let us understand, once and for all, conflicts cannot and must not be solved by violence or use of military force. We must stand firmly and strongly against any form of aggression and violence. However, we must also be consistent in denouncing violence. Building upon reality of global inequality and discrimination, I put forth a couple of questions for you to answer yourselves. Does the world equally stand up for plight of Indian occupied Kashmir, Palestine, and all other illegitimate occupation of the past and present? Sadly, all the world likes to stand up for its political and economic inclinations and nothing more. Building humanity is quite far down on our list of global priorities where our decisions rarely account for the implications on others as long as they bring benefit to us. With such a mindset, we will never be able to address our collective challenges towards peaceful coexistence. Peace can in fact only be guaranteed through sincere dialogue and healthy democratic practices that rest upon ideals of equality, tolerance and justice for all without any geographical, racial or religious discrimination. Poverty, hunger, climate change, intolerance, extremism, and terrorism continue to afflict the world today. As I said, these challenges are primarily linked to geopolitical and geoeconomic goals, worsening the situation. Root cause of many global conflict is economic inequality, which results in poverty and hunger. Therefore, political leaders must recognize the danger posed by uneven resource distribution. Promoting interfaith harmony is crucial to addressing many of the world's problems. Members of parliaments and society, as a 
whole should take an active role in shaping opinions, building bridges through dialogue and promoting pluralism and understanding. Excellencies, healthcare, education, and basic rights are some of the most pressing issues that demand our immediate attention. Inequalities and denial of rights are the root cause of intolerance, leading to poor societal structure and lack of peace and prosperity. These issues are not limited to a single nation or region, but affect us all. As parliamentarians, it is our duty to address these challenges and work towards sustainable solutions. Firstly, state of healthcare in many parts of the world is alarming. Millions of people are denied access to basic healthcare facilities, resulting in unnecessary deaths and suffering. We need to prioritize healthcare as a fundamental right and work towards creating a world where everyone has access to affordable and quality health services. Secondly, education is a key driver of development and progress. It is the foundation on which we can build a better future for our children and generation to come. Yet millions of children around the world are denied access to education and are therefore robbed of their potential. We must prioritize education and work towards creating a world where every child has access to quality education. This requires a multi-pronged approach, including increased investment in education, teacher training, and innovative teaching methods. We must also address root causes of educational inequality, such as poverty and gender discrimination. Together, we must work towards creating a world where every child has opportunity to realize his full potential. Ladies and gentlemen, moving forward, notions of equality and basic rights for all human beings must be prioritized, even in every Every matter and decision without these two elements, peace can never be achieved anywhere in the world. It is time that our growing social, technological, and political progress should reflect as a widespread model of pluralism and not that of currently prevailing exclusionism. We can only overcome our challenges with sincere dialogue and action and not with malafide intention. If peaceful coexistence is to be achieved, if we can work towards equality without discrimination, only then we will move towards inclusive societies. These are unavoidable prerequisites. I hope and pray that we can all look beyond political and economic gains at expense of peace and prosperity of fellow being human beings. In the end, we must may, I say that we must make sure that all our actions do not lead us towards a dystopian future, and time to correct our course is now. Thank you, you all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next speaker will be from Philippines. I take the floor, please. Followed by Speaker of Japan. Mr. President, <clears throat> colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Philippine delegation, I would like to extend my warmest greetings on the successful convening of the 146th IPU Assembly. My first IPU was the 112th in 2005. In this increasingly interconnected world, even the pace and shape of our progress is influenced by different stakeholders. For this, we recognize such interdependence requires us to craft legislation that ensures no one is left behind, especially those belonging to the vulnerable sectors. In the Philippines, our parliamentary body endeavors to promote inclusivity through these measures on sustainable development and futures thinking. In 2019, I advocated for the creation of the first ever Committee on the Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation and Futures Thinking in the Philippine Senate. As a party to the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, the Philippines is committed to integrate the 17 SDGs into our national development plans and policies. The purpose of this committee is to track the progress of the Philippines in terms of achieving the various SDGs. It also looks at legislation with the intent of preparing for various futures and promoting a shift to futures thinking as a major policy reform. One of the major outputs of the committee was the, creation, was the committee report on the future of education in the Philippines where it examines the current situation, problems, and aspirations and gather the recommendations of experts and other stakeholders in order to secure the best possible future for education in the country. We also allocated funding for futures offices in the Department of Education, the Department of Health, and the Department of Science and Technology in our national budget. And then 
we provided funding for research on the futures of food systems and food security in public universities. Similarly, we funded for the futures of food production. On education and alternative learning, recognizing the importance of education to bring the country towards its most desirable future, the Philippine Parliament created the Second Congressional Commission on Education in 2022. And this representation co-chairs the Subcommittee on Early Childhood Education and Development and Basic Education. The Commission undertakes to make transformative, concrete, and targeted reforms in the education sector, which includes addressing social inequalities and ensuring inclusivity in education. We also have our Alternative Learning Systems Act for, to lessen out-of-school youths and provide them with basic education. This is in line with our Inclusive Education Act that ensures all schools shall have equitable access to early learners, to, to every learner with a disability, such that no learner shall be denied admission based on disability. On health, the Universal Health Care Act guarantees all Filipinos equitable access to quality and affordable health care goods and services. Over the years, we have made access to health care much more affordable, but there is still a lot of work to be done. Our sin tax reform laws of 2012 and 2020 ensure funds for universal health care by taxing harmful products, including alcohol beverages, tobacco products, and vapes. Our Cheaper Medicine Act provides for a market-based capping approach to the prices of drugs and medicines, allowing the Secretary of Health to set what we now call the Maximum Drug Retail Price Act. On women, we have our Magna Carta of Women that requires the allocation of 5% of the total budget of every agency for, for gender and development programs. We also have the 105 expanded, 105 day expanded maternity leave law, extending what was previously 60 days maternity leave for all public and private sectors. We also have the Solo Parents Welfare Act on children a loving and caring family for every abandoned, neglected, and orphaned child could soon become a reality. This is a statement I made last year when we passed the Domestic Administration Adoption and Alternative Child Care Act, which simplifies the country's domestic adoption system by making it administrative in nature and streamlining the process. We have many other laws protecting children, even during times of disaster. We have laws on ageism, promoting inclusive workplace um, to address these specific sectors. Dear colleagues, before I end, I would like to add that I've personally benefited from these assemblies. Like I said, I joined my first IPU in 2005. It was the 112th IPU held in Manila. Being among and learning from fellow parliamentarians, mostly women, gave me the opportunity to expand my knowledge and the confidence to discuss these topics and to debate them in my own Parliament. I'm a firm believer that women must hold positions in decision-making bodies to truly give voice to women and to achieve genuine gender partnership. Congratulations to everyone. May we continue to work together to reduce inequalities in this country. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be from Jaban. You may take the floor, please. Followed by... Speaker of Sweden. I am Shin Tarito, leader of the Japanese delegations. It was on the 11th of March, 12 years ago, that the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami wrought a massive human toll on Japan. We are grateful for the support we have received from around the world. I would like to remember the victims of the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria and to express my deepest 
condolences to all those affected. Japan intend through the combined effort of its public and private sectors to fully cooperate in assisting the disaster victims and in the recovery and reconstruction of the affected areas. The peace and inclusiveness of the society are being threatened as intolerance and discrimination spread. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has intensified the conflict and deepened divisions in the international community and jeopardized our peaceful coexistence. In addition, we see examples of serious human rights violations around the world. Many people are standing up to demand peace, freedom, and human rights. In order to create peaceful and inclusive society, it is critical that we share such universal values as freedom, democracy, and rule of law. Japan strongly condemns any violations of human rights. We will promote improvement in human rights conditions by working with international organizations and engaging in bilateral dialogue to understand the views of those parties concerned and offer ongoing cooperation. We will also provide countries around the world with assistance in human resource development, ensuring freedom of speech and building and further developing systems for running elections and providing justice. We will endeavor to take a leading role in creating an inclusive society in which people with diverse cultures and pluralistic values can coexist peacefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next is Mr. Speaker from Ms. Speaker from Sweden, followed by Speaker of Austria. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and dear members of Parliament. First, I would like to say thank you to the beautiful hosting country, Bahrain, for the warm welcoming and for organizing the 146th IPU Assembly. It is a great honor for me to speak before the Interparliamentary Assembly, where parliamentarians from all over the world are gathered. Parliament forms the very heart of democracy, where the people's representatives together form the highest decision-making power, which also has the role of examining the work of the government. Sweden recently celebrated the great breakthrough of democracy 100 years ago when universal and equal suffrage was introduced and the first five female members took their seats in our parliament. I venture to say that Swedish democracy has developed since then. Today, Swedish parliament has a relatively high proportion of women members, 46% after the 22 elections. However, among young women MPs as a group, the general feeling is that there are still some greater challenges. They feel that they are questioned to a greater extent and they are expected to be better informed than other groups. Other factors that affect women MPs to an increasing extent are threats and violations, primarily via social media. The way the MPs' working week is organized also affects the possibility to combine their assignment in Parliament with parenthood. As a mother of two children, I'm for sure know this is a big challenge. By highlighting gender equality issues and working systematically the conditions 
for achieving a gender equal parliament, it can constantly be improved. The working group on gender equality in the Swedish parliament started 2006 and is now well established. And I'm the vice chairman in this group. The group consists of an equal number of men and women where all eight parties of the parliament are represented. Our focus at present includes preventing MPs from being victims of harassment and the threats and finding new ways of forward to facilitate practical reality for MPs who are the parents of young children. Because in a democracy where the parliament represents the people, it is vital that our elected representatives come from different parts of the society. This is important from several per perspectives, both so that we as parliamentarians can speak on behalf of different groups when political decisions are made, but also to serve as examples. Because if we as parliamentarians cannot show each other respect, even though our political convictions, religious affiliations, backgrounds, gender, age, sexual orientation and family situations differ, how can we expect the citizens in our different countries to do this? Your Excellencies, dear fellow parliamentarians, Europe is faced with a serious security policy situation and across the world human rights are being violated. Nevertheless, we as parliamentarians whose task is to stand up for democracy and fundamental human rights must never give up hope. We must continue to fight for a world where we respect one another as sovereign nations with the right to decide our own futures, as well as each nation's right to live in peace and security. In this regard, it is hard to not think of the struggle our Ukrainian friends are facing right now, when they are fighting back Russian aggression that has caused so much suffering, especially among families and children. Nor may we give up hope for a world where each person's rights to religious views and personal faith are respected, and where no one needs to endure persecution, threats of violence, or count on their faith. At the same time, as hate and persecution in the name of religion cannot be accepted either. Nor may we give up fight for democracy and the right for different political views and the freedom of speech. There are many examples all over the world in this respect. One is the Danish Bahraini citizen Abdulladi al Kawaya, who was sentenced only in November last year for a light sentence for leading peaceful protests during the 2011 popular uprising here in Bahrain. But I know of the several meetings that Bahrain strives for tolerance and respect for human rights, so I choose to hope this case will be solved. As a Jeopardy speaker, I think it's crucial in a democracy to respect the fundamental right of freedom of speech and the right for the opposition to criticize the government. At the same time, of course, we all share our own responsibility to show each other respect despite different views instead of spreading hate and intolerance in different ways. We must also continue to work and fight for a world where women and men have equal opportunities for a career and for political influence. Violence, violations and discriminations merely on the ground of being a woman belongs to the scrapper of history. As a former healthcare worker, I also feel that all too seldom when speaking about democracy and human rights do we discuss the important rights of people with disabilities to be given the right preconditions to participate in the society and be guaranteed basic financial security. All too often these people end up in social exclusion. And in difficult times these groups are especially vulnerable. Dear friends, and parliamentarians and your excellencies. In our capacity as parliamentarians, we have a real chance to contribute to change and actually make the world a better place. Let us do not miss that great opportunity. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. The next speaker is from Austria, please. I take the floor, please, followed by
Speaker of Malaysia. Honorable President, Honorable Speakers, dear colleagues, at the outset let me thank our host for the hospitality. We meet here in challenging times, challenging with a view to the global economic situation, climate change, as well as with a view to the international peace and security situation. In this regard, let me state, like my Swedish colleague did it before, how deeply I regret that we still have war in Europe. Let me be very clear. We, as members of parliament and participants of the Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union, an organization which has always been standing for dialogue and peace, we have to take on our responsibility in tribute to the founders of this organization, which received the Peace Nobel Prize, William Randall Kramer and Frederick Bassi. Indeed, peaceful coexistence, tolerance, and inclusive societies, these are the cornerstones of a peace we want not only for us in our countries, but for each and every country on this planet. Austria, a small country in the middle of Europe, was last year in the Global Peace Index on place number five. Only four countries on this planet were statistically seen as more peaceful. And also the report reveals that the world is at the lowest point of peacefulness in the last decades. We in Austria became more peaceful. And even this shows the statistic, we have to see that also we are facing new problems. In recent years, with a huge migration and with the COVID-19 pandemics, we have witnessed also in Austria more polarization, more intolerance in our society. And also boosted by phenomena, especially on the social media of hate speech, as it was mentioned before, and of disinformation. But we must also reflect to overcome this division. We have to work especially in the field of online media. We have to fight this fake news. We have to restore trust and also trust in the traditional media, especially in Europe. They are losing widespread newspapers, are losing readers, and the people they don't trust, not at all the information they get. And we have to work directly, especially with young people. In Austria, we have a so-called democracy workshop. Here, we involve young people in our parliament. We encourage them to take part in the political work. And we started in 2007, and until now, we had more than 123,000 young people working with parliamentarians. And we want, on the one hand, to engage them in political work, but on the other hand, to show them that our society is a society which needs civil courage and engagement of young people. And we do the same on the European level within uh, the Council of Europe. We support here this in initiative, no hate speech uh, movement, and we try also to encourage our colleagues, our fellow parliamentarians, that we try to implement in Austria international standards in our national framework, in our legal framework. So to come to my end, what I want to say is we have to work directly with our citizens 
and especially with young people if we want to be successful. And IPU is such a platform where we can learn from each other. Therefore, I hope that all of us take a lot at home when we are leaving this IPU conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next speaker will be from Malaysia, followed by Russian Federation. Your Excellencies and my fellow parliamentarians, Malaysia is unique as we are truly multiracial and multi-religious nation. Based on racial demographics, Malaysian citizens consist of the Bumiputra, of which the Malays are majority at 67.4% of the population, Chinese at 24.6%, Indians at 7.3%, and others at 0.7%. The key point I want to make here is that the minorities in Malaysia are substantial, not token, not nominal, and yet we as a nation have found a good formula for living peacefully together. As for religions, the demographics are Muslims at 61.3%, Buddhists at 19.8%, Christians 9.2%, Hindus 6.3%. What is more interesting is the fact that you have racial groups in different religions too. For instance, it is not uncommon to have a Malaysian Chinese who is a Christian instead of being a Buddhist. Interracial marriages are accepted and are much more common than a decade ago. I believe there is no equivalent country in the world with these kind of demographics. As such, I humbly stand before you to offer, to share some views and policies on the main theme of this IPU assembly, promoting peaceful coexistence and fighting intolerance. Malaysia ranks 18th out of the 163 countries in the Global Peace Index. We are ahead of many of our neighbors and in the Asia-Pacific, we're ranked number four after New Zealand, Singapore, and Japan. How did we achieve this? At a social and communal level, citizens of Malaysia instinctively practice mutual respect and a very, very heavy dose of tolerance and understanding. And it may sound trivial, but also a very deep love in sharing and reinventing the good and diverse food that we enjoy from each other. This cements our multiracial society. We also rally around our national team when it comes to badminton and squash. But besides being a foodie nation, a very serious one, where does all this communal goodwill stem from? I believe that the goodwill of Malaysians primarily stems from the common Asian values found in Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism, all of which promote universal values of peace, tolerance, and respect. The good news is this. The quest for a Malaysian identity is an ongoing project, and thankfully, is one of the main preoccupations of the younger set of Malaysians, the youth. On the governmental side, the efforts to build a more united Malaysia has had mixed results. In the aftermath of the terrible race riots in 1969, Successive Malaysian governments have utilized the tool of positive discrimination to try to shape a more equal society between the races. The rationale of social justice is absolutely correct, but the implementation of these policies has to some degree been subverted by corruption and the abuses of power by political elites. Having said that, the things that successive governments in Malaysia have done right are as follows. Number one, pushing a national identity through the Rukun Negara or national principles. Number two, promoting good values or national unity via education system and state media. Number three, safeguarding religious freedom. Number four, recognizing and implementing fair race and religious holidays for all. On the economic front, the discovery of oil and the adoption of liberal economic policies in the 1980s, Malaysia has created a big middle class. And we all know the middle class tend to have more tolerant and progressive uh, policies shunning most forms of extremism. However, Malaysia is not perfect and we are not immune to extremism. Of late, we have seen more emphasis on religion and race politics during recent elections. This is a worrying trend and the deployment of fake news via social media can be a potent challenge to democratic norms in our country. 
To counter these challenges, we will need to educate our people to be wary of fake news and at the same time demand giant social media companies to be much more responsible in filtering extremism and removing fake news. While we should try to regulate social media, the real policy is still to focus on the younger generation and to continue to deliver quality education that can transform them into more discerning and critical citizens. Civic mindfulness and social media moderation training are must-haves. In closing, I thank you all for your kind attention and to our most gracious host, Bahrain, for your incredible hospitality. I hope my little sharing of the Malaysian experience in promoting peaceful coexistence and fighting intolerance can be of some use to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next is Russian Federation. If you can take the floor, please. Followed by Ghana. <clears throat> dear Mr. Chairperson, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to start with expressing our gratitude to the National Assembly of Bahrain, first for the hospitality and secondly for an excellent choice of the main topic of, of our discussion today. Because I believe everybody will agree that the questions raised in this topic are of key importance, whatever we discuss here, inter-ethnic conflicts, inter-religious conflicts, state-to-state -state conflicts. It's always there. And I believe everyone will agree that solving the problems of intolerance, problems of coexistence, will always start, so to say, below or from below. It starts in one's home or family. It starts in one's university, at one's office, in one's municipality, or in one's country. And here, I am proud to represent a country which has a successful experience gained during centuries of how to promote peaceful coexistence with inclusive societies and how to fight intolerance in my country, in Russia. Of course, it did not go smoothly the whole time, the way it does not go smoothly for any country or any nation, and we did have our internal conflicts, the last one in Chechnya, and I use the word the last one, not the latest one, because I believe we have drawn our lessons out of these and previous conflicts. As for now, in Russia, we have up to 200 different nationalities living in peace and harmony. We have four traditional religions existing in peace and harmony. And what is important, we have up to 300 languages. And in most cases, any of them has its own rights for development. In my constituency, it is the Republic of Mariel, we have three state languages, three state languages. We have a region in Caucasus called Dagestan, where they have 14 state languages equal to each other. And by the way, in Crimea, we have three state languages, Ukrainian included, and uh, Tatar language included. Yes, in all these cases, the Russian language is present, because Russians are in a majority position in my country. And yes, we have Russian nationalists, like in any other ethnic group or in any country or in any nation. Nationalists with the slogan, Russia is for Russians. What makes difference? In my country, we do not let nationalists come into power. Either they are Russians or of any other ethnic region. And this is why. There is not a single ethnic group, there is not a single religious group 
in my country, which wants to flee, which wants to escape, which wants to leave the Russian Federation, they all live in harmony. They all feel themselves comfortable. And this is our unique experience. Unfortunately, the problem of letting nationalists come into power was not solved by many of our neighbors. Unfortunately, Ukraine included, where they have, as for now, just one language, just one state language. When the Soviet Union collapsed in Ukraine, there were more than 20,000 schools. They are still there, 20, 22,000. 50% of them had education in Russian, 11,000 schools. 30 years later, there is not a single one school in Ukraine teaching in Russian. There is not a single one kindergarten teaching in Russian. And you may protest, but this is simply true. And there is no freedom of religion any longer, because the Ukrainian authorities absolutely illegally take away from the traditional Russian Orthodox Church their churches and monasteries. And this is also clear facts. At the end, Minsk agreements. In eight years, Russia was trying to assist Ukraine to solve the problems of its internal development and to keep the territorial integrity of Ukraine. The Minsk agreements were about promoting peaceful coexistence. They were about fighting intolerance. They were about building up inclusive society in Ukraine. And now I will cite the former president of Ukraine, Mr. Poroshenko. We were speaking about that this morning. At that moment, the president Speaker, of Ukraine seconds, signing please. the Minsk agreements. Mr. Poroshenko, now, we have achieved what we wanted to knock out eight years for ourselves and build the power of the armed forces of Ukraine. This was the first task, and it was achieved. The Minsk agreements have fulfilled their task. Later on, the Federal Chancellor of Germany, Madame Merkel, said in an interview to Die Zeit, the Minsk agreement was an attempt to give Ukraine time. It also used this time to become stronger, as you can see now. And later on, Mr. Hollande, the President of France, Yes, Angela Merkel is right on this point. Since 2014, Ukraine has strengthened its Mr. military Speaker, posture. Thank you very much. Indeed, Time is over. Thank the you. Ukrainian army was completely different from that of 2014. Now it is better trained and equipped. It is the merit of the Minsk agreements, and it has given the Ukrainian army this opportunity to become stronger. Thank you. This thank is you how much. all of us missed the chance to assist Ukraine to have peaceful coexistence, to have Thank an inclusive you, society, Speaker. and to fight intolerance in its country. And this is how Ukraine continuously is being exploded Thank you. Thank from you, Mr. inside. Speaker. The next Thank speaker you very from much. Ghana. followed by Speaker of Thailand. His Royal Majesty, the King of the Kingdom of Bahrain, Your Excellencies, my colleagues, speakers of various parliaments, presiding officers, and members of parliament, I greet you and I wish you a very successful assembly. It is really a pleasure to be in this beautiful city of Manama, Bahrain, to attend the 146th assembly and related meetings of the IPU. 
on behalf of the delegation from Ghana, and on my part, I extend a warm fraternal greetings and gratitude his, to His Majesty the King of Bahrain, the government, people, and parliament of Bahrain for accepting to host this conference and putting at our disposal such a splendid and well-equipped conference facility. I sincerely congratulate you all for this show of solidarity and commitment to the principles and values of the Interparliamentary Union. Mr. President, today's world is plagued with many complexities, uncertainties, insecurity, disasters, economic depression, and conflicts. The theme of this assembly, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, fighting intolerance, could not have been more appropriate given the extent of violence, statelessness, conflicts, poverty, exodus, now mildly referred to as migration, cataclysmic tumults, and many, many deaths in many places in the world. I want to take this opportunity to salute the Interparliamentary Union and the organizers for the appropriateness of this team for this 146th Assembly. Mr. President, the world is in no doubt a diverse and polarized creature. Different races, gender, religions, continents, traditions, cultures, potentials, languages, histories, live and depend on it. We have no choice than to accept the diversity, since diversity is the spice of life. But for polarization, if we put our hands to the wheel, we could close the poles, unite and coexist in peace and harmony. I believe we are all at Eden in this vision. Hence, our collective commitment to the slogan for democracy for everyone. Yet, a few intolerant ones are jeopardizing this global effort of promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. Distinguished participants, parliaments all over the world are better positioned and empowered to cover and counter these destructive efforts of the few. Mr. President, the Parliament of Ghana has worked and is still working to promote peaceful coexistence of different tribes, religions, creed, race, color, gender, political opinions, migrants, and so on. Thanks to the provisions of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Additionally, Parliament has enacted the National Peace Council Act, Vigilantism and Related Offenses Act, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Act, and established through various legislations a well-structured and independent judiciary and justice system. Ghana is committed to developing a democratic culture free of tolerance, a, a democratic culture that promotes respect for all people, human rights and freedoms, human dignity, equality, women empowerment and gender parity, inclusiveness of all in the decision-making process. As a result, the 2022 Global Peace Index ranked Ghana second in Africa for having a high level of internal peace. Mr. President, we can't achieve this in the world together. The need for the global population to pursue the harmony that is embedded in the culture of the world is now. The Sustainable Development Goals come in handy to lead the way, especially in the area of global partnership and inclusive societies. No country can successfully develop alone. We will need to complement the efforts of one another. We are stronger when we act together 
than when we act individually. And even when our purposes and goals coincide, a healthy competition makes our lives healthier, better, and longer. We must therefore not only learn to coexist in peace, we must also work to promote inclusive growth and development by consciously working to prop up the development of the least developed countries. Under development and poverty are some of the main drivers of intolerance, such as xenophobia, terrorism, conflicts, and wars in the world. As legislators, it behoves on us to encourage tolerance and inclusive development through the laws we make, and particularly through the tools of oversight of the executive to ensure that our respective countries are set on the path of peace, security, and sustainability. We have to commit ourselves to holding governments of our countries to contain corruption, eliminate waste, ignorance, and greed. This is the smooth way to building fair, just, and prosperous societies. Mr. President, the Interparliamentary Union can rely on the Parliament of Ghana to achieve the theme of this assembly. The Parliament of Ghana will work in partnership with the IPU and all members to fight intolerance and promote peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. The Parliament of Ghana is translating the values and principles of good governance into concrete benefits Mr. Speaker, for all the 30 seconds, please. This explains why a large gender parity delegation of four ladies, four men, three of whom are from government and three from the opposition, led by me, the Speaker from Ghana, is here to work with the Interparliamentary Union and its members to craft our resolutions that will further the cause of the team and humanity as a whole. Ghana believes it is only when we succeed in the implementation of this vision that the world will know true peace and prosperity. I want to take this opportunity again to thank all of you, and may the good Lord continue to bless us all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next speaker is from Thailand. May take the floor, please. Followed by the Speaker of Libya. Honorable President, distinguished delegates, and dear colleagues, Thailand continues to deal with increasingly complex challenges that transcend national borders, including building a peaceful and harmonious multicultural society. We are facing a meaningful challenge whether our, our democracies are robust enough to accommodate the issues of diversity and tolerance in the 21st century. Thai people have always embraced diversity and tolerance. Cultural pluralism and intercultural dialogue have naturally been the grain of the Thai society. As a predominant Buddhist and secular country, the long-standing traditions of acceptance, moderation, and compromises of the Thai culture has also played an essential role in fostering an environment where people of various religions and ethnicities have peacefully lived together in harmony and mutual respect for centuries. Since 1932, the Thai constitutional monarchy has continued to be the center of reverence and serve as unifying forces for the nations that bring together people of different faiths and cultures and constitutionally upheld as the patron of all faiths. For decades, the holistic wisdom of the sufficient economy philosophy has guided the kingdom's progress towards sustainability, inclusive societies, and social equity. Thailand has zero tolerance policy against the racism and practice of gender-based discrimination, the protection against many forms of discrimination based on racial, ethnic, and religious reasons provided by international instruments had been enshrined in a number of our domestic law. The Constitution has served as foundation for the 20-year national strategy, which promotes development based on social and cultural diversity. With 62 ethnic groups in the country, 
The Constitution also guarantees cultural rights of Thai people with diverse cultural identities to preserve their ways of life and express their cultures freely. The National Assembly of Thailand has taken an active part in advancing inclusiveness and promoting the culture of tolerance in many respects. Since 2019, the ethnic groups and the LGBTQ plus community have been included and accepted in the Thai parliament and have officially been incorporated into the title and mandate of a parliamentary standing committee as key platform to nurture diversity and equality in parliamentary democracy. As parliamentarians, we have a responsibility to ourselves and to the international community to join forces in building bridges of understanding and solidarity among different communities and move forward together to build a better and safer world where human differences are cherished and diverse societies thrive as a former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan once said in 2013, learn from each other and make our different traditions and cultures a source of harmony and strength not discord and weakness. Lastly, may I express on behalf of the parliamentary delegation of Thailand, our sincere appreciation to our host, the Parliament of Bahrain and Bahraini authorities concerned as well as professional support from the IPU Secretariat. Our sincere congratulations for the successful organization of this international conference that achieves all the objectives. We humbly wish His Majesty the King of Bahrain his Royal Highness, the Prime Minister, His Excellency, the Speaker of Bahraini Council of Representatives, and the lovely people of Bahrain in good health and very successful in future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, next will be Speaker of Live Libya. I take the floor, please followed by the Speaker of France. Ma'ali Sayyid, Rais al-Jalsa, Ashab al-Ma'ali wa-Sa'ada, al-Sayyidati wa-Sa'ada al-Hudur al-Kareem. Uwaddu fil-bidayati an uhayyikum bi tahiyyat al-Islam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yatubu li fil-bidaya wa asalatun an nafsi wa niyabatun an rais وأعضاء مجلس النواب والشعب الليبي أن نتقدم بخالص الشكر والتقدير إلى المملكة البحرين الشقيق ملكا وبرلمانا وشعبا على حسن الاستقبال والتنظيم وكرم الضيافة إن الحديث عن تعزيز التعايش السلمي والتسامح ونبذ الكراهية والعنف والتعصب أصبح أمرا ضروريا لتسوية العلاقات على المستويين الوطني والدولي وهو مبدأ إنساني يطمح الجميع إلى تحقيقه وتأتي أهمية التعايش والتسامح في أنهما يمثلان العوامل الرئيسية لتحقيق الأمن والاستقرار والتنمية في أي مجتمع لوجود علاقة وطيدة بين التعايش والتسامح على أنه ثقافة والأمن على أنه هدف وهذه الصلة تأتي من أن الأمن لا يتحقق إلا في ظل الاستقرار والاستقرار لا يتحقق إلا بالتعايش والتسامح ومن أهم مظاهر الاستقرار تقبل أفراد المجتمع بعضهم البعضا بغض النظر عن اختلافاتهم العرقية والدينية فيصبح لدينا مجتمع متعدد ومتسامح منفتح ينخفض فيه معدل الكراهية والتعصب والتطرف الإسلام دين التسامح والمحبة والسلام والاتسامح والتعايش السلمي قيمة كبرى لدى المسلمين فهو نابع من السماحة بكل ما تعنيه الكلمة من حرية ومساواة وتنطلق أسس التسامح والحوار من عقيدته ومبادئه لذلك جعل شعاره في تحيته السلام ومن هنا عززت بلادي قيم التسامح والتعايش من خلال قوانينها وتشريعاتها بشأن مكافحة التمييز والكراهية ونبذ العنف ومكافحة الإرهاب والتطرف والجريمة لقد أصبح مفهوم التعايش السلمي أحد المفاهيم المحورية الهادفة لإدارة التنوع في المجتمعات البشرية بشكل سليم ويجب تحويلها 
إلى قوة دفع لتعزيز الأمن وإرساء السلام لما يسهم في تحقيق التقدم والازدهار إذ إن البديل للتعايش هو الإقصاء والكراهية والتعصب والعنف والصراع والإرهاب والفوضى وما يترتب عليها من أثار كارثية تجاه المجتمعات البشرية وحتى نتمكن من تعزيز التعايش السلمي لابد من أن نطلع بأهم المعوقات التي تمثل عقبة رئيسية في سبيل تحقيقه ومن بين هذه المعوقات الإعلام الرقمي فلا شك أن عصرنا الحالي هو عصر التكنولوجيا ومن خلاله أصبح العالم قرية صغيرة وهذا له إيجابيات عديدة على أنه يحمل معه السلبيات مقيتة وهناك من يقوم ببث السموم لتأجيج الصراع بإثارة عديد من القضايا الداعية إلى التعصب وربما التحريض والقتل حتى أصبح سيفا مسلطا ضد التعايش السلمي ومن هنا نرى أهمية التوجه إلى الإعلام الرقمي الذي من الممكن أن يكون الوسيلة الأكثر تأثيرا لأنه وسيلة نقل حيوية للمعلومات والأراء تتجاوز الحدود الجغرافية ومنصة في غاية الأهمية لتثقيف الأفراد وتشكيل العقل الجماعي الإلكتروني ولكن الإعلام الرقمي سلاح ذو حدين لأنه على الرغم من إتاحته الفرصة لتعزيز ثقافة التعايش والتسامح فأنه يستدعي كثيرا من التحديات التي من الممكن لها أن تعوق عملية تفعيل ثقافة التسامح والتعايش وترسيخهما ومن الممكن أن يستخدم الإعلام الرقمي من محاربي قيم التعايش والتسامح من الجماعات المتطرفة لبث الكراهية والعنف عن طريق الخطابات التأجيجية التي تثير القلاقل بين مختلف الأفراد والمجتمعات مما لا شك فيه إن الإعلام الرقمي قد أسهم بدرجة كبيرة في عولمة التطرف وتصعيد أنشطة الجماعات المتطرفة والتنظيمات الإرهابية وفي الفترة الأخيرة كان مرتبطا ارتباطا وثيقا بالإعلام الرقمي حيث نجحت هذه الجماعات في استغلال هذه الوسيلة بفاعلية في عملية التجنيد والدعاية لأيديولوجياتها وكان مصدرا مهما يتغذى عليه الاحتقان والتعصب والكراهية قد أثر ذلك بلا شك بالتبعية في مفهوم الأمن القومي للدول فالعلاقات الاجتماعية الافتراضية جعلت الفضاء العام لبعض الدول مستباحا تثأر فيه النزاعات والصراعات لدرجة كان من الصعب معه الحفاظ على متانة رأس المال الاجتماعي في لحظات كثيرة لتلك الدول ومن أجل المحافظة على التعايش والتسامح في ظل الإعلام الرقمي ومجابهة التحديات التي يمثلها هذا الإعلام فأنا ندعو إلى نشر ثقافتي التعايش والتسامح في منصات الإعلام الرقمي من المؤسسات الدينية والتربوية والتعليمية وإقامة المبادرات والفاعليات التي تدعمها غرس ثقافة تقديم المصلحة العامة على المصالح الشخصية عن طريق وسائل الإعلام والجهات ذات العلاقة تثقيف أفراد المجتمع بأهمية تقصي المعلومات من مصادرها الرسمية تجنب التضليل الإعلامي والأخبار المفبركة دمتم ودام العالم في تعايش سلمي متسامح والتوفيق والسداد لأعمالنا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next speaker will be France. We come in. Take the floor, please. Followed by the speaker of Ecuador. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mes chers collègues, la coexistence pacifique, c'est celle que revendiquent les deux assemblées françaises dans l'absolu. Et je laisserai donc à ma collègue députée Brigitte Lizot le soin de compléter le propos français. La société inclusive, c'est une société qui contribue au bénéfice de tous, à l'autonomie de chacun, à l'acceptation de toutes les formes de diversité et de fragilité. La société inclusive n'est pas une société contrainte, c'est une société qui puise sa force dans les richesses de sa diversité. Cet idéal, la France, pays de la philosophie des Lumières et de la Déclaration des droits de l'homme, ne peut qu'y être naturellement sensible. Pourtant, la poursuite de cet objectif, qui renvoie à une coexistence harmonieuse d'individus différents, est somme toute assez récente dans notre pays. Historiquement, en effet, les principes d'égalité et de non-discrimination, qui sont au fondement de la République française, ont conduit à privilégier le concept d'intégration et l'application uniforme de la règle de droit dans une approche que nous qualifierons d'universalis. Le fait, le principe de traitement différent, de situations différentes, ne s'est imposé que progressivement. L'introduction de la parité homme-femme en matière d'accès aux mandats électoraux en 1999, puis aux responsabilités professionnelles et sociales, a nécessité deux révisions constitutionnelles afin de les concilier avec les principes d'égalité et de non-discrimination. A l'inverse, la France a parfois joué un rôle de précurseur 
Ce fut le cas en 2013 avec l'introduction de l'obligation faite aux partis de présenter un tandem homme-femme en tête de liste pour les élections départementales. Au-delà de l'inclusion, les revendications en faveur de l'équité, de l'égalité réelle ou du droit à la différence ont fait évoluer la conception française de l'égalité. Cette possibilité reste cependant encadrée, le but étant de permettre la mise en œuvre de politiques d'inclusion sans pour autant porter atteinte à l'égalité républicaine. Cela s'est d'abord surtout appliqué dans les domaines du handicap, de l'éducation et de l'action sociale avec des lois votées en 2005 et 2013 concernant la scolarisation des enfants en situation de handicap. En 2019, le service public de l'école inclusive est instauré pour rapprocher l'ensemble des acteurs concernés, l'État, les associations et les familles, les collectivités, et faciliter la prise en compte des besoins éducatifs particuliers des personnes en situation de handicap. En matière d'action sociale, le terme d'inclusion s'est imposé à partir du début des années 2000, succédant au concept de lutte contre la pauvreté et de lutte contre l'exclusion. La politique d'immigration, elle aussi, emploie le terme d'inclusion depuis une dizaine d'années, bien que cette notion d'intégration soit encore largement utilisée dans ce domaine. Et plus récemment, la notion d'inclusion numérique a fait son apparition à mesure de l'utilisation croissante des outils numériques et de la dématérialisation des services publics. Internet, en effet, est devenu indispensable, et il suffit de regarder les écrans, et de ne pas y avoir accès constitue un facteur majeur d'exclusion. Un plan d'inclusion numérique a été lancé en 2017 et le Sénat s'est récemment penché sur le sujet avec une proposition de loi visant à favoriser l'inclusion numérique. Voilà, mes chers collègues, pour ce bref aperçu, sans doute très incomplet, de la manière dont l'objectif de société inclusive est pris en compte et mis en œuvre dans notre pays. Je vous remercie de votre attention et nous aurons l'occasion d'y revenir. Merci. Speaker of Ecuador, can take the floor, please. Followed by Finland, Speaker of Finland. Un saludo desde la delegación ecuatoriana y gracias al Reino de Bahrein por la atenta hospitalidad. En los parlamentos construimos normas que regulan el desarrollo común de una sociedad más justa y equitativa. Y somos un contrapoder democrático para enfrentar la tentativa autoritaria de regímenes y gobiernos que utilizan la persecución, la violencia y el lawfare, mecanismos perversos de exclusión e intolerancia, incompatibles con la democracia. Los parlamentos tenemos la obligación moral, ética y jurídica de combatir la intolerancia en cualquier circunstancia y en cualquier régimen político. La Asamblea Nacional del Ecuador, Parlamento Unicameral, se compone de 137 miembros, de los cuales 15 son electos en representación nacional, 116 representantes de 24 provincias y 6 legisladores representamos la diáspora ecuatoriana, de cerca de 3 millones de personas, en tres circunscripciones del exterior. Y yo represento a los ecuatorianos migrantes en Europa, Asia y Oceanía. El Parlamento ecuatoriano cuenta con un importante número de mujeres legisladoras, 62 de un total de 137 curules, es decir, el 45% de la Asamblea Nacional, resultado de nuestra ley que prevé que la alternancia de género en todas las listas de candidaturas deben, deben tener esto. Y no dejamos la elección de género a los dirigentes de los partidos políticos. Pero aún tenemos desafíos para que las mujeres ocupemos espacios de mayor toma de decisiones y que las mujeres que vayamos abriendo camino a las siguientes contemos con mejores herramientas, empoderamiento, formación, networking, redes de apoyo y sororidad. Y tenemos que preguntarnos, ¿hay guarderías en nuestros parlamentos? ¿Tenemos espacios adecuados de lactancia? ¿Cómo podemos ser más inclusivos y no discriminar a las madres parlamentarias y madres solteras? Los parlamentos históricamente han sido espacios de hombres, pensados para hombres, con horarios para hombres, que han tenido en casa a alguien que cuide de sus hijos y tenga en orden la casa. Y el acoso sexual contra mujeres parlamentarias no disminuye. Y es tarea de todas y todos cambiar esto. Nuestra ley de elecciones prevé que el 25% de candidatos deben ser menores de 30 años. Y como resultado, tenemos seis asambleístas jóvenes menores de 30 años, es decir, el 4.3% del total del Parlamento. 
Y si consideramos los parámetros de la UIP, tenemos 56 legisladores menores de 43 años, casi el 41% del total de parlamentarios. Y estas mujeres y estos hombres jóvenes son los que mayormente han impulsado importantes acciones de control político, sin miedo al poder. Y han venido investigando al presidente de la República por denuncias sobre una presunta trama de corrupción en empresas públicas. Y anteriormente se lo investigó por temas relativos a una presunta evasión fiscal relacionada con los Pandora Papers. En América Latina y en particular en Ecuador, quienes luchamos desde el progresismo democrático hemos sido a menudo víctimas de persecución política y judicial por las élites económicas y poderes fácticos. La estrategia geopolítica de Lawfare atenta contra los derechos humanos por ser un montaje de procesos judiciales que serían imposibles en verdaderos estados de derecho. El objetivo de Lawfare es destruir moral, política y económicamente al adversario político para neutralizarlo y conseguir a través de una vía disfrazada de judicial lo que no consiguen en las urnas, en un escenario democrático frágil. Los legisladores ecuatorianos han obtenido refugio y asilo en hermanos países a causa de esto. Y el discurso de intolerancia y odio va generalmente dirigido contra mujeres políticas atacadas en medios de comunicación hegemónicos y hostigadas judicialmente sin que nunca hayan podido ser sustentadas estas denuncias. Pese a todo, los parlamentos debemos seguir promoviendo la construcción de sociedades más justas, solidarias y equitativas, ancladas fuertemente en la participación ciudadana y el respeto a la diversidad, en la promoción de igualdad de oportunidades, la erradicación de la discriminación y la intolerancia. Debemos impulsar la capacitación y formación sistemática en derechos humanos, la no discriminación y la lucha contra toda forma de intolerancia. Necesitamos desarrollar normativa al interior de nuestros parlamentos que prevenga y sancione actos de violencia política y discriminación. Y una buena práctica es el Código Parlamentario Global de Conducta Democrática desarrollado por Parlamentarios para la Acción Global. Muchas gracias. Así que hay mucho camino por andar. Thank you. The next speaker is from Finland. May I take the floor, please? Followed by Sorina. Buenas tardes, señor presidente, estimados colegas. Mi tierra natal, Finlandia, es uno de los países menos corruptos y más estables, igualitarios, libres y felices del mundo. Tenemos un gobierno sólido, pero también una oposición política y una prensa libre y fuerte. Toleramos las críticas las discusiones, las actitudes y las opiniones distintas. Pero tenemos también nuestro talón de Aquiles. A pesar de todos los intentos, los programas de los gobiernos y los compromisos domésticos contraídos, no hemos logrado ratificar el acuerdo internacional sobre los derechos del pueblo originario de la gente Sami. No hemos podido garantizar a las personas con discapacidad las mismas posibilidades para trabajar. Y tenemos otros retos pendientes más. A pesar de esto, podemos considerar a Finlandia y a nuestros vecinos escandinavos como países con sociedades inclusivas y desarrolladas con una coexistencia pacífica. Pero con nuestro otro vecino, Rusia, la situación es totalmente al revés. Desde hace años, los dirigentes han discriminado a la oposi oposición y dificultado el funcionamiento de las organizaciones de los derechos humanos e internacionales. Finalmente, ese país empezó una guerra brutal y totalmente inaceptable contra su vecino Ucrania, cuyo derecho a existir como país está gravemente amenazado. ¡Qué vergüenza, Rusia! Desgraciadamente, 
la misma crítica doméstica vale igual para la situación de nuestro país anfitrión Bahrain. Es importante comprender que el valor de un país radica en la defensa de los derechos de sus ciudadanos, como la libertad de expresión en la aceptación de una oposición crítica y una prensa libre, en la prohibición de la pena de muerte, en la garantía de los juicios transparentes y justos y de una vida igual para todos, a pesar de su forma de pensar y de expresarse, de su género, de su religión y de su orientación sexual. Por eso, quisiera preguntarles todos, con esta definición, cómo es la situación en sus países, qué podríamos hacer para mejorarla. Hay problemas en todos los países, pero lo más importante es proponer soluciones y desarrollar el país mejor para las minorías también. A veces el comienzo es admitir los problemas. Por eso, como un gesto de buena voluntad, nuestro país anfitrión podría empezar y liberar al ciudadano danés Señor al Caballa, que ha sido condenado a más de 10 años con acusaciones falsas y sin un juicio justo. Esto sería el comienzo de un futuro mejor para todos. Muchas gracias. Next speaker from Suriname, you may take the floor, please followed by the Speaker of the United Kingdom. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. At the outset, Mr. President, please allow me to express on behalf of my beloved country, Suriname, our deepest sympathy and sincerest condolences to Turkey and Syria following the devastating impact caused by the massive earthquake in February. Let us pray as one IPU family for strength to overcome this massive natural disaster. As I turn to address the theme of the general debate, I refer to the following. Human rights and fundamental freedoms are preserved in the Constitution of Suriname. All present with the territory of Suriname have an equal claim, claim to protection of person and property. Suriname's adherence to equality and non-discrimination is based on the very fabric of diverse multi-ethnic cultural society. The keen awareness of these profound principles among the many ethnic groups has been inspired us to peacefully coexist with each other. Respect for culture diversity is a distinct characteristic of the Suriname's society. Moreover, Suriname has demonstrated that a multi-ethnic society doesn't have to be drama as long as you can continue to respect the power of difference. At the same time, you must be willing to get to know the other and build a society with the other. This is an ongoing process that requires addressing all forms of intolerance that may arise, including steps taken towards overcoming challenges such as identified increase of hate and hate-related related racial speech on social media and other online platforms. Challenges that could instigate intolerance in our society, however, the particular when it concerns inequality gaps related to language barriers causing delays in the educational process and gender inequalities. Recently, a reform process of the educational system has initiated whereby children are being educated in their own community language. Furthermore, as a fundamental step towards inclusion, the Parliament of Suriname start to translate it, the activities. Dear colleagues, Mr. President, with respect to gender inequalities, the Parliament of Suriname recently enacted labor legislation and parental leave, sexual harassment in the workplace, and equal treatment in employment. 
With respect to persons with disabilities, Parliament approved the rectification by Suriname of United Nations Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities. The Parliament of Suriname contributes to ensuring access to buildings and services for the protection of persons with disabilities, safeguard the rights to health and rehabilitation, non-discrimination in employment, the right to property, access to financial service, social protection, right to private life, access to medical data, and rights to be dignified, participation in cultural life. Digital inclusiveness, ICT, is an important precondition for the development. The factors that promote coextensions between different groups and how these are encouraged by the Parliament are as follows. There are different kinds of organization and foundation who encourage inclusiveness in Suriname by carrying out various projects for the different groups. The Parliament encourages all these factors by holding meetings with various stakeholders, providing presentation, legislations, providing information through our television channels and social media. Staff members of parliament include persons with disabilities. Moreover, there are persons with visual impairment in the operational department where all meetings are recorded and persons with hearing impairment in another department. Recently, the Speaker of Parliament of Suriname has appointed a well-known talented young person from our community with physical disability as ambassador of parliament for one year. As ambassador, he gets the opportunity to encourage other youth with disabilities and combating bullying for people with disabilities. This will be done by sending short video message on our television channels. The National Assembly of Suriname can promote inclusiveness in the parliamentary work through different ways, including further encouraging transparency and access to public information, accountability, and citizen participation. The role collective of parliaments could play in helping address rights of intolerance or promote inclusion and peaceful coexistences are supporting the implementation of the SDGs, especially SDG 10, exchanging best practices amongst parliaments, working with NGOs and other international organizations, encouraging other countries that have not yet access to the UN Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities to do so, encourage implementation of the UN Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities by countries who already ratified it. At least, but not last, Mr. President, I would like to thank the Kingdom of Bahrain for hosting this IPU Assembly in Bahrain. This is my first IPU Assembly meeting. Many more to come. Thank you, Suriname, for sending me. Once again, thank you, Bahrain, for the warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, shukriana. Thank you. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, the next speaker from United Kingdom, followed by Latvia, speaker of Latvia. Mr. President, honored and distinguished members of the Assembly, 2023 gives us many chances to mark the achievements of global democracy. 70 years since the Universal Declaration and 30 years since the Vienna Convention on Human Rights, and 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement. All examples of how politics and parliamentarians can change the lives of people in a positive way using words, leadership and persuasion. Contrast this with what happens when politicians use force, aggression and bloodshed to impose their will on others. The impact on people the people we are elected to represent is anything other than positive. Last week, I was honoured to be part of a parliamentary assembly which met in Belfast to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. The British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, or BIPA as it is known, brings together parliamentarians from all the legislatures that meet on the islands that make up the British Isles. It has met in some form since 1992, well before the signing of the agreement and it played a part in creating the environment that allowed that agreement to happen. The relationships formed between parliamentarians who were all personally affected by the Troubles, the understanding that it, uh, that it was in everyone's interest to find a resolution, and the acceptance that if you really want to solve a problem, there will be a way. 
meant that there was space for true leadership to be shown to find a political solution. And it was the IPU that played a part, because it was the BGIPU that was asked to create a forum where UK and Irish politicians could meet. And it was that forum that now meets as BIPA. At the 63rd plenary last week, we heard from some of the architects of the agreement, including the former Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern. We also heard from members of the Women's Coalition, which played a vital role in the peace process. Those women were brave. They came from all parts of society in Northern Ireland and from all communities. In the 1990s, when cross-community engagement could lead to retribution from terrorists, those women showed incredible courage. But they showed those in power that solutions could be found, and they demanded that their leaders find them. Mothers, sisters, daughters came together to say enough is enough, and they forced the leaders to listen. Being a woman in politics shouldn't be a brave thing to do. It shouldn't be unusual. It shouldn't mean risking your personal safety. But instead, we face abuse and threats. In the UK, we know that on average, women MPs serve one fewer parliamentary term than their male counterparts. There are many reasons for this. Women often represent seats with implicitly lower majorities than men. Family commitments also play their part. But we hear from survey after survey that social media and the abuse experienced is too much to take. That is why the UK's online safety bill is so important in starting to tackle this issue. And I'm sure you will be shocked to learn that many of the architects of the Good Friday Agreement are of the view that such an agreement would not be possible in today's environment of Twitter and Facebook commentary. A sobering thought indeed. Our role is to stand up for those we represent and ensure we hold executives to account. We've talked at this assembly about the United Nations and the role that the IPU plays in scrutinising the work of the UN. I want governments that are members of the UN to live by the ideals they have signed up to. That means delivering on the SDGs, meeting their climate change obligations and respecting the laws and borders of others. I hope that this Assembly can call out those UN members that flout the rules and demand action. One SDG I want to highlight is 8.7, which calls for the eradication of forced labour and modern slavery. Sadly, we are still very far from meeting this goal. There are estimated to be almost 50 million victims of modern slavery globally. There are victims in every country. They pick the cotton we wear and the chocolate we eat. They are forced to prostitute themselves and they deliver the drugs that kill our children. Where there is disaster and trauma, there are opportunities for exploiters to find new victims. And they are then responsible for more causes of trauma. For example, 40% of all deforestation is carried out by victims of forced labour, creating more climate change and more potential victims. We need to confront this. We need the United Nations to confront this. We need to make it a matter for the next General Assembly. Mr President, democracy matters. Respecting human rights matters. Leadership matters. We know of the great examples of the past. We need great examples for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next speaker is from, from Latvia, followed by the Speaker of Chile. Mr. President, dear colleagues, let me remind you that six years ago we debated on the subject about promoting peace through interface and ethnic dialogue. Has the situation improved? No. The Global Peace Index says that the world is at its, at its lowest point in the last 15 years. We see violent demonstrations, hate speech, fake news, growing social and economic differences, low trust in democracy and human rights, but it cannot justify the use of brutal force. Today, the word peace must be understood literally, because a real war, war now is taking place in Europe. More than one year and peaceful coexistence is like a dream in people's minds. Colleagues, current IPU strategy means to focus on climate change, democracy, human rights, respect for movement, sustainable development. But how does it go together with brutal wars in Europe 
and other parts of the world, and who is to blame for such a situation, and what we can do to improve the situation. Some insights on how Latvian society has managed to keep cultural diversity and peaceful coexistence between ethnic and religious groups. Historically, Latvia has been situated at the geographical and cultural crossroads. Many ethnic groups have been living together for hundreds of years. Our society has learned tolerance towards different cultures, lifestyles and beliefs, at the same time preserving its own unique identity. Out of almost 2 million of the population of Latvia, only 60% were Latvians. There are more than 100 ethnicities living in Latvia. The largest group are Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians. And we have more than 300 minority associations. Schools in Latvia illustrated our inclusiveness. We have seven general education schools in Latvia. 77% are schools that teach only Latvian. 20% teach in Russian and Latvian. But 11 schools implement programs in majority languages such as Polish, Ukrainian, Belarusian. These schools are fully funded by the state. In Latvia, we promote intercultural dialogue by strong language learning traditions. This is one of the best ways to promote people-to-people -people contacts and improve in understanding and tolerance to other cultures, ethnicities, and religions. A great role in studies play not only schools, but cultural centers too. Centers like German, Russian, Jewish, French, Danish, Chinese have long traditions in Latvia. Ladies and gentlemen, but our, by our constitution in Latvia, the state is separate from the church. We have strong Catholic, Lutheran, and Orthodox traditions in Latvia. Despite differences, these groups can develop ecumenical dialogue. At the same time, Latvians are tolerant towards other religions, including Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism. Our constitution strongly confirms that intolerance is not allowed in, and not acceptable in Latvia. Our parliament always supports the position of equal attitude without reference on ra to race, language, or religion. Standing committees address issues related to ethnic dialogue and social integra integration. Dear colleagues, Latvia is a small country, but our experience from the previous century going through the time of war, occupation, and deportations is significant. There has been no war in Latvia for almost 80 years, but there is a war near our borders now. Our nations have given us a mandate to shape our present and future, and I really don't believe that any sane person could vote for intolerance resulting in war, kill children, and rape women. We know that nobody has rights to convince others with force about the primacy of his culture, religion, world order. But in reality, we live in the area of conflicts, clashes, wars, exactly based on ethnic, ethnic and others' intolerances. We need to promote respect for the universal values of human dignity, equality, right to integrity, and peace, for tolerance not only in words, but in stable solutions and reactions on real actions. Thank you, Bahrain, and be complimentary, be complimentary in the diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker from Chile may take the, take the floor, please, followed by the speaker of Germany. Estimadas y estimados colegas, sean mis primeras palabras para agradecer a nombre de toda la delegación parlamentaria de Chile los esfuerzos del Parlamento de Bahrein y de su gobierno por llevar a cabo de manera tan exitosa esta centésima cuadragésima sexta asamblea. Agradecemos igualmente la hospitalidad brindada con la convicción 
de que aquí se representa lo mejor de nuestras democracias y se dialoga con fraternidad y altura de miras sobre cómo perfeccionarlas y hacerlas progresar. El tema elegido para esta Asamblea refleja nuestra preocupación por un conjunto de situaciones generadas en tiempos recientes que han debilitado alguna de nuestras democracias. Promover la coexistencia pacífica y las sociedades inclusivas, combatir la intolerancia, permite ordenar nuestras prioridades y movilizar a nuestras naciones en común para enderezar la marcha de la humanidad en la superación de sus mayores desafíos. El impresionante desarrollo científico-técnico de las últimas tres décadas debería permitir a la humanidad superar muchos de los problemas que nos aquejan. Con los recursos de hoy, estamos creando de manera acelerada. Es posible entonces imaginar que crisis como el hambre, el deterioro ambiental, el, el cambio climático, el cuidado de los océanos, la falta de agua, las pandemias, pueden ser enfrentadas. Pero no es así. Hoy la humanidad produce alimentos suficientes para alimentar a toda su población. Pero hay muchos seres humanos, niños que mueren de hambre, sufren desnutrición crónica, la ciencia médica desarrolló rápidamente vacunas para enfrentar el COVID, pero quedan muchas personas sin ser vacunadas. Seres humanos aún no tienen agua potable, mientras que hay naciones a punto de desaparecer por el crecimiento de los océanos. Reconozcamos que el progreso de los últimos años no ha hecho sino aumentar la competencia internacional por un predominio global, lejos de unir al mundo en torno a causas comunes. Esta realidad parece muy distinta de la que vivía el mundo hace apenas tres décadas, cuando el fin de la Guerra Fría, el retorno de la democracia en América Latina, los acuerdos de Oslo, los progresos del desarme, el reconocimiento de los derechos de la mujer y la igualdad de género, el fin del apartheid y la proclamación de los objetivos del desarrollo del milenio, a pesar de todo eso, las crisis existen. Todo parecía apuntar hacia un mundo conducido hacia la paz la coexistencia pacífica y el, y el surgimiento de sociedades democráticas más plurales y tolerantes. Se han avanzado en algunas de estas direcciones, sin duda, pero también las resistencias han sido enormes, muy mayores de lo esperado. En aquellos años en mi país, al retorno de la democracia, era simbolizado como un arco iris, el arco de los colores en que todos caben y pueden identificarse. Hoy, en cambio, la realidad lo ha ido descolorando hasta llegar a divisiones categóricas frente a las cuales se ofrecen solo opciones en blanco y en negro. Hoy tenemos una gran oportunidad para que las y los parlamentarios de todo el mundo identifiquemos los factores que sustentan la intolerancia y las divisiones en la sociedad nacional e internacional. La UIP constituye un gran espacio para compartir diagnósticos y oportunidades comunes. Promover la inclusión y apoyar la coexistencia pacífica con el objetivo de construir sociedades resilientes y cohesionadas. El cambio climático, la democracia, las crisis humanitarias, los derechos humanos, la igualdad de género, la participación de los jóvenes, la paz, la seguridad, el desarrollo sostenible forman parte de las orientaciones estratégicas de la Unión Interparlamentaria. Rumbo a la reunión de Angola, en octubre próximo, sugerimos concentrar nuestra acción en los siguientes puntos. Las crisis humanitarias. Existen un conjunto de crisis en distintos países del mundo en desarrollo, en que la violencia, el sectarismo, las pandemias y las guerras internas ponen en graves riesgos a nuestros grandes sectores de la población. Dos, la paz en Europa Central. El conflicto entre Rusia y Ucrania ha provocado el éxodo de muchos ciudadanos y amenaza la vida de la mayor parte de la población y contribuido también poderosamente al deterioro de la situación internacional. En torno a esta crisis también humanitaria se ha generado el endurecimiento de la situación internacional que exige tomar todas las medidas para reponer el diálogo e impedir el surgimiento de una nueva guerra fría. La igualdad de género, el asesinato y la represión de mujeres en distintos países del mundo, muy especialmente en Afganistán, donde el retroceso en la situación de las mujeres abarca toda la condición humana, desde los derechos básicos a la educación, al acceso al trabajo y la vida familiar. Cuarto, los objetivos del desarrollo milenio. Y quinto, el fortalecimiento de la democracia. Todas estas propuestas, creemos, son 
deberá ser parte de nuestro desafío central y deberá concretar el objetivo primordial planteado, que es promover la coexistencia pacífica, la inclusión social y la tolerancia. Finalmente, los insto a continuar desarrollando los principios fundadores e inspiradores de la OIP. Muchas gracias. Thank you. The next speaker is from Germany. May, may I take the chair, please? Followed by San Marino, speaker of San Marino. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, and uh, this is very important to us on behalf of the German delegation, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our Bahraini hosts for your hospitality and for organizing this very important assembly. Our thanks also go to the IPU Secretariat and to our President Duarte Pacheco. We know how extensive and laborious the preparation of such a big event is. I would like to start with a rather optimistic message. The IPU was founded in 1889. At that time, there were about 1.5 billion people living in this world, a large part of them under very bad living conditions. Today, with 8 billion inhabitants, more than five times as many people live on this planet. And despite this enormous growth, life in many parts of the world has become much better. Many diseases and epidemics have been defeated. Infant mortality in the world has dropped dramatically. Life expectancy has almost doubled worldwide. Hunger and malnutrition have been overcome in many parts of the world. The individual danger to perish by violence and war has strongly decreased. Religious minorities have more and better rights in many regions. Equal rights for women and men have not yet been achieved, but are becoming more widespread. The full acceptance of LGBTQ is not yet given, but also here many things are developing in a better direction in many countries. We can share knowledge better in this world, we can communicate better, we can travel better, and we can do so many things that gives hope and confidence. I repeat, that gives hope and confidence. Because nothing is more important in these times than hope and confidence. Because it's a great privilege to live in the 21st century in this world with these opportunities. But is this true for all people on our planet? No, it is not, unfortunately, not at all. And that is why it's our task as parliamentarians to continue on this road. And this is even as important to make accessible to all people what mankind has achieved in the 21st century. But it's also our task to preserve all our achievements and the world around us for future generations. This applies in particular to the preservation of our livelihoods, our environment, Climate change and environmental pollution are certainly the greatest challenges mankind is currently facing. And it's quite clear that we can only solve these challenges in solidarity with nations all over the world, regardless if we are coming from the north or the south, the east or the west. It goes without saying that we Germans and we Europeans are aware of the fact that we bear a special responsibility not only because of our past. I would have loved to end my speech with the affirmation of Germany's commitment to play a vital role in taking on these global challenges. But I feel deeply obliged to use the opportunity to address something else. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently in a situation where peaceful coexistence between peoples is under attack. The aggressor is clear. It is Russia which has criminally invaded Ukraine. Russia is responsible for murder, robbery, looting and rape. And I ask the Russian delegation, I ask very personally the colleagues of the Duma, what did you do against this? How and when did you oppose this breach of international law in your parliament? Where did you defend in your parliament the values of IPU? I ask you, are your hearts not breaking when you see the pictures of a Ukraine as well as a Russian mother mourning at the grave of their sons and daughters? Truth is that the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine is unfortunately only one conflict among many. We see war, conflicts, and violence, not only in Europe, but unfortunately, also all over the world. And to be honest, over the threatening events in Ukraine, we in Germany sometimes lose sight of hardship and misery in other parts of the world. 
This is why our goal, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, fighting intolerance, is of utmost importance. Manama will send a strong signal to the world. We as parliamentarians have to be the watchdogs of our joint values. Moreover, we have to be the guardians of peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker from San Marino, followed by the speaker of Italy. Your Excellencies, Honorable Colleagues, Distinguished Guests, it's a pleasure and a privilege to take the floor in the 146 IPU Assembly and bring the contribution of the most ancient republic in the world, the Republic of San Marino, which is a proactive member state of the Council of Europe for 34 years, a member of the UN General Assembly, and an active member of the organizations that protect and promote human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, seeking peace through multilateralism. The Republic of San Marino is a country that has embraced individuals' fundamental rights by deeply contributing to the interreligious dialogue and by providing shelter to those in need, including Ukrainian refugees in the past years. War is a dramatic event, especially for civilians who are forced to leave everything they have to save their lives and seek more promising future for their families. San Marino highly values the respect for individual fundamental rights, and as a result, we strongly supported Ukraine and its people during this extremely difficult time. San Marino has a history of rejecting war as a means to resolve conflict, encouraging dialogue and cooperation that sparkle mutual understanding. Today, we are proud to say that San Marino has achieved a very high protection of the fundamental rights for its citizens. For instance, over the years, we have come to a better understanding of the causes and the effect of domestic violence against women. Among various actions of which we are proud of, in 2016, we ratified the Istanbul Convention to fight violence against women, and we work extremely hard to integrate the principle of the Convention in our culture and processes. As a matter of fact, the latest report by Grevio, the body responsible for monitoring the implementation of the Istanbul Convention, appreciated the efforts made by San Marino's authorities who modified the penal code to assist and protect the victims, and also designed preventive actions and raised awareness on gender violence via an interdisciplinary approach in schools. Integration, inclusion, solidarity, and a culture of non-discrimination are strategic to drive cultural change in a country. Colleagues, to lay out a better future, we need to start from the respect of every single human being, regardless of whether he is a man or a woman, of his sexual orientation, of her cultural differences or economic status. For this reason, I want to express my appreciation for the choice of this team for this assembly, promote peaceful coexistence and fight intolerance, themes that we particularly feel close to us. We are living in a time in which a deeply reflection on these issues is more necessary than ever, so I want to thank you, the IPU, for the work it has led so far. Naturally, we shouldn't forget about ongoing issues that require our attention to achieve inclusive societies, ensuring the rights of minorities, upholding the rights of vulnerable groups, such as LGBTI people, women, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, the right of gathering and protest and guarantee freedom of speech. The answer to the present challenges can come through responsible and real dialogue between nations, cultures, and religions. Relationships play a fundamental role to achieve agreements, integration, social and cultural inclusion, all pillars for a peaceful coexistence. Excellencies, colleagues, time is up. 
We need to make up our duties and responsibilities. It is now the time to share a common goal and agree on position about the severe problems that affect our societies. Let's create a joint program made of actions to bring people together. Our societies need us to be guardians of universal values such as justice, solidarity, and love for each other. I hope that this meeting will enable us to reach the desired results. I'm sure that if we work together and close, we will set the basis for a better future for the benefit of the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker from Italy. Mark, take the floor, please. Followed by Margaret. Mr. President, colleagues, the noble goal to build peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies poses us several challenges on the international and the national front. On the international stage, Italy is committed to promote international solidarity and cooperation as the founding principles of our foreign policy. This is why we are very worried the unprovoked and unexpected Russian aggression against Ukraine is actually threatening the very foundation of the international order, that is the respect of territorial integrity. We fear that this will endanger the global prospect of peace, not only in Europe. We commend all those nations that have acted in upholding this founding rule of international relations. But I want to reflect on another aspect. In order to build co coexistence and inclusiv inclusivity on the, on the internal front, we have to be better in our roles as political leaders and as par parliamentarians. Coexistence and inclusivity is not the absence of conflict. It actually means listening, understanding each other's points of view, managing dissent. It is burdensome to listen to those that challenge you. It is unsettling to go as far as to understand the point of view of opponents. It requires a lot of effort to face dissent, but it is key to functioning parliaments and politics. In parliaments, in the political space, this is the only place where this can be done peacefully within rules. It, parliaments, political spaces, is the only place where conflicts can become fruitful and creative without violence. If we are committed to coexistence and inclusivity, we must protect the possibility to discuss, demonstrate, and dissent everywhere, even in those countries where dissenting is considered a crime. This is why, to those of us that live in freer societies, we have another burden. We should stand up for those that dissent and demonstrate in countries where this is not possible. This is why more than 80 members of parliament from the Italian parliament, together with the German Bundestag and the Canadian parliament, have decided to start a campaign to support and sponsor Iranian political prisoners that have been condemned to the death penalty as a result of their participation in the demonstrations following the killing of Masa Amini. In this way, we want to defend their voice. We want to make our voice their voice. We invite other parliaments to do the same. Thank you. Next is the speaker of Margarishkar. May I take the floor, please? Followed by the speaker of Turkey. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les parlementaires, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, Salam à Tupkla, Salam à Tupkvav. J'aimerais tout d'abord remercier le Sultanat de Bahreïn pour l'hospitalité dont nous faisons l'objet 
depuis notre arrivée à Manama. L'organisation est impeccable, les préposés sont bien courtois et serviables. Avant d'entrer dans le vif de sujet, je ne saurais m'empêcher de ne pas évoquer le cyclone Freddy qui a dévasté Madagascar il y a quelques semaines, faisant des dizaines de morts et plusieurs millions de dollars de dégâts matériels. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, malgré les efforts des organisations internationales, nous sommes encore dans un monde de prolifération des nouvelles formes d'armes, en particulier celles qui font appel à l'intelligence artificielle. Les trafics d'armes, la montée du terrorisme et l'extrémisme violent subsistent dans le monde. De nombreux conflits armés sont encore en cours. Ces menaces contre la paix et la sécurité internationale doivent être combattues par des moyens pacifiques. Chacun de nous ici présents veut un monde en paix, sans effusion de sang, un monde où les grandes puissances ne peuvent imposer aux nations les plus pauvres les concessions qu'elles souhaitent. Nous voulons tous un monde sans guerre, sans procuration, pour des intérêts tels que les ressources naturelles. Nous voulons également un monde où les pays pauvres ne soient plus assombris par la criminalité, la traite des êtres humains, l'immigration et la fuite des cerveaux. Nous sommes contre la discrimination fondée sur la religion, la couleur, la race, la langue. Nous voulons juste un monde plus égalitaire. Pour y parvenir, nous devons tous nous engager, les individus, les organisations de la société civile, les gouvernements nationaux et les systèmes des Nations Unies, ainsi que les organisations régionales, à construire un monde plus pacifique et sûr pour tous. Nous devons promouvoir une culture de coexistence pacifique, combattre la violence, le racisme, la xénophobie, et le radicalisme sur toutes ses formes. Les éducations à la paix doivent être vulgarisées en tant que concept universel et intégré dans notre façon de penser. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, nous appelons les gouvernements et les organisations internationales à travailler davantage sur le désarmement et le contrôle des armes. Nous devons limiter la fabrication d'armes et réguler leur commerce. Nous devons tous nous mobiliser contre la prolifération des armes nucléaires, renforcer la résolution des conflits par la diplomatie et la médiation est une priorité pour nous tous. Le monde plus tolérant les uns envers les autres est tout à fait réalisable avec la volonté farouche d'y parvenir. L'Organisation des Nations Unies, en tant que système universel de résolution des conflits, gagne à réviser et à actualiser sa charte en incluant dans sa sphère de compétences les conflits intra-étatiques, ce qui n'est pas encore le cas jusqu'à présent. La tolérance et la coexistence pacifique entre les individus et les États sont les nouveaux mots d'ordre que nous devons véhiculer à l'issue de cette 146e session. Merci de votre attention et de vos actions en faveur de la paix et de la coexistence pacifique. Thank you. The next is Ms. Speaker from Turkey, followed by Mr. Speaker of Uganda. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, distinguished members of parliament. Again, I would like to start my speech by thanking all of you who have given us support with your messages, sending rescue teams, and um, being with us in, in your thoughts and prayers uh, during the and the after the earthquake that took place in Turkey. 
and I would like to also remember my colleague who passed away during the earthquake, Jakub Tash, and I'm grateful uh, for the IPU for taking a moment of silence on his behalf. I hope no one lives something like this ever again, and your support, your thoughts, uh, are very, very, and your help is very valuable. Thank you. Distinguished participants, the title of our discussion is Promoting Peaceful Coexistence and Inclusive Societies, Fighting Intolerance. When we talk about tolerating one another, actually toleration doesn't sound like it's such a good term, because to tolerate someone, you would be trying to hold yourself back, and you would be forcing yourself to be nice to them. We don't have to, we shouldn't be tolerating each other, but we don't have to love each other, we don't have to understand everything the other does, we don't have to be getting along and agreeing on everything, but we have to respect one another. Racism, xenophobia, intolerance, and hate speech are on a disturbing rise throughout the globe. These tendencies are threatening our peace, our harmony within our societies. And this is a problem for our nations and our parliaments and international arena. In the international state system, this is a major problem. In Turkey, the principles of tolerance and non-discrimination lie at the heart of our human rights system. We need to remember at all times that democracy and protection of fundamental freedoms and human rights are the main guarantees on non, of non-discriminatory life. When we look at our history, my country's history, we see many examples. We see, we look at the times of the Ottoman Empire and we see different cultures, different religions, different races living together in peace. We can still see the mosques, the synagogues and the churches along the side with each other in Istanbul, in Mardin, in many cities in our country. Turkey also was there for the Jewish people who were fleed to our land from the Nazis. And currently we also have an open door policy. We host more than four million Syrian brothers and sisters. We host Ukrainians. We are, our doors are open to all who need help and who are fleeing for their lives. We will continue to fight for peace for everybody. In our National Assembly, uh, we have the Ombudsman Institution that we established in 2013 uh, to help implement equal equality for all. Uh, and we also have a commission in our uh, Grand National Assembly that was established in 2016 uh, that works uh, on different issues together with the Human Rights and Equality Institution that was established together with our parliament. Uh, we also have a law that protects foreigners who are living in our country. We don't call the four million people that have taken refuge in our country refugees but they're called people under special protection. We have passed and established, passed laws, established uh, many institutions to ensure everybody is able to live face uh, peacefully. Of course, there's another issue. Racism, discrimination, Islamophobia is increasing globally. In many European countries, there's attacks towards religious signs, religious symbols, to women who wear the headscarf, and this is a major issue. The burning of the Holy Quran in Norway, in Sweden, and uh, attacking the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the Prophet of Muslims, uh, this is not helping. This is not helping us. It's unacceptable. It's not 
freedom of expression. It's not freedom of speech, but it is disrespect. It is intolerance, and it's not acceptable. I'm hoping that we can put this behind. While we talk about, I'm about to finish, while we talk about human rights, respect for each other, we should also remember that there are some European countries and some at other parts of the world where sit, still a woman who wears the headscarf is not allowed in some public spaces. For instance, unfortunately in France, a woman, a mother who wants to accompany her child when she goes or he goes to school on a school trip is not allowed to accompany her if she wears a headscarf. At this day and age, Mr. Speaker, we, 30 seconds, please. Yes, I'll complete, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, as, at this day and, day and age, nobody should have a say what a sh woman should wear or what she decides not to wear. Uh, I hope we can resolve our differences and learn to respect each other. Thank you for your patience, Your Excellency. Thank you. The next speaker is from Uganda. You may take the floor, please. Followed by Speaker of Algeria. Thank you, Mr. President. Greetings from the Pov Uganda, the part of Africa. Mr. President, it is not in any doubt that societies that are inclusive and where rights are upheld are more likely to be cohesive, peaceful, and democratic. Uganda returned to democratic rule in 1986 after a long period of dictatorship, and we have never looked back. Failure to involve minorities in leadership was a key factor in causing tension and intolerance in the pre-1986 era. When the country returned to democratic rule in 1986, we introduced quotas for women, youth, persons with disabilities, workers, the elderly, and the army in parliament, alongside the directly elected members of parliament. As we speak, women in Uganda's parliament are 33.8 percent against a global average of 26.6 percent. We also have one of the youngest parliaments in the world. This was one way of ensuring inclusivity in parliament, where laws are made for the order, good governance, and ensuring democratic rule in our country. Uh, Mr. President, multi party democracy has been hailed as the best form of governance, and as IPU, it is at the core of our system. As we promote the multi party system of democracy, we need it to ensure as parliaments that our societies are mature and understand tolerance of different opinions. We should ensure that we build institutions that are tolerant, that are tolerant of different opinions, and we should ensure that we respect and above all, our electoral bodies should be beyond reproach. Poverty has remained a key driver for intolerance and exclusion in our society. The gap between the rich and the poor is increasing in most of our societies. We call upon the developed world to remove non-tariff barriers that are blocking entry of goods, especially from developing countries. Sometimes you find supermarket shelves in the Western world are empty when we have fruits, vegetables, and other agricultural products rotting in our countries. We need the Western world to work with us to add value to our products. For example, in the coffee industry, which is around $460 billion, coffee producing countries earn only $25 billion, with Africa earning $2.8 billion, while Uganda, which is Africa's largest coffee exporter, earns only $820 million. The hemorrhage of our resources have kept us in poverty, at the mercy of Western world, giving us aid and loans. We need more of partnerships and fair trade than loans and aid. And as parliamentarians, we can and ensure that this stops. As I conclude, it is important that parliaments review and strengthen laws and policies to 
protect minority rights and prevent discrimination. Establish institutions that protect the rights of minorities, like how in Uganda we have the Equal Opportunities Commission, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, but also carry out oversight function over the executive and make laws for order, good governance, and development of our countries. Through this, we shall be able to promote peaceful coexistence and inclusiveness and fight intolerance. However, in doing all this, we must remember we are representatives of our people. We should therefore make laws that fit in our societies, not our societies fit in our laws. We must not let global pressures and trends usurp our cultures and beliefs. That is why for us in Uganda, we are wary of Western trends that are in total conflict with our values. We strongly condemn the promotion of LGBT activities targeting our children who are not able at a young age to discern what is bad from what is good. They are not able to know that whatever glitters is not gold. And that's why as a parliament of Uganda, we are in the process of making a law that is going to protect our children and our families from this dangerous thing, which is a human wrong, but being called a human right. And as I conclude, Mr. President, I want to thank you for the hospitality. And like our former president, Idamin, when he was hosted by the Queen, after a very good reception, he told the Queen that when you come to Uganda, we shall revenge. When you come to our country, we shall revenge. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is from Democratic Republic of Congo, followed by Speaker of Canada. Monsieur le Président, distingués collègues représentant les parlements du monde à cette 146e session de l'Assemblée de l'Association interparlementaire, l'Union interparlementaire. Je me tiens ici au nom de la délégation parlementaire de la République démocratique du Congo. Et je tiens tout d'abord à remercier les autorités du sultanat de Bahreïn pour l'hospitalité qui nous a été accordée. Je remercie ensuite les organisateurs et je ne peux m'empêcher de féliciter les autorités responsables de notre Union pour le thème de cette session qui est la promotion de la coexistence pacifique des sociétés inclusives et le combat, la lutte contre l'intolérance. Monsieur le Président, la République démocratique du Congo est depuis l'origine son indépendance le 30 juin 1960, un État totalement engagé dans la lutte pour la démocratie et contre l'intolérance. En République démocratique du Congo, nous comprenons qu'une société véritablement inclusive, c'est une société démocratique, une société qui protège les droits humains. La coexistence pacifique et le combat contre l'intolérance, au niveau international, sont encore marqué par ce que je pourrais dire, l'intolérance dont souffrent les Africains en dehors des frontières du continent africain. Sur le plan national, au niveau national, la République démocratique du Congo a adopté une constitution qui consacre les principes d'une société réellement pacifique et inclusive. Notre constitution contient des diverses dispositions qui consacrent en fait l'inclusivité et qui tendent à promouvoir la paix. Plusieurs dispositions qui luttent contre la discrimination à l'égard de la femme, en termes de religion, et les personnes avec handicap, le peuple autochtone, plusieurs dispositions ont donc été adoptées par notre Parlement pour promouvoir une société réellement pacifique et inclusive. Cependant, notre lutte pour la promotion d'une société inclusive et une pour la coexistence pacifique est aujourd'hui sabotée par l'agression barbare dont mon pays, la République démocratique du Congo, fait l'objet de la part du Rwanda. En réalité, la lutte du Rwanda, son agression contre notre pays, est motivée par le pillage 
des immenses euh, ressources naturelles dont dispose mon pays. C'est l'expansionnisme rwandais. Donc, tous les efforts que nous avons entrepris depuis l'arrivée au pouvoir du président Félix Antoine Tshisekedi Chilombo se trouvent aujourd'hui en demain ou bien sabotés par cette agression barbare de la part du Rwanda qui n'a comme but le pillage de nos ressources naturelles. Et en réalité, la rhétorique du Rwanda reste la même. Elle est « old-fashioned », dépassée. C'est le post-pilatisme. C'est le nihilisme de l'agression. Une telle politique ne peut pas être tolérée. Monsieur le Président, il est inconcevable que les parlementaires du monde entier, ici réunis, prétendent être opposés à l'agression contre l'Ukraine et pourtant voter contre ou s'abstenir quand il s'agit de l'agression rwandaise de la RDC. C'est inconcevable que les parlementaires du monde entier réunis à Bahreïn prétendent lutter pour les droits de l'homme et qu'ils ferment les yeux sur les violations massives dont les femmes et les enfants sont victimes en République démocratique du Congo. Je crois que le moment est venu pour que les parlementaires du monde entier se ressaisissent et qu'ils regardent ce qui se passe, la crise la plus profonde qui se passe dans le pays, pour que ces pays puissent dire non à l'agression rwandaise de la RDC et qu'ils puissent contribuer à la promotion de, de, de valeurs de, la, de paix et des droits de l'homme en République démocratique du Congo, au lieu qu'on entende la rhétorique toujours la même, toujours la même sur le conspiratisme venant du Rwanda. We, we cannot pretend to be fighting for democracy and still support an authoritarian regime. We cannot pretend to be fighting for human rights and keeping a blind eye on what is happening in the DRC. We should bring to an end to that uh, parliamentary, uh, par parliamentary and diplomacy of double standards, which is schizophrenic. I think time has come for the parliamentarians from all over the world to understand the crisis which is happening in the DRC. We should be stressful to ourselves. Let's be uh, open. Let's recognize that we cannot defend, we cannot make interests, financial interests, political interests prevail on values, values of human rights, values of democracy. Nous ne pouvons pas, Monsieur le Président, être si hypocrites et prétendre lutter contre l'agression en Ukraine, les violations des droits de l'homme ici et telle part. Et quand il s'arrive pour la RDC, fermer les yeux, tout simplement pour plaire. Non, that should be brought to an end. We need your support. We need the old world to understand what is happening in the DRC. This is the, 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 the West. This is worse than Ukraine. That is, this is what 10 million people dead in the DRC. This is worse than uh, the genocide which happened in that small country. No, my friends, our friends, the people of the DRC send us to Bahrain to tell you that we need your support, support against aggression, support against occupation, and support against massive Mr. Speaker, human rights violations happening second. currently in the DRC. Merci beaucoup pour ce soutien international que vous allez donner contre l'agression rwandaise, contre l'occupation et contre les violations des droits de l'homme à RDC, surtout qui sont attribuées à l'agression rwandaise, une agression qui n'a comme objectif l'expansionnisme, le pillage des ressources naturelles de la RDC. Mais nous restons une société ouverte, Thank ouverte you, au monde Speaker. entier. Thank Je you. vous remercie. Thank you. Mr. Speaker of Canada. Please take the floor, followed by Mali Rais Tamar Swet from the Kuwait. Fadal. Good afternoon, fellow parliamentarians and colleagues. Colleagues, I have the honor of representing one of the most diverse districts in all of Canada. Almost half of the population in my district identifies as visible minorities. Over 130 languages are spoken by people from over 160 countries in the world. Toutefois, même dans un pays comme le Canada, dont l'identité même est diverse et multiculturelle, l'intolérance n'a pas du tout été totalement éliminée. Canada is not perfect. Far from it, 
We are a work in progress. And we're moving beyond words and acting to promote diversity, inclusion, and peaceful coexistence. It's a priority. Et c'est à nous parlementaires qu'il incombe de tendre la main à nos concitoyens et de montrer l'exemple. C'est également nous qui tenons nos gouvernements responsables de la ratification et du respect des instruments internationaux relatifs aux droits de la personne qui visent à garantir l'égalité des droits pour tous. Our job is to enact legislation and adopt political measures designed to combat intolerance and exclusion in our societies. Our job is to repeal any existing discriminatory laws and policies. But we can't do our jobs without metrics and concrete, actionable data. It's time to set down baselines against which progress can be measured or not. In Canada, the population census helps us capture the kind of data we need to get a complete and accurate portrait of our country's demographics. Moreover, in recent years, Canada has appointed representatives to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Our country has also adopted a feminist international development policy and an LGBTQ2I international assistance program. Canada has also invested in a new national anti-racism strategy. Et notre pays s'est engagé dans un processus de réconciliation avec les Premières Nations, les Inuits et les Métis, les premiers peuples de ce territoire que nous appelons aujourd'hui le Canada. Let me close by simply noting this. We are well beyond the notion of tolerating diversity. The world is diverse, and we need to celebrate that diversity and harness its full potential deploying it for the good of the planet. Intolerance is simply foolish. Why would we not want to embrace all the potential the world has to offer? It's in our collective self-interest to be inclusive. It's our only path to peace and prosperity. It's the only way we will learn to live within the carrying capacity of the planet. In short, colleagues, diversity is not a weakness. Diversity is our single greatest source of strength. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Followed by Speaker of Switzerland. Ali Sayed Duarte Bachiku, Rais al Ittihad al Barlamani al Dawli, Ali Sayed Ahmed al Msallam, Rais Majlis al Nawab al Bahraini, Al Ukhwa wal Akhwat, Ruasa al Barlamanat, wa Ruasa al Wufud al Barlamania, Al Sayedat wa Sad al Hudur. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إننا نجتمع اليوم في هذا الصرح الدولي لنناقش قضية محورية تصب في عصب السلم والأمن الدوليين وهي تعزيز التعايش السلمي والمجتمعات الشاملة لمحاربة التعصب هذه الحقيقة التي لطالما أكد عليها الإعلان العالمي لحقوق الإنسان وكفلها في نصوصه القانونية وما تلاها من مواثيق ومعاهدات عالمية تشدقت بأن الجميع سواسية أمام مسطرة القانون وأن المساواة والعدالة والاجتماعية والاقتصادية هي حجر الأساس في القانون الدولي وأنه لا وجود للأمن 
والسن في ظل انعدامها فالمجتمعات الشاملة المتماسكة هي الأكثر استقرارا وأمنا ثمة ما هو غائب وبشكل واضح فيما يتعلق بالتعايش السلمي بين البشر مجتمعات وأفراد وأنظمة وهو الأمر المتعلق بكرامة الإنسان وكرامة الشعوب إن ما يميز البشر كما نص عليه ديننا الإسلامي الحنيف هو الكرامة التي تتوج مبادئ العدالة والمساواة بين البشر لقد كانت الكرامة دائما هي المعيار الذي يميز حياة الإنسان عن غيره من الكائنات وهي مفهوم محدد بإطار واضح ومعايير لا يمكن تجاهلها ولا معنى لأي اجتماع بشري لا يضع كرامة البشر على سلم أولوياته الكرامة المتعلقة بالأرض والحق والسيادة والاستقلال والحرية الحرية في الدين والتعليم والإدارة وكافة مناحي الحياة والتي تعبر عن أرقى ما يمكن أن تصل البشرية من فهم وواقع وتعامل وهو الأمر الذي تجاهلته كافة المواثيق والإعلانات الدولية المتعلقة بحقوق الإنسان وهو كذلك الأمر الذي نعيشه جليلا وممنهجة نسبت إليه أبشع السمات من هدر الدماء واستباحة الآخر وترويع الآمن فوصم بالإرهاب الذي ولد لنا بكل تعسف الإسلامفوبيا ذلك الوصم الذي لا يزال يلاحق أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم تلك الأمة التي جبلت على احترام الأديان أمة تقديس الحقوق وصون الحريات أمة مكارم الأخلاق ولا يزال حتى هذه اللحظة يمارس بحق إخواننا المسلمين أشد أنواع العزل والتنكيل في شتى بقاع الأرض استهدفوا بالقتل والإبادة والظلم فقط لأنهم مسلمون وها هي فلسطين الحبيبة وشعبها الأبي لا يزال يتعرض لأشد أنواع العنف والتنكيل والتهميش من قبل الكيان الصهيوني وسط صمت العالم المطبق وتخاذل القوانين العالمية عن تحجيم هذا الكيان المغتصب فعن أي سلام واستقرار نتحدث إذا لم نطفئ نار العداء والفتنة والتعصب تلك النار الثائرة التي دمرت الحقوق الإنسانية لأسباب وهمية فالتعصب مرض عضال ينفذ الكراهية والشتات في النسيج المجتمع المجتمعي يجب أن نعي جميعا أيها السيدات والسادة بأننا لن نحظى بالسلام والاستقرار في ظل التعصب لن نحظى بالسلام والاستقرار إذا لم تتخذ خطوات جدية لتقويض الحملات الإعلامية الممنهجة للتمييز الديني والعنصري إذا لم نؤمن بأن حقوق الإنسان ليست حكرا على مجموعات بعينها بل هي حق مكتسب للجميع بلا تمييز أو تباين إذا لم نسعى إلى سن تشريعات وقرارات أكثر صرامة لتقويم ميل ميزان المساواة الاقتصادية والاجتماعية الأخوة والأخوات الكرام لقد حان الوقت لكي نتكاتف جميعا نحو تطوير الأطر القانونية والاجتماعية وانتهاج ممارسات أكثر فاعلية لملاهضة التشريعات والممارسات السياسية التمييزية وأن نعارض بأصواتنا التشريعية المدوية كافة أشكال التنميط العنصري والوصم الجائر وأن نعمل معا لبناء شراكات جديدة من أجل مستقبل أفضل ركائزه العدل والمساواة واحترام الجميع فحري بنا أن نتحرك جميعا لوقف هذه الموجة من التعصب والعداء وإلا فالوقاعب وخيمة فالعواقب وخيمة وإلا فالعواقب وخيمة وشكرا على حسن الأنصات والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا مع الرئيس The speaker will be from Switzerland. You may take the floor, please.
followed by the Speaker of Romania. Monsieur le Président, et chers et chers collègues, je tiens à exprimer ma gratitude pour avoir apporté ce thème important de la coexistence pacifique et des sociétés inclusives dans le cadre du débat général. En cette période difficile, il est vital d'avoir des échanges sur des questions aussi importantes. Comme le souligne l'indice mondial de la paix 2022, le monde connaît son niveau le plus bas depuis 15 ans. Ce fait devrait tout nous inciter à réfléchir à ce que nous pouvons faire pour lutter contre l'intolérance et promouvoir la paix. L'un des défis les plus importants auxquels nous sommes confrontés aujourd'hui est l'intolérance croissante à l'égard d'autres opinions politiques, la diffusion des fausses informations et la montée du populisme. Ces phénomènes ont contribué à une dangereuse tendance au désengagement du processus démocratique, en particulier chez les jeunes. Nous de devons freiner cette tendance. Même si nous ne sommes pas toujours d'accord avec des opinions politiques des uns et des autres, il est essentiel que nous respections nos opposants politiques et que nous nous engagions dans un dialogue respectueux. Malheureusement, les échanges deviennent de plus en plus hostiles, en particulier sur les médias sociaux et même au sein des parlements, aussi dans notre. En, en tant que politicienne et politicien, il est de notre responsabilité d'être consciente de notre rôle dans la promotion du dialogue et du respect mutuel. Je crois que dans la paix commence par des petites choses, en respectant les autres avec tolérance et en encourageant le dialogue. Seulement si on travaille ensemble, nous pouvons espérer rendre le monde meilleur et plus inclusif. Une fois de plus, je vous remercie d'avoir soulevé ce thème, thème important à l'IP. Si ce n'est pas ici, alors où d'autres Je suis reconnaissante de l'occasion qui m'a donné de réfléchir à ce défi et de renouveler mon engagement à promouvoir la co coexistence pacifique et de, des sociétés inclusives. Je vous remercie. Thank you. The next speaker will be from Romania. You may take the floor, please. Followed by Speaker of Vietnam. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me to contribute to this general debate. On behalf of the Romanian delegation, I would like to thank our Bahraini hosts for their warm welcome and hospitality. Let me take this opportunity to express our deepest sympathy to our Turkish and Syrian colleagues, whose countries and peoples have been so painfully affected by the devastating earthquake on 6th of February. We stand in solidarity with you and all those who have lost their loved ones, their homes, their cities, and their places of livelihood in this horrific tragedy. Dear colleagues, promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive society is a task that requires our constant attention. It requires continuous efforts to adapt mindsets, legislation, and policies to the transformations taking place in the political, social, economic, and security environment. Parliaments, by virtue of their representative nature, have a vital role in countering hatred and intolerance in promoting a model of society that embraces diversity and respects human dignity. Our action is all the more urgent since racism, hate speech, discrimination in all their manifestations and forms, particularly in the digital sphere, 
have been on the rise in the last years, exacerbated by the multiple challenges before us, economic and security crisis, climate change and the post effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. My country is fully engaged in efforts to fight intolerance and has continually strived to act as an example in this matter. I should start with our constitution, which guarantees the parliamentary representation of national minorities living in Romania. Organizations of citizens belonging to national minorities, which fail to obtain the number of votes for representation in parliament, have the right to one deputy seat each. In 2021, Romania adopted the first national strategy for preventing and combating anti-Semitic xenophobia, radicalization and hate speech. The Parliament last year amended the Penal Code in order to strengthen penalties for public incitement to violence, hate or discrimination on the grounds of race, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, sexual orientation, political opinion or affiliation, social origin, wealth, age, disability or illness. At European level, Romania contributed significantly to the drafting of the first European Union strategy on combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life, a key document adopted in 2021. Dear colleagues, in recognition of its engagement to upfront the fundamental human rights and liberties, Romania has been entrusted with the third mandate as a member of the UN Human Rights Council starting with 2023. The Universal, the Universal Periodic Review performed by the Council remains a critical tool for improving human rights legislation in line with international standards, including in the area of non-discrimination. Romania is preparing its fourth national report under this mechanism, and our parliamentary committees for legal affairs, human rights and equal opportunities are fully engaged in providing input and monitoring in the process. Ladies and gentlemen, tolerance and inclusiveness are a prerequisite for peace. Today's debate has a particular significance for the Romanian delegation, given the horrific war and huge humanitarian crisis unfolding in our vicinity since 24th of February 2022. Russia unprovoked unjustified illegal aggression against Ukraine has led to massive violation of human rights targeting mainly the civilian population. As a neighboring state to Ukraine, we have provided humanitarian support to the more than 3.4 million Ukrainian citizens who crossed our borders. And for the more than 100,000 of them who chose to remain in Romania, we put in place an integrated package of protection, inclusion, and social cohesion me measure. But let us be clear, more than an attack against Ukraine and its citizens, this war is an attack to the fundamental principles of international law and the democratic values that underpin the existence and mission of this prestigious organization we belong to, the IPU. And we should take this opportunity of being here together, parliaments from across the world, to renew our call for solidarity and cooperation in defending the national legal order, freedom, democracy, and respect for diversity and human rights. Defending human rights is not an option. Human rights are the only answer and the only solution for peace, security, humanity, and for the present and future of democracy worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is from Vietnam. You may take the floor, please. Followed by the speaker of Slovakia. Thưa chủ tọa, thưa quý vị, thay mặt Quốc hội nước Cộng hòa xã hội chủ nghĩa Việt Nam. Tôi xin gửi lời chào trân trọng và lời cảm ơn sâu sắc tới Nghị viện nước chủ nhà Bà Ranh, Chủ tịch Tổng Thư ký IBU về lời mời tham dự Đại hội đồng IBU 146. Thưa quý vị, Đại hội đồng IBU 146 diễn ra vào thời điểm thế giới đang phải đối mặt với những biến động to lớn, khó lường, Trong đó nổi lên là những điểm nóng xung đột tại nhiều khu vực trên thế giới. Trong bối cảnh đó, mục tiêu thúc đẩy cùng chung sống hòa bình và các xã hội bao trùm 
lại càng có ý nghĩa cấp thiết hơn bao giờ hết, đòi hỏi nỗ lực và sự chung tay của cộng đồng quốc tế và các cơ quan lập pháp cùng đoàn kết hành động nhằm thực hiện quá chương trình nghị sự 2030 vì sự phát triển bền vững của Liên Hiệp Quốc và chiến lược hành động của IPU vì hòa bình, hợp tác và phát triển bền vững. Thưa quý vị, Việt Nam là một dân tộc yêu hòa bình có truyền thống khoan dung, nhân nghĩa, hòa hiếu, trải qua nhiều cuộc chiến tranh giành độc lập dân tộc thống nhất đất nước. Việt Nam đặc biệt trân trọng giá trị của hòa bình, ổn định, hữu nghị, chung sống hòa bình và nhận thức rõ hòa bình phát triển của Việt Nam gắn chặt với hòa bình thịnh vượng của khu vực và trên thế giới. Việt Nam kiên định nhất quán thực hiện đường lối độc lập, tự chủ, hòa bình, hữu nghị, hợp tác và phát triển, đa dạng hóa, đa phương hóa quan hệ đối ngoại, chủ động tích cực đóng góp vào hòa bình, hữu nghị, hợp tác và phát triển trên tinh thần Việt Nam là bạn, là đối tác tin cậy, là thành viên tích cực có trách nhiệm trong cộng đồng quốc tế. Việt Nam ủng hộ các sáng kiến đóng góp cho hòa bình, ổn định ở khu vực và thế giới, ủng hộ việc thúc đẩy giải quyết các xung đột và tranh chấp bằng các biện pháp hòa bình, không đe dọa hoặc sử dụng vũ lực, tuân thủ luật pháp quốc tế, hiến chương Liên Hiệp Quốc. Quốc hội Việt Nam hành động theo phương châm quốc hội của dân, do dân, vì dân, lấy người dân làm trung tâm trong quá trình thảo luận, thông qua các đạo luật, các chiến lược quốc gia, quyết định ngân sách, phê chuẩn, quyết định gia nhập các điều ước quốc tế, trong đó có các điều ước về quyền con người, qua đó góp phần đảm bảo tính bao trùm bền vững, bản sắc văn hóa của các dân tộc, giá trị lịch sử truyền thống của đất nước, duy trì và thúc đẩy khối đại đoàn kết toàn dân tộc. Quốc hội Việt Nam đã chủ trì phối hợp với IPU thông qua tuyên bố Hà Nội về nghị viện với các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững, biến lời nói thành hành động tại hội đồng IPU 132 do Quốc hội Việt Nam đăng cai tổ chức tại Hà Nội vào năm 2015 thúc đẩy IPU cùng Liên Hiệp Quốc xây dựng bộ công cụ tự đánh giá, nghị viện và các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững nhằm nâng cao vai trò và sự tham gia của các nghị viện thành viên IPU vào quá trình triển khai thực hiện các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững và xây dựng bao trùm để không ai bị bỏ lại phía sau. Tháng 9 năm 2023, được sự ủng hộ của các nghị viện thành viên, Quốc hội Việt Nam sẽ đăng cai Hội nghị Nghị sĩ trẻ toàn cầu lần thứ 9 tại Hà Nội, mong được đón quý vị đại biểu tại hội nghị này. Thưa quý vị, chúng tôi cho rằng là đại diện cho ý chí nguyện vọng của nhân dân, nghị viện và các nghị sĩ có vai trò tiếng nói quan trọng trong việc thúc đẩy thượng tôn pháp luật góp phần đảm bảo các xã hội hòa bình và toàn diện thúc đẩy đoàn kết và phan dung trong xã hội. Với khát vọng về một thế giới hòa bình, phát triển và thịnh vượng, Đoàn Việt Nam đề nghị Nghị viện các nước IPU cùng phối hợp thứ nhất, nỗ lực đề cao vai trò của việc tuân thủ và đảm bảo luật pháp quốc tế, đặc biệt là hiến chương Liên Hiệp Quốc để góp phần ngăn chặn chiến tranh xóa bỏ bất bình đẳng trong quan hệ quốc tế, phát huy vai trò các cơ chế hợp tác đối thoại, nâng cao hiểu biết xây dựng lòng tin và tôn trọng lẫn nhau, cùng tìm ra biện pháp hòa bình cho các tranh chấp trong khu vực, cũng như các thách thức toàn cầu cấp bách hiện nay. Thứ hai, đảm bảo thực thi dân chủ bình đẳng không phân biệt đối xử về giới, về dân tộc, tôn giáo, trên các lĩnh vực chính trị, kinh tế, văn hóa xã hội, lao động, chăm sóc y tế, giáo dục, đào tạo, chia sẻ kinh nghiệm, bảo đảm, an sinh xã hội và đời sống người dân, nhất là người lao động, người nghèo, người yếu thế, đối tượng chịu ảnh hưởng nặng nề bởi dịch bệnh. Thứ ba, củng cố, đoàn kết, tăng cường hợp tác quốc tế, 
coi trọng kết nối trong đa dạng phát triển hạ tầng nhằm thu hẹp khoảng cách phát triển, thúc đẩy tăng trưởng xanh, chuyển đổi năng lượng, chuyển đổi số, đổi mới sáng tạo, tăng trưởng bao trùm. Thứ tư, tăng cường hợp tác công tư, phối hợp giữa các quốc gia để thực à, để hiện thực hóa các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững, đẩy mạnh hợp tác ứng phó với các vấn đề toàn cầu như Mr. biến Speaker, đổi khí hậu. Seconds, Xin trân trọng cảm ơn. Next speaker will be from Argentina. You may take the floor, please. Followed by Rwanda, speaker of Rwanda. Muchísima, muchísimas gracias. El mundo está en crisis. Sabemos que es necesario combatir la intolerancia promoviendo sociedades más inclusivas. Tenemos claro cuáles son los problemas. Un sistema económico que profundiza las desigualdades, el mal uso de los recursos naturales y la indiferencia para enfrentar el cambio climático. La creciente circulación de los discursos de odio y la consecuente debilidad del sistema democrático. En esta reunión de parlamentarios del mundo en la que hoy nos encontramos, exponemos y desarrollamos diversas cuestiones que afectan a la inmensa mayoría de la población mundial. Pero mientras lo hacemos, un grupo minúsculo se muestra absolutamente omnipotente. Me refiero a quienes integran las grandes concentraciones de riqueza, empresarios de poderosas corporaciones de capital que en muchos casos no tienen nombres ni caras conocidas, pero que son inmensamente más ricos que muchas economías nacionales. Empresarios que tienen el poder real de las decisiones con las que lidian nuestros países. Por ejemplo, en América Latina la economía no solo está altamente concentrada, sino que la tasa de ganancias que se llevan las firmas extranjerizadas se triplicó en pocos años. Y, y, por supuesto, esta tendencia no es solo un fenómeno de la región que represento, sino que la concentración de la riqueza es una característica del capitalismo del siglo XXI. Entonces, si hablamos de inclusión y de combatir la intolerancia, es prioritario entender que la economía nunca puede divorciarse de las demandas de las mayorías, que buscan trabajo, vivienda digna, educación, salud y un medio ambiente limpio. Mucha gente está pidiendo un cambio en el sistema, un cambio de que dé cuenta de sus necesidades. Porque por donde miremos, todo está atravesado por un enorme poder en las sombras, un poder sin banderas ni geografías. Como dije antes, es inmensamente rico, un poder compuesto de fortunas que se alojan en paraísos offshore y cuyas cuentas superan la productividad de muchísimos países. Les voy a dar un ejemplo. Elon Musk, considerado uno de los hombres más ricos del mundo, hoy dueño de Twitter y de muchas otras empresas. En el 2020 avaló el golpe de Estado en Bolivia. Puntualmente usó Twitter, Twitter para contestarle a un ciudadano que decía que detrás del golpe de Estado había intereses comerciales por el litio. Elon, Elon Musk dijo, derrocaremos a quien querramos, supéralo. El litio, llamado el nuevo oro de blanco, es considerado un elemento estratégico porque las baterías de ese mineral son y serán necesarias para la vida cotidiana. Elon Musk lo sabe y por eso amenaza a una nación soberana. Es por esto que pongo el foco en esta realidad concreta de nuestro mundo, de un capitalismo de peligrosa acumulación. Me refiero también a las empresas de Internet que manejan nuestros datos, que circulan información y que no censuran los discursos de odio. Estas empresas de plataformas conocidas también como el capitalismo de vigilancia que saben todo de una persona y pueden influir en su comportamiento. Recuerdo las filtraciones de la firma Cambridge Analytica y de Mark Zuckerberg, que usó datos 
personales para influir sobre campañas políticas, sobre campañas electorales. Y esto no es ajeno al fenómeno del surgimiento del fascismo y al debilitamiento de las democracias. La pregunta es, ¿quién se beneficia en el, que, para que el mundo tome este rumbo? Hoy nos encontramos frente al desprestigio de los partidos políticos y la consecuente pérdida de poder de los parlamentos en una encrucijada en que si la política pierde su lugar, su rol de mediadora entre el pueblo y los grandes intereses económicos, el destino para la inmensa mayoría de las personas va a ser sombrío. En resumen, si hablamos aquí de propuestas para combatir la intolerancia y para promover las sociedades que se construyan más inclusivas, puede que sea hora de reconsiderar un contrato social distinto. Y por último, quiero aprovechar la oportunidad, como en todo foro, en todo foro internacional en que tengo la posibilidad de participar, para manifestar el repudio al intento de homicidio a la vicepresidenta Cristina Fernández de Kirchner ocurrido en octubre pasado. Un atentado que debe entenderse en el marco de la intolerancia de la avanzada de los discursos de odio y del poder en la sombra de los grandes intereses económicos. Mi mensaje a los parlamentarios aquí reunidos es que solo desde la condena unánime a este tipo de hechos podemos pensar en construir la paz social que nuestras ciudades, nuestras sociedades se merecen. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Next speaker from uh, Rwanda. You may take the floor, please. Followed by speaker of Portugal. Honorable, honorable Chairperson, distinguished colleagues, let me take this opportunity to thank you once again for your participation and contribution to the previous IPU assembly held in Kigali, Rwanda in October 2022. On that occasion, His Excellency Paul Kagame, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, recalled the role of parliaments in fighting genocide ideology, which is becoming a fast-growing global threat to peace and security. In that regard, the Parliament of Rwanda thanks the leadership of the IPU and the Parliament of the Kingdom of Bahrain for a continuous focus on the promotion of peaceful coexistence in our societies. Rwanda has opted for cons consensual and pluralistic democracy founded on, founded on power sharing, national unity, and reconciliation. In this regard, the motto of the Republic of Rwanda is unity, work, pat and patriotism. Rwanda has committed itself to respect the fundamental principles provided in the Constitution namely prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide, eradication of discrimination and divisionism, equitable power sharing, building a state governed by the rule of law and constant quest for solutions through, through dialogue and consensus. As a way of strengthening tolerance among politicians, the National Consultative Forum of Political Organization has been established as a platform in which members exchange ideas in order to consolidate unity and advise each other. At the policy level, Rwanda has established policies that promote social cohesion, such as the national policy of unity and reconciliation, national gender policy, national social protection policy, national policy on disability and inclusion, to just name a few. Inclusiveness is core of governance in Rwanda. In the parliament of Rwanda, different groups are represented, women, 
representing 61% men, youth, person with disability, and from political, different political parties. The Parliament of Rwanda plays a crucial role in fighting intolerance and exclusion through its legislative and oversight mission. It has adopted several laws that promote unity and inclusiveness and criminalizing divisionism. The Parliament of Rwanda is also engaged in activities aiming at promoting peaceful coexistence through forums of parliamentarians like Forum for Women Parliamentarians and the Anti-Genocide Parliamentary Forum. As you, you might be aware, political instability, inequality, concentration of power, hate speech are among the root causes of intolerance and exclusion. The situation in Eastern DRC is a concern for the whole region, especially for Rwanda, because of the continuous support by the Republic Democratic of the Congo to FDRR, the rebel group composed mainly by those who committed genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. This support is totally against the value of peaceful coexistence we are discussing in this assembly. Rwanda has been victim of military attacks from that group, attacks that killed a number of innocent civilians. Instead of fixing the root causes of the insecurity, with more than 120 armed groups operating on its territory, DRC opted for the blame-shifting game. DRC should prioritize a political solution to the insecurity crisis than pursuing a military option as provided for in Luanda and the Nairobi processes. No country can eradicate the causes of intolerance on its own. We have to stay together and take measures to promote peaceful coexistence in our respective societies, stopping hate speeches, building effective institutions, and ensuring good governance. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker from Portugal. You may take the floor, please. Followed by Indonesia. Senhor Presidente. Sr. Presidente da Assembleia Geral, Sr. Presidente da UIP, Sr. Secretário-Geral, caros colegas, começo esta minha intervenção com palavras solidárias e de alento para com o povo turco e para com o povo sírio, vítimas do terremoto que atingiu brutalmente os vossos países. Aos colegas da Ucrânia, aqui presentes, deixo palavras fraternas de muita força, de muita coragem e de resiliência mas igualmente de esperança e de paz. Não podemos esquecer o Afeganistão, o Irão, o Iêmen e muitos outros países cujos povos também sofrem. Muito sofrimento que se vive no mundo é infligido pela intolerância, intolerância religiosa, intolerância para com as diferentes etnias, intolerância no relacionamento entre gerações, na intolerância gerada no poder, pelo poder e na ganância de mais poder. As sociedades são constituídas por pessoas com origens e geografias políticas muito diferenciadas, que tiveram uma formação para a vida diversificada e, por isso, construíram sensibilidades, motivações, ambições e objetivos diferentes e também formas de as concretizar. Pessoas que nasceram, cresceram e vivem em Estados cuja governação política não permite a igualdade de oportunidades para todos, nomeadamente em setores fundamentais da vida, tais como o acesso à educação, à saúde e aos apoios sociais. Os extremos e as ditaduras promovem mais intolerância com menor respeito pelos direitos humanos. Os sistemas de governação considerados democráticos, mas que nem sempre praticam a democracia, contribuem igualmente para a intolerância. 
A intolerância é um comportamento que se manifesta na falta de respeito pelas diferenças, sejam elas culturais, étnicas, religiosas, de género, de orientação sexual, entre outras. A intolerância gera discriminação e preconceito, além da violência física e psicológica contra aqueles que são diferentes e é uma ameaça para a coexistência pacífica e para a construção de sociedades inclusivas. Para promover a coexistência pacífica nas diferenças humanas e nas diversidades territoriais e políticas, ao nível do pensamento e da prática diária das pessoas, é essencial que haja políticas de educação sobre as, sobre as diferenças e a diversidade desde a infância. As escolas e as universidades devem ensinar valores como o respeito, a tolerância, a solidariedade, além de trabalhar com a diversidade cultural e étnica para que as pessoas possam crescer com uma compreensão positiva das diferenças. É essencial que haja políticas de apoio social e de emprego que promovam a igualdade de oportunidades no mercado de trabalho, ajudando a combater a discriminação e a promover a inclusão. É essencial que haja políticas de saúde inclusivas e acessíveis a todas as pessoas, incluindo o acesso a serviços de saúde mental e bem-estar para aqueles que precisam de apoio. É essencial que haja políticas de habitação que contemplem a diversidade e a inclusão social, evitando a segregação e promovendo a construção de bairros e comunidades mais integrados. É essencial que haja diálogo para o entendimento mútuo e a construção de pontes entre as pessoas. É importante promover espaços de discussão e reflexão para que os cidadãos possam partilhar as suas experiências e opiniões, aprender com as diferenças e desenvolver a empatia. É essencial que haja leis que protejam os direitos das pessoas, independentemente da sua origem, crença, orientação e puna quem pratica atos de intolerância. É essencial que haja combate ao discurso do ódio, denunciando e responsabilizando quem o promove, seja nas redes sociais, na comunicação social ou na política. Por outro lado, para se promover a coexistência pacífica e construir uma sociedade mais inclusiva é também muito importante aprofundar e qualificar os sistemas democráticos, ou seja, adotar medidas que fortaleçam a participação cívica, promovam a transparência, incentivem a participação política dos grupos subrepresentados e combatam a corrupção. É muito importante lutar para que mais Estados adotem sistemas democráticos, luta que pode ser concretizada através de várias estratégias, como sejam a pressão política, o fortalecimento da sociedade civil, a divulgação da informação, a cooperação internacional e a promoção de eleições livres e justas. Todas estas medidas são fundamentais para promover a democracia e garantir que as instituições democráticas sejam fortalecidas. É muito importante lutar pelos direitos humanos, iguais para todos e sem exceção, por via da sensibilização e da consciencialização da sociedade civil, com a participação política e cooperação internacional. A luta pelos direitos humanos é contínua e requer ação constante para garantir a proteção dos direitos e das liberdades de todos. É muito importante fomentar as culturas e o conhecimento nos Estados e outros, numa relação de interação e de diálogo sério para promover a tolerância e a paz entre os povos. Concluindo, para alcançar a coexistência pacífica e a construção de sociedades inclusivas, é necessário um imenso e um intenso esforço coletivo. Precisamos todos, mas todos, de trabalhar juntos para promover o respeito mútuo e a valorização das diferenças. Só assim poderemos construir uma sociedade mais justa e inclusiva para garantir um futuro com paz e bem-estar para os povos de todo o mundo. Ninguém pode ficar para trás. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Speaker of Indonesia, you may take the floor, please. Uh, followed by Lao People's Democratic Republic, and this will be the last speaker. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellency, President of the Assembly, distinguished parliamentarians, 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us all. Let me first appreciate both Council of Representatives and Sura Council of Bahrain for generous hospitality and warmest welcome, as well as excellent arrangements. Distinguished parliamentarians, our today's assembly focuses on how to promote peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies through fighting against intolerance. This topic is IPU's response to the global state severely marked by intolerance, racial discrimination, violence, discords, and wars. Countries from all over the world aspire their people living together in peaceful state free from suffering, fear, aggression, occupation, and intolerance in all its forms, including hatred based on religions as manifested in the growing Islamophobia and the recurring of burning the Holy Quran. Distinguished parliamentarians, allow me to share from Indonesian experiences in promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. First, fully trusting that diversities come to enrich human being life, not to harm. Second, adopting the solid legal platforms as common ground for living together in peace based on acceptance and acknowledgement of inherent differences mutual understanding and respecting each other. Third, instilling values of peace and intolerance and tolerance as a way of life that begin with the individual and spread to the family, school, community, nation, and to the global village. And fourth, maintaining cultures of peace in all walks of life, including conflict settlements, cultivating dialogue in all kinds of common problems. Distinguished parliamentarians, while we are here, warfare, hostility, and intolerance still remain in parts of the world, manifested in hate speech, blasphemy of religions, apartheid, and discrimination. The most disturbing in both remaining and continuing the global injustice regarding the collective severe sufferings experienced by the people of Palestine since nearly over seven decades. Let us put an end this hypocrisy and double standards. How can the world be still muted with no concrete action? In modern contemporary, we have been witnessing the dire occupation since more than seven decades. How can we allow the continuation of the land grabbing, expulsion of Palestinians from their homeland, and threatening them with death? Are we really citizens of a civilized world? How can we be not responsible for more than, Palesti more than 150 Palestinians were killed in the West Bank and East Jerusalem in 2022, and more than 80 Palestinians killed this year alone. It is unacceptable concerning the recent findings facts by the Amnesty International that show the true extent of apartheid regime imposed against people in Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the rest of the West Bank. We also must not forget the plight of people in Rakhine and Muslim minorities caused by intolerant policies and Islamophobia. If we do not take appropriate concrete action immediately, the global stability and insecurity will be put at risk. We must prevent the dark history of recurrence when the world was totally devastated by the wars. We as global parliamentarians have to take leading roles in urging the implementation of all relevant international legal instruments agreed to fight against intolerance. The United Nations, in particular Security Council, is required to steadily act the global justice must be upheld consistently and fairly. We have to start to consider making the UN stronger and more effective in implementing peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies. We strongly criticize stands from countries that obviously demonstrate their hypocrisy and double standard when addressing intolerance, racial discrimination, blatant violence, violation exercised by the occupying power. Let us make sure that our world is free from any remnants of the colonial mentality that likely lead to placing the others as undignified people to be further exploited. We should not let any country is above the international laws, and all of us are equal before the laws. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Thank you. Last speaker will be Lao, People's Democratic Republic. You may take the floor, please, and you will be the last speaker.
Excellency President, distinguished speakers, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me, the Lao delegation, having this opportunity to participate and address in this important event of 146 uh, Inter-Parliamentary Union Assembly held in the beautiful city of Manama with its warm hospi hospitality under the theme promoting peaceful coexistence and inclusive societies, fighting intolerance, which is an important topic of promotion stability and security in the region and in the world at large. Our world is currently facing challenges, particularly geopolitical competition, economic and energy crisis, earthquakes and natural disasters, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, which has posed severe impact to the economic development, hampering the efforts in maintaining regional and global peace and security. I highly value the role of the IPU in attaching a great importance in promoting cooperation and partnership, building mutual trust, unity, and promoting peaceful coexistence with contribute significantly to maintaining peace and security. At present time, as representatives of people, we need to continue to promote partnership and cooperation for development and mutual benefits for people of all nations to enhance and strengthen parliamentary diplomacy in building confidence, trust, and mutual understanding promote multilateralism that would bring about common benefits and promote a peaceful settlement on the basis of upholding the principles and the obligations under the international laws. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the Lao PDR has continued to pursue its consistent foreign policy of peace, independence, friendship, and enhancing cooperation with all nations, and actively contributing its obligations both at the regional and international arena, as well as upholding its political will and commitment to cooperate with the international community in solving disputes and addressing challenges in the region and in the world at large through peaceful means that contribute to peace, security, and cooperation for development. In this regard, the National Assembly of the Lao PDR has strengthened its role based on the rule of law by improving constitution and laws that align with international principles and the context of the country, including overseeing and monitoring the implementation of the constitu constitution of laws and different laws, as well as the implementation of the National Social Economic Development Plan. Furthermore, we reaffirm, reaffirm our commitment to the ratification of international treaties and convention that Lao PDR is a part of it. On behalf of the Lao National Assembly delegation, I would like to urge parliamentarians and members of the IPU to strengthen the promotion of building unity, upholding multilateralism, promoting peaceful settlement through dialogue as basics of principles and international laws. Lastly, I would like to extend my best wishes to Your Excellency President and all distinguished guests, representatives of uh, parliaments participating in this assembly, 
good health, happiness, and great success in your noble task. And I wish the assembly a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have three requests from right of reply from India, Bahrain, Yemen. India, please. You have two minutes from your seat, please. Honorable President of the Assembly, it is unfortunate that Pakistan has chosen once again to misuse this August platform by mentioning in their statement today about Jammu and Kashmir, which is an integral part of India. This mentioning is completely unacceptable. The Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh have been and will always remain an integral and inalienable part of India. No amount of rhetoric and propaganda from any country can override this fact. Pakistan has no locus standi to comment on India's affairs. We have repeatedly called upon it to vacate the Indian territories under its illegal and forcible occupation with immediate effect. It is ironic that a country which is a known exporter of terrorists and responsible for inflicting countless cross-border terrorist activities and attacks in Jammu and Kashmir is claiming to champion the cause of human rights. In the end, I again reiterate on behalf of India that it is extremely unfortunate that Pakistan has again chosen to misuse this August platform by mentioning in their statement about Jammu and Kashmir, which is an integral part of India. It was an integral part of India. It will always remain an integral part of India. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you. Yemen is not here. Uh, Bahrain will start. Please do. Shukran, Sayyid al Rais. Sayyid al Rais, I would an halak ala budahala to left al Finlandi Hadal Asur. Rahmat Alamna, Sayyid al Rais, when Kanat Jabatan Democratia, Amarha Ashrin Sena. Talamna, Nahunaka Osul, Philamar Democratia, Parlamani. تعلمنا ألا نتدخل في الأمور الداخلية للدول الشقيقة والصديقة تعلمنا أن نكون البرلمان هو الموقع المكان الصحيح للتبادل وبناء العلاقات القوية بين, بين الدول وبين الشعوب الدخول أو, أو التدخل في أمور الداخلية أعتقد أن هذا أمر غير مقبول من, قبل من قبلنا تجاه الأخوان في فلندا أو غيرهم أنا ذكرت أن عمر الديمقراطية تدريس عشرين سنة والإخوان في فنلندا 113 سنة نحن لا نتدخل في أمورهم ونتمنى عليهم وعلى غيرهم ألا تدخلوا في أمورنا يتكلمون عن حرية الصحافة نحن عندنا حرية للصحافة يتكلمون عن حرية التعبير هذا وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي يكتب فيها ما يكتب فيها من دون أن يتم توجيه أي اتهام لأحد نحن سيد الرئيس نتكلم عن التوازن اليوم كانت عندنا من أجمل ندواتنا ندوة التوازن بين الجنسين في البحرين وكنت أتمنى في الحقيقة الأخوان من فنلندا أو غيرهم حضروا تلك الندوة لكي يعلموا وين وصل أين وصلت المرأة البحرينية في, في حق العمل السياسي أو الاقتصادي سيد الرئيس فنلندا من ثلاث سنوات عينت خمس وزراء في حكومته وهي عمرها مئة السنين نحن عينا أربع وزيرات في الحكومة الأخيرة نحن على سكاننا 800 ألف هم على سكاننا 5 مليون فنحن متقبل نسبيا لا نقل شأنا عن تلك الدول فأتمنى في الحقيقة من الزملاء ألا يهرفوا في كلام قد لا يعرفوا صحته ومقداره وأتمنى عليهم كما تمنيت على الزملاء صباح اليوم من الدنمارك أتمنى عليهم أن نطلبوا عقل اجتماع معنا ونشتهد الأمور ونستفيد من بعضنا بعض ونعبر لهم عن الأمور الحقيقية وأن لا يستندوا أو يعتمدوا 
على معلومات خارجيه شكرا سيد الرئيس ثانك يو يور اكسلنسي مستر جمال This concludes our procedures for today. The general debate will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Wishing you a good evening. Thank you.